This is a reading of a lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. Lecture 1, given in Dornach on March 21, 1920. It is quite evident that this course will be able to touch on only a very small portion of our probable expectations with regard to the future of medicine since you will all agree with me that any real enduring work in this field depends on reforms in the actual education of physicians. Footnote. This course was advertised as a, quote, specialized spiritual scientific course for physicians and medical students, close quote. Personal invitations were sent to physicians and medical students who were members of the Anthroposophical Society. <coughs> End of footnote. What can be communicated in a course of lectures cannot instigate such reforms, even in the remotest way, except possibly by inspiring a number of people to participate in the reform process. Any medical subject discussed today, however, always has, as its other pole and background, the way people are prepared to work in the field of medicine through their studies in anatomy, physiology, and general biology. This preparation gives the thinking of medical students a particular slant from the very beginning, and this slant, above all else, is what we must get away from. I hope to achieve the educational purpose of these lectures by making the following programmatic divisions in our subject matter. First of all, I will give you a few indications of the obstacles that the modern conventional study of medicine presents to a truly objective grasp of the nature of illness as such. Second, I will indicate where we must look in our search for an understanding of the human being that is capable of providing a true foundation for work in the field of medicine. Third. I will use an understanding of human connections to the rest of the world to suggest the possibilities of a rational system of healing. In this third section, I will answer the question of whether healing is altogether possible and conceivable. Fourth, and I think this may perhaps be the most important component of our studies, although it will have to be intertwined, with the other three viewpoints, I would like each of you to jot down your special wishes for me on a piece of paper and give it to me by tomorrow or the next day. Please write down whatever you would like to hear about in this course. These wishes can extend to all sorts of topics. What I hope to accomplish through this fourth aspect of the program, which, as I said, will be worked into the other three, is to avoid having you leave this course with the feeling that you have not heard something you particularly wanted to hear. For this reason, I will structure the course in such a way as to work in all the questions you have jotted down. So please give me your requests by tomorrow, or if that is not possible, by this time the day after tomorrow. I think this is the best way to achieve some sort of completeness in the context of this conference. Today, I would like to give only an introduction of sorts, a few observations for purposes of orientation. Above all, I have been making an effort to assemble everything that can be made known to physicians as a result of spiritual scientific research, and I would like to take this as my starting point. I do not want what I am going to attempt here to be confused with a medical course as such although in fact it is one. We will focus on anything that can possibly be important to physicians, regardless of its origin. A true science or art of medicine, if I may put it this way, can be built up only by taking into account everything considered in the sense I have indicated. I will begin today with a few observations for the sake of orientation. 
If you have reflected on your task as physicians, you will probably have stumbled frequently over the question of what illness actually is, what a sick human being is. Although explanations of illness and a sick person may be disguised by one or the other seemingly objective insertions, they are rarely anything other than this, that disease processes are deviations from the normal processes of life, that certain phenomena which work on an individual and to which his or her normal life processes are not adapted produce changes in these normal life processes and in the person's bodily organization, and that illness consists of these change-related functional impairments of parts of the body. You will have to admit, however, that this is nothing more than a negative definition of illness. It is nothing that can help you when you are dealing with actual diseases. This missing practical aspect is what I want to work toward here. To arrive at a definitive view on this subject, I think we would do well to look at certain views on disease that have arisen over the course of time. Not so much because I find this absolutely essential for a modern understanding of disease symptoms, but because we will be able to orient ourselves more easily if we are able to consider the older views that have led to the current ones. You all know that when we consider the origins of modern medicine, we usually point to ancient Greece in the 5th and 4th centuries B.C., to Hippocrates. It can be said, or at least we have the feeling, that the view that first appeared with Hippocrates and later led to what is known as humoral pathology, parenthesis, which basically continued to play a role right into the 19th century, close parenthesis, was the beginning of the development of Western medicine. The influence of this belief, which is actually fundamentally erroneous, persists even today and prevents us from achieving an unbiased view of the nature of disease. The first thing we have to do is to eliminate this fundamental error. To an unbiased student, Hippocrates' views which, as you may already have noticed, continue to play a role right into the 19th century, right up to Rakotansky, constitute not only a new beginning, but also to a very significant extent the end of ancient views on medicine. Footnote, Baron Karl von Rakotansky, R-O-K-I-T-A-N-S-K-Y, 1804-1878, Professor of Pathological Anatomy, author of Handbuch der Pathologischen Anatomie, three volumes, Vienna, 1842 to 1846. Apologize for my German. End of footnote. In what comes down to us from Hippocrates, we encounter the last filtered remnant, so to speak, of very ancient views on medicine that were acquired by means of atavistic clairvoyance rather than by taking the anatomical route as is done today. The relative position of Hippo Hippocratic medicine might be characterized best by saying that it was the point in time when ancient medicine, based on atavistic clairvoyance, came to an end. Speaking superficially, but only superficially, we can say that Hippocratic physicians sought the origin of all disease states in an imbalance among the fluid bodies that work together in the human organism. They pointed out that in a normal organism these fluid bodies must stand in a definite relationship and that in a diseased body their proportions deviate from the norm. Correct proportions were called crassis, C-R-A-S-I-S, -S, and incorrect proportions discrasy, D-Y-S, C-R-A-S-Y. Of course, these physicians looked for ways to influence the imbalance and re-establish the correct proportions. Four components in the outer world were seen as constituting all physical existence. 
earth, water, air, and fire, although fire was the same as what we now simply call warmth. As far as human and animal bodies were concerned, these four elements were seen as being specialized into black gall, yellow gall, mucus, and blood. It was thought that the human organism needed the right mixture of blood, mucus, and black and yellow gall in order to function. If modern, scientifically educated individuals approach a subject like this, their first thought is that when blood, mucus, and yellow and black gall mingle, they do so in accordance with intrinsic properties that can be determined by means of elementary or advanced chemistry. Seeing it in this light, people imagine this to be the origin of humoral pathology, as if the Hippocratic physicians had seen blood, mucus, and so on, only in this way. This was not the case, or rather it was true of only one of these components, namely black gall, which seems most typically Hippocratic to modern observers. As far as black gall was concerned, Hippocratic physicians did indeed think that its ordinary chemical properties were the active factors. But with regard to all the rest, white or yellow gall, mucus and blood, they were not thinking only of the properties that can be determined through chemical reactions. They thought that these other fluid constituents of the human organism for the present I will always restrict myself to the human organism without considering the animal organism, possessed certain intrinsic properties in a form of forces or energies lying outside our earthly existence. Thus, just as they saw water, air, and warmth as being dependent on the forces of the cosmos beyond earth, they also saw these constituents of the human organism as being imbued with forces coming from outside the earth. In the course of the evolution of Western science, we have completely ceased looking toward forces that come from outside the earth. Today's scientists would find it downright peculiar if they were expected to think that water, when it influences the human organism, supposedly possesses not only those properties that can be confirmed through chemistry, but also others it possesses by virtue of belonging to the supra-earthly cosmos. But according to ancient views, the effects of forces originating in the cosmos itself are introduced into the human organism through its fluid constituents. Although the effects of these <coughs> cosmic forces gradually ceased to be taken into account, medical thought into the 15th century continued to be based on remnants of the filtered view we encounter in Hippocrates. This is why it is so difficult for modern scientists to understand medical texts written before the 15th century. For, it must be said, that most of the authors of that time did not have any real understanding of what they were writing. They talked about the four basic constituents of the human organism, but their reasons for describing these constituents in one way or another were derived from a knowledge that had died with Hippocrates. In talking about the properties of the fluids that build up the human organism, people were simply talking about the after-effects of Hippocratic knowledge. <laughs> Galen, then, contributed a compilation of old traditions that worked on into the 15th century, although they were becoming more and more incomprehensible. Footnote Claudius Galenus, uh, 129 to 199 AD, Greek physician to the gladiators in Paganum and at the court of Marcus Aurelius, considered the founder of experimental physiology. He demonstrated the function of arteries. He is responsible for about 100 treatises on physiology and medicine. End of footnote. But there were also single individuals capable of recognizing and pointing to the existence of something whose possibilities are not exhausted by the purely earthly element. <clears throat> 
by what can be ascertained chemically or physically. These individuals acknowledged the need to point to something in the human organism that makes its fluid substances work in ways other than those that can be confirmed through chemistry. Although others could also be mentioned, these opponents of the prevailing school of humoral pathology included Paracelsus and Van Helmont, who brought a new quality into medical thought in the 16th and 17th centuries, simply by trying to formulate a concept that others were no longer formulating. Footnote, Philippus Aureolus Paracelsus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, 1493-1541. Swiss physician and alchemist. He investigated problems and diseases related to mining. He was forced out of mainstream medical practice because of his unorthodox ideas and methods. He established a phenomenological approach to medicine and helped to establish chemistry as a part of medical practice. Johann Baptist von Helmont, Van Helmont, fifteen probably Van Helmont, excuse me, fifteen seventy nine to 1644, Flemish physician and chemist, who coined the term gas, suggested by the Latin and Greek chaos, to designate aeriform fluids. He was the first to distinguish gases from air, such as carbon dioxide, and considered water a pure chemical, in quotes. He also suggested the use of alkalis to balance acidity in the stomach. End of footnote. Their formulation, however, contained thoughts that could be followed only by those who were still somewhat clairvoyant, as Paracelsus and Van Helmont were definitely, very definitely were. If we are not clear about all these matters, we will not be able to communicate understandably with each other about certain remnants that still cling to modern medical terminology although their origins are no longer recognizable. Thus Paracelsus, and later others who were influenced by him, assumed the archaeus to be the basis of the action of fluids within the organism. Archaeus is spelled A-R-C-H-E-U-S. He assumed the archaeus to be similar to what we speak of as the human etheric body. The term archaeus, as Paracelsus uses it, and human etheric body, as we use it, actually sum up something that does not indeed exist, but without tracing its act that does, excuse me, indeed exist, but without tracing its actual origins. Doing so would oblige us to proceed as follows. We would have to say that the human being has both a physical organism which consists essentially of forces that work out of the earth, and an etheric organism, which consists essentially of forces that work out of the periphery of the cosmos. And there's a drawing. Our physical organism is a portion of the entire organization of the earth, as it were. Our etheric body, and also Paracelsus's Archaeus, is a portion of something that does not belong to the earth, something that therefore works into the earthly element from the cosmos from all directions. Thus, in his view of an etheric organism underlying the physical organism, Paracelsus summed up everything that had been described earlier as simply the cosmic aspect of the human being, a concept that came to an end in Hippocratic medicine. Although he indicated details here and there, he did not investigate further into the supra-earthly forces connected to what was at work in the Archaeus. We might say that Paracelsus's meaning has become ever more incomprehensible. This is especially evident if we jump forward into the 17th and 18th centuries, where we encounter Stahl's school of medical thought, which no longer understood anything of how the cosmic aspect works into the terrestrial. Uh, footnote, Georg Ernst Stahl, 1660 to 1734, an advocate of animism 
End of footnote. Stahl's school of medicine enlisted the help of all sorts of unfounded concepts, concepts of a life force, of life spirits, and so forth. Whereas Paracelsus and Van Helmont still spoke with some degree of consciousness about what lay between the soul spirit and the physical organization of the human being. <clears throat> Stahl and his followers spoke as if it were simply a matter of another form of the consciousness soul playing into the structuring of the human body. Of course, Stahl's view elicited a strong reaction, because anyone who carries on in this way, hypothesizing about some sort of vitalism, is entering the realm of purely arbitrary constructs. And, as you know, the nineteenth century then rose up in arms against these arbitrary constructs. It can be said that only very great minds like Johannes Müller, who died in 1858 and was the teacher of Ernst Haeckel, may manage to overcome some of the harm that resulted from this unclear way of speaking that addressed life forces as if they were soul forces at work in the human organism, but had no clear idea of how they were supposed to work. Footnote, Johannes Peter Müller, 1801-1858, a German physiologist and comparative anatomist, Ernst Heinrich Philipp August Heckel, 1834-1919, became professor of zoology at the University of Jena. He was a prolific writer, by the age of 60 had published 42 works. End of footnote. <clears throat> At the same time, however, a totally different trend was emerging. We have traced the declining trend to its last vestiges, but more recent times saw the dawning of an idea that then became definitive in a different way in terms of the formulation of medical concepts especially in the 19th century. Basically, this idea was derived from a single, unusually authoritative 18th century work. The Latin is De Sedibus et Causis Morborum per Anotomen Indigatis. 1761 translation on the bases and causes of diseases through anatomical investigation by the Paduan physician Morgagni, footnote Giovanni Battista Morgagni, M O R G A G N I, sixteen eighty two to seventeen seventy one, Italian physician and considered the founder of pathological anatomy. End of footnote. This book saw the emergence of a totally new view that essentially introduced the materialistic trend into medicine. We need to characterize these things completely objectively, without sympathy or antipathy, because what came to light in this book directed people's attention to the consequences of disease in the human organism. Autopsy became definitive. Only from this time onward can it be said that autopsy became definitive. <laughs> it was possible to tell from the corpse that if a certain illness regardless of what it was called, was present, a particular organ must have undergone a specific change. These changes began to be studied during post-mortem examinations. This practice constitutes the actual beginnings of pathological anatomy, while everything that had previously existed in the field of medicine was based on certain persistent effects of ancient clairvoyance. It is interesting to note how this great shift finally took place in one fell swoop. Interestingly enough, it is possible to point precisely to the two decades in which this transformation came about, when any remainders of the ancient legacy were abandoned and the atomistic and materialistic view of modern medicine was established. If you take the trouble to read through Rokitansky's handbook, on Pathological Anatomy, published in 1842, you will still find traces of the old humoral pathology, 
remnants of the view that disease is based on the abnormal interaction of fluids. Rokitansky very ingeniously incorporated this view, which can be maintained only by legatees of the old view of the supra-earthly qualities of fluids, into his observations of changes in organs. Thus his book, although based on post-mortem observations of organ changes, also suggests that particular organ changes came about under the influence of abnormal fluid mixtures. There you have, in 1842, the final appearance of the legacy of ancient humoral pathology. In the next few days we will talk about how forward-looking attempts, such as Hanuman's, to consider more comprehensive concepts of disease were introduced into the decline of the old humoral pathology. Footnote Christian Friedrich Samuel Hahnemann, seventeen fifty five to eighteen forty three, founder of homeopathy, his chief work Organon der Rationellen Heilkunde, the Organon of Medicine, Dresden eighteen ten. End of footnote. Hahnemann's and similar attempts are too important to be presented in a mere introduction and will have to be discussed later in greater detail. At this point, however, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in the two decades following the publication of Rokitansky's book on pathological anatomy, the foundations were laid for the atomistic, materialistic view of medicine. In a very strange way, old views still played into the ideas that developed in the first half of the 19th century. It is interesting to observe that Schwann, for example, who might be said to have discovered that plants have cells, was still of the opinion that cell formation was underlain by the development of some sort of shapeless fluid he called blastema, blastema, B-L-A-S-T-E-M-A, and that the cell nucleus condensed out of this fluid formation, gathering cell protoplasm around it. Footnote Theodor Schwann, 1810 to 1882, professor of anatomy and physiology in Liege and in Louvain. His chief work was his chief work was Mikroskopische Untersuchungen über die Übereinstimmung in der Struktur und dem Wachstum der Tiere und der Pflanzen. Again, apologize for my German. Microscopic investigation of the agreement between structure and growth in animals and plants. Berlin, 1839, end of footnote. It is interesting to note that Schwann still posits an underlying fluid element possessing attributes whose tendency to differentiate beings about the cells is I'm sorry, whose tendency to differentiate brings about the cells as such. It is also interesting to trace the gradual subsequent development of a view that can be summed up in these words. The human organism builds itself up out of cells. This idea approximates today's customary view that the cell is a type of building block for organisms and that the human organism is built up out of cells. At heart, the view that was still evident between the lines, or even more pervasively, in Schwann's work, is the final remnant of the old system of medicine, because it does not lead to atomism. It sees an atomistic phenomenon, cells, as emerging from something that, if considered rightly, can never be thought of as atomistic, namely a pre-existing fluid essence that possesses inherent forces and gives rise to the atomistic element through differentiation. Thus, in the two decades of the 1840s and 1850s, the older, more universal view was coming to an end, and the atomistic view of medicine was dawning. It was fully present by the time Virchow published his book on cellular pathology in 1858. Footnote Rudolf Virchow, 1821 to 1902, professor of pathological anatomy at Würzburg and Berlin, co-founded the archive 
Pathological Anatomy and Physiology and Clinical Medicine, explained cellular pathology in his Vorlesungen über Cellular Pathologie in ihrer Begründung auf physiologischer und pathologischer Gewebel-Ära. Oh well, Lectures on Cellular Pathology, Its Basis in Tissue Physiology and Pathology, Berlin 1859, and a footnote. We must recognize that an enormous leap, an enormous shift in the direction of modern medical thinking took place between the publication of Rokitansky's book in 1842 and Birchow's in 1858. <coughs> Birchow's book deduces all pathological phenomena in the human being from changes in cellular functioning. Ever since its publication, the ideal official view has been to study changes in cells in organ tissue and to understand all illness as resulting from such cellular changes. This atomistic view simplifies matters because it makes them very clear and lays them out in a way that is easy to understand. And more recent science, in spite of all its advances, always aims to understand everything in the simplest possible terms, without considering that it is the character of nature and the cosmos to be extremely complicated. <coughs> it is very easy to demonstrate experimentally, for example, that an amoeba in water changes its shape, extending and retracting its arm-like processes. Then, if you warm the liquid it is floating in, you will see that its processes extend and retract more quickly, at least until the temperature reaches a certain point. Then the amoeba contracts and is no longer able to respond to changes in the surrounding medium. You can also introduce an electric current into the liquid and observe how the amoeba assumes a spherical shape. It eventually bursts if the current running through the liquid becomes too strong. In this way the changes an individual cell undergoes under the influence of its environment can be studied and used as the basis of a theory of how disease gradually develops through alterations in the character of the cell. What is the essence of the results of that great shift that took place within two decades? What emerged then lives on and now permeates all of official medical science. It is none other than the general tendency that has developed in the age of materialism, the tendency to grasp the world in atomistic terms. <coughs> Please take note of the following. I began by drawing your attention to the fact that anyone working in the f medical field today is absolutely obliged to consider the question of what diseases are, what kind of processes are they, and how do they differ from the human organism's so-called normal processes. We need a positive conception of this deviation in order to be able to work with it at all. But the usual descriptions supplied by official science are exclusively negative and serve only to point out that such deviations exist. Then attempts are made to eliminate the deviations. But there is still no comprehensive view of the nature of the human being and our entire philosophy of medicine suffers from the absence of such a comprehensive view. What are disease processes really? You will not be able to avoid calling them natural processes. Suppose you trace the consequences of some external process in nature. It is not so easy to make an abstract distinction between that process and a disease process. You call the natural process normal and the disease process abnormal without pointing out why the process taking place within the human organism is an abnormal one. You cannot develop practical applications until you can at least explain to yourself 
why the process is abnormal. Only then can you investigate how to do away with it, because only then will you be able to discover which corner of the cosmos makes it possible to eliminate such a process. Ultimately, even calling something abnormal is an obstacle. For why should any process in the human being be considered abnormal? Even if I cut my finger, that is only abnormal as it relates to the human being, because if I cut a piece of wood into a particular shape, that is a normal process. But if it is my finger that gets cut, I call that an abnormal process. The mere fact that we customarily engage in processes other than finger cutting tells us nothing. It is merely playing with words. <clears throat> From a certain perspective, what happens when I cut my finger follows a course similar to that of other processes and is just as normal as any other natural process. Our task is to discover the real difference between those processes within the human organism that we call disease processes, which are basically quite normal and normal natural processes, even though specific causes must precipitate them, and the everyday processes that we usually call healthy. We must discover this radical distinction, but we will not be able to do so if we cannot take up a way of looking at human beings that really leads us to their essential nature. In this introduction, I would like to sketch for you at least the first elements of this way of looking at the human being with the intention of elaborating on them later. I am sure you understand that in these lectures, which are necessarily limited in number, I will be giving you primarily what you will not find in books or other lectures, and I will assume a knowledge on your part of what is available elsewhere. I do not think it would be especially valuable to present a theory to you in constructs that you could also find somewhere else. For this reason, let us turn now to what you can discover by simply comparing what you can see in a human skeleton and the skeleton of one of the so-called higher apes, a gorilla, for example. If you compare these two skeletons on a purely superficial level, <clears throat> the main thing you will notice in the gorilla is the exceptional development of the entire lower jaw, simply in terms of mass. The lower jaw weighs heavily on the skull. When you look at the head of a gorilla with its massive lower jaw, you get the feeling that the lower jaw weighs heavily on the entire skeleton in some way, pushing it forward, and that the gorilla makes a considerable effort to remain upright in spite of this burden. You will find the same distribution of weight, in contrast to the human skeleton, when you look at the gorilla's forearms and the lower part of the hands. They seem heavy. In the gorilla everything is massive. In contrast, in the human being, everything is refined and delicately joined. Weight moves into the background in the human being. In these particular parts of the body, the lower jaw and the forearms and fingers, the element of weight moves into the background in the human being, while it is prominent in the gorilla. Anyone who has cultivated a sharp eye for these proportions will be able to find them again in the bones of the feet and legs. <clears throat> there, too, an element of weight is present in the gorilla, which is pushing in a certain direction. I will use this line in their diagrams as a schematic indication of the force that can be seen in the gorilla's lower jaw, arms and legs. In a human being this force is counteracted by an upward striving element. This conclusion is inevitable if you observe a human lower jaw, which no longer weighs down the skeleton, and the delicate shaping of human arms and fingers. The difference between a gorilla skeleton and a human skeleton is evident to the naked eye. You will have to deduce 
the form-creating element in the human being from a kind of parallelogram of forces, which results from the same upward force to which gorillas adapt only outwardly, as you can tell by the effort required for them to maintain uprightness. Here is the resulting parallelogram with its lines of force, and again there's a picture. The very strange thing about this is that nowadays we usually restrict ourselves to simply comparing the bones or muscles of higher animals to those of humans and fail to place enough emphasis on this morphological transformation. In observing it, we must look for one essential aspect. You see, in the human being, the forces that counteract those determining a gorilla's form must actually be present. Those forces must exist. They must be at work. If we look for them, we will rediscover the aspect of ancient medicine that was abandoned or filtered out by the Hippocratic system. You will rediscover that the original forces in the parallelogram are earthly in character. The other forces, however, must be sought outside the earth. They unite with the original forces, and the resultant owes its origin to supra-earthly extraterrestrial forces rather than to earthly ones. We must look for forces that pull human beings into the upright position. This is not the same as the upright position higher animals assume from time to time, because the forces active in bringing about human uprightness are also formative forces. It makes a difference whether we are dealing with apes who walk upright but still possess forces that weigh them down in the other direction, or with humans whose skeletal development works in the direction of forces that are non-earthly in origin. If we simply look at the form of the human skeleton in the right way, tracing the dynamics at work in building it up, instead of restricting ourselves to describing the individual bones and comparing them to animal bones, we will realize that what we see there is not to be found anywhere in the other kingdoms of nature. We must unite the specifically human forces with the original forces in the parallelogram. The resultant cannot be accounted for by considering only forces that exist outside the human being. It will be important for us to make a careful study of this leap from the animal to the human. When we do, we will be able to discover the origin of disease in both humans and animals. I can show these elements to you only little by little, but when we pursue them further, we will be able to make many discoveries. In connection with what I have just presented to you, I would like to mention the following. If we move on from the skeletal system to the muscular system, we discover significant differences in the character of muscles. A muscle at rest is alkaline in reaction, if we take its typical chemical effect into account. But we can actually say only that its reaction is alkaline-like, because in a resting muscle the reaction is not as clear-cut as alkaline reactions otherwise are. Similarly, in an active muscle, a somewhat indefinite acid reaction occurs. As you recall, in a metabolic sense, muscles are composed, of course, of what human beings ingest. Therefore, in a certain respect, they are a result of the forces present in earthly substances. But when human beings become active, it becomes increasingly evident that what their muscle tissue contains as a result of being subject only to ordinary metabolism is being overcome. 
the changes appearing in active muscle tissue stand in contrast to ordinary metabolic changes and can ultimately be compared only to the forces bringing about the formation of the human skeletal system. <laughs> These latter forces, which transcend what humans acquire from outside, imbue themselves with terrestrial forces, uniting with them to bring about a resultant force. Similarly, we must also see muscle metabolism as containing something chemically active that is working into the Earth's chemistry. You might say that in the skeleton something we can no longer find within the earthly element is working into earthly mechanics and dynamics. Similarly, in our metabolism we have non-earthly chemistry working into earthly chemistry to produce effects different from those that can appear under the influence of earthly chemistry alone. <clears throat> These observations about morphology on the one hand and quality on the other will have to constitute our point of departure if we want to discover what actually lies within the human being. This approach will reopen the way back to something that has been lost but is obviously still needed if we are willing to accept a mere formal definition of disease excuse me if we are not willing to accept a mere formal definition of disease that is useless in actual practice you see a very important question is emerging earthly remedies from our surroundings are all we have available to work on the human organism when it undergoes changes. Non-earthly forces, however, are at work in us, or at least forces that turn our processes into non-earthly processes. This gives rise to the question of how we can bring about an interaction between the sick human organism and its physical earthly environment, an interaction that leads from illness to health. How can we call forth a reciprocal relationship of this sort that will really also be able to influence those forces active in the human organism that are not encompassed by the realm of processes from which we select our medicines, even if these processes are dietary prescriptions and so forth? You see that what can ultimately lead to a specific therapy is intimately related to an appropriate understanding of the essential nature of the human being. These first rudimentary elements of what is intended to enable us to rise to a solution to this problem have been derived from distinctions between animals and excuse me humans and animals. I am fully aware of the very facile objection that animals and even plants can also become ill lately there has even been talk of diseases in minerals, and that therefore no distinction should be made between humans and animals as far as illness is concerned. We will deal with this objection later. These distinctions will become evident once you see how little physicians stand to gain in the long run from investigating the animal kingdom with the goal of making headway in human medicine. To be sure, animal experimentation does have something to offer with regard to human healing, and we will find out later why this is so. But only if the radical difference between animals and humans, a difference that persists right into the details of their organization, is fundamentally clear to us. For this reason, it will be important to find appropriate ways to continue to clarify the significance of animal experimentation for the development of the field of human medicine. As we continue, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that when we are obliged to point to such supra-earthly forces, the personality of the individual is involved to a much greater extent than it is if we can always point to so-called objective rules or objective laws of nature. Admittedly, 
it will be important to work toward the intuitive element to a much greater extent in the field of medicine. We need to realize that an intuition trained to observe forms, the gift of drawing conclusions from morphological phenomena about the character of an individual human organism that may be sick or healthy in some respect, must play an ever greater role in the future development of medicine. As I said, these things were intended to serve only as an introduction and orientation of sorts, because the important point for today is to show that medicine must, once again, turn its attention to something that cannot be accomplished through either chemistry or conventional comparative anatomy, something that can be achieved only if we move on to consider the facts from a spiritual scientific viewpoint. Several errors are still prevalent in this regard. The main issue in the spiritualization of medicine is thought to be replacing material remedies with spiritual ones. This approach may be justified in particular areas, but it is totally unjustified on the whole, because what is most needed is a spiritual recognition of the healing value that may be present in a material remedy. That is, using spiritual science to evaluate material remedies. <clears throat> that will be the task of the portion of this course that I described as searching for healing possibilities by recognizing the connection between the human being and the rest of the world. I want all the things I will say about specific therapeutic processes to be as well founded as possible and to help in acquiring a view in each single illness of the connection between the so-called abnormal process which is of necessity a natural process, and so-called normal processes, which are also nothing other than natural processes. I would merely like to add a brief postscript. Whenever the fundamental question has arisen of how to come to terms with the fact that disease processes are also natural processes, attempts have always been made to evade the issue. For example, I was interested to learn that already in the first half of the 19th century, Troxler, who taught in Bern, was very emphatically pointing out that illness needed to be investigated as a normal phenomenon. Footnote, Ignis Paul Vital Troxler, 1780-1866, published works, um, I'll give you the English, Glimpses into the Essential Nature of the Human Being, Arau, 1812, Natural History of Human Knowledge or Metaphysics, Arau, 1812, and Lectures on Philosophy, Its Content, Delineation, Purpose, and Applicability to Life, Bern, 1836. End of footnote. He claimed that this view would ultimately lead us to acknowledge the existence of a certain world that is connected to our world but forces its way into it through illegitimate channels, as it were and that the results of such an investigation could have something to do with disease symptoms. I want to touch on this only superficially at this point. Just imagine, however, a world existing in the background whose governing principles are very justified processes that happen to bring about disease symptoms in our world. If that were the case, if these laws that are totally justified in a different world were to break through into our world through certain gaps, they would cause all kinds of damage. This was what Troxler was aiming at. In spite of the fact that he expressed himself without clarity in some respects, it is still possible to see that he was on a path that was leading toward a certain healing for medical science. Since Troxler had lectured at the university in Bern, a friend there once helped me investigate how he was regarded by his colleagues and what came of his suggestions. In the encyclopedia that documents many incidents in the history of the university, we were able to find only that Troxler had been the cause of a great many arguments. 
we found nothing in particular about his importance to science. As I said, my intention today was only to point out these things. Please do write down all of your wishes for me by tomorrow or the next day, so that I can weave them into what I myself intend to present. The form that these lectures will take will be based on these wishes of yours. I think this will be the best way to proceed, so please make extensive requests. The End of Lecture 1 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 2, given in Dornach on March 22, 1920. Our points of departure today will be similar to yesterday's, but we will move on and gradually delve further into the essential nature of the human being by observing certain polarities that govern it. You will recall from yesterday that in the case of the human being, the downward-directed forces predominating in animals were combined visually into a parallelogram with forces that act vertically. We also saw an analog of this in muscle activity. If we pursue these two ideas as we study the human skeleton and muscular system, Enlisting the help of everything experience can provide at present, it should soon be possible to make the study of bones and muscles more significant for medicine than it has been thus far. If we take cardiology as our starting point today, however, the connection between knowledge of the human being and the needs of medicine becomes especially difficult. I could say that something present as a mere potential in the study of bones and muscles has emerged fully in the view that has developed with regard to cardiology. Let us restrict ourselves to the heart for the time being. And what is the general view of the human heart? It is seen as a pump of sorts, pumping the blood into the various organs. All kinds of interesting mechanical constructions have been invented in the attempt to explain the heart as a pumping machine. <clears throat> in reality, these mechanical constructions completely contradict embryology, but people have not been attentive enough to really question this mechanical theory of the heart, so it has not been tested, or at least not in the generally accepted scientific view. I will first sketch the situation for you, and what I present in the next few days will confirm, bit by bit, what I can initially present only as a point of view. The main thing to consider in looking at the heart is that the heart absolutely is not and cannot be a so-called active organ. The activity of the heart is not a cause, it is a consequence. You will understand this last statement only by bearing in mind the polarity that exists between the human organism's metabolic activities and its respiratory activities. Look at all the activities involved in taking in and processing nutrients and channeling them into the bloodstream, either directly or via the vessels. Here you trace the transformation of nutrients in the organism as they move upward from below. You trace this right up to the point of interaction between the blood, which has taken up the nutrients, and the respiratory process, which takes in air. If you take a very good look at the processes under consideration here, and all you really need to do is look at them properly, you will find a certain contrast between everything belonging to the respiratory process and everything belonging to the metabolic process in its broadest sense. These processes want to balance each other out. They are, quote-unquote, thirsting after each other, in a manner of speaking, longing to satisfy themselves with each other. Parenthesis, of course, other ways of expressing this could be chosen. However, as time goes on, we will understand each other better. Close parenthesis. <clears throat> 
Initially, liquefied nutrients interact with what is taken up by the organism in gaseous form through the respiratory process. This interaction must be studied precisely. It consists of forces that play into each other, but before doing so they are dammed up in the heart. The heart comes about as a damming up organ between what I would now like to call the organism's lower activity, the intake and transformation of food, and its upper activities, of which I would consider respiration to be one of the lowest. A damming up organ is inserted between these activities. The most important point about this situation is that cardiac function is a consequence of the interaction between liquefied food and air taken in from outside. Everything that comes to expression in the heart, everything we can observe in the heart, must be considered a consequence. <clears throat> to begin with, we must even consider it a mechanical consequence. Footnote in the most recent German edition, these last two sentences constitute a single sentence, which was altered after re-examining the stenographic report record. End of footnote. The only promising attempt that has been made to reconsider at least this mechanical basis of cardiac function, but nothing more, was made by an Austrian physici physician, Dr. Karl Schmidt from North Styria, who published a paper entitled Pulse Curves and the Beating of the Heart in the Vienna Medical Weekly, 1892, number 15 through 17. Although this treatise is somewhat short on content, an active medical practitioner has at least noticed that we must deal with the heart as if it were a damming up apparatus rather than an ordinary pump. To Schmidt, the beating motion of the heart resembles the action of a hydraulic ram, which is flow activated. Here, implicit in Dr. Schmidt's description, lies the actual truth of the matter. When we see all cardiac function as the consequence of these interpenetrating flows, as I can now symbolically term them, of fluid and of gas, we are still viewing matters only on the mechanical level. Footnote, this sentence has also been altered on the basis of the original stenographic record of the lecture. End of footnote. But ultimately, what is the heart? It is a sense organ. And ultimately, even if we are not directly conscious of the heart's sensory function, even though this is one of our subconscious sensory activities, the heart nonetheless exists so that our upper activities may sense and perceive our lower activities. Just as you perceive color processes in the environment with your eyes, you also perceive with your heart, although in the dimness of the subconscious. You perceive what is taking place in the lower part of your body. Ultimately, the heart is an organ of inner perception, and it must be addressed as such. We will understand the actual polarity within the human being only if we acknowledge that a human being is a dual being, built up in such a way that the lower portion is perceived by the upper portion. I must add the following, however. We can take the lower activities, that is, one pole of the total human being, as given if we study the intake of nutrients and their transformation in the wider sense up to the point where they are balanced out against respiration. The balancing of nourishment with respiration takes place through our rhythmical activity, the significance of which we will still have to discuss. But we must see sensory and neural functions, everything related to outer perception and how it is taken further and processed by neural activity as being entwined with respiratory functions. <clears throat> if you add together these two things, respiratory activity and sensory neural activity, you have some notion of one pole of the human organization. On the other hand, 
if you add together the intake and transformation of nourishment, that is, metabolism in the ordinary sense of the word, you have the other pole in the human organization. Essentially, the heart is the organ whose perceptible movement expresses the balance between these upper and lower poles. On a psychological, or perhaps it would be better to say sub-psychological level, the heart acts as the organ of perception that mediates between these two poles of the human organization. You only see excuse me, you will see that only this principle, if kept in mind while studying everything that anatomy, physiology, and biology have to offer, is capable of shedding light on the human organization. As long as you do not differentiate between these upper and lower poles, with the heart mediating between them, you will be unable to understand the human being because there is a fundamental difference between all of the lower organizational activity of the human being and the activity of the upper organization. If we want to express this contrast in a simple way, we might say something like this. Everything taking place down below has its negative image or counterpart up above we can always find a corresponding image in the lower region for everything that is involved in the upper region. The most significant point here, however, is that there is no material transfer of substance between the upper and the lower, but only a correspondence. We must always understand how to relate something from down below to something else up above without insisting on a material transfer. Let us take a very simple example, the cough reflex and actual coughing, in the context of what is up above, or to the extent that these things belong up above. Their counterpart down below is diarrhea. We will always find that anything in the upper region has its counterpart below. We understand the human being correctly only when we are able to grasp these correspondences correctly, and we will encounter many of them in this lecture course. These are more than just abstract correspondences. At the same time, in any healthy organism, an intimate association is taking place between the upper and the lower. In a healthy organism, this association of pairs is such that any particular upper body function, perhaps a respiration-related activity, or one related to the sensory neural apparatus, must overcome another activity down below and run its course in complete harmony with this lower counterpart. An irregularity immediately occurs in the organism if a process from below somehow gains ascendancy or precedence so that it is far too strong for its corresponding activity above, or vice versa. Parenthesis later, this will lead us to a true understanding of the disease process. Close parenthesis. Upper functions must always correspond to lower ones in a specific way, overcoming each other, taking place in ways that reflect their orientation toward each other, as it were. This orientation is very specific, and is individually different in each person, but in every case there is a very specific correspondence between how upper processes and lower processes run their course. It is important to be able to make the transition from this healthily functioning organism in which the upper and lower aspects are in correspondence to a diseased organism. Let us begin with signs of disease in what Paracelsus calls the archaeus, and we call the etheric body. If you want to disguise it so that outsiders who want to know nothing of these things do not object, you could also say that you want to talk about the very first functional or dynamic signs of illness. If we begin with these, if we talk about what is disclosed first 
in the etheric body or in the merely functional dimension, we can again speak of a polarity, but a polarity that encompasses the non-correspondence or irregularity. This comes about in the following way. Let us assume that down below, in food intake and in the digestive system in the broader sense, the inherent chemical and or organic forces of the ingested food predominate. In a healthy organism, all of these forces that are active and inherent in the food itself, all the forces we study externally in the laboratory, have to be overcome by the upper element to such an extent that they become irrelevant to any internal activity of the organism. No outer chemistry or outer dynamics or the like continues to function. It is all completely overcome. It can happen, however, that the correspondence is not strong enough for the upper element to really grasp and pervade its lower counterpart, counterpart completely. In a sense, the upper element cannot completely cook the lower, or as I might also put it, etherize it through and through, which would be a slightly more accurate description. In such a case, the process that predominates in the human organism really does not belong there. It is a process just like those taking place in the outer world, and it should not be taking place within the human organism. Because irregularities do not immediately engulf the physical human being, processes such as these first become evident in what could be described as the functional aspect in the etheric body, the archaeos. If we were to choose a colloquial expression derived solely from certain specific forms of this irregularity, we would have to choose the term hysteria. In fact, as we shall see later, this is not a bad choice. So we will use hysteria as an expression or technical term for excessive independence of the metabolic processes. Actual symptoms of hysteria in the narrower sense are nothing but metabolic irregularity driven to a climax state. In reality, even hysterical processes that have reached the stage of sexual symptomatology are nothing more than such metabolic irregularities, which by nature are outer processes that should not be present within the human organism, lower processes that the upper processes are too weak to overcome. This is one of the two poles. <clears throat> Whenever such symptoms of hysteria appear, we are dealing with an excessively strong, non-human or extra-human activity in the lower parts of the human organization. But the same irregularity in the interaction between upper and lower can also occur because an upper process fails to run its proper course taking place in a way that is too demanding on the upper organization. This is the opposite, the negative image, of the lower process. It demands too much of the upper organization. It reaches its conclusion before it connects with the lower organism via the heart. It is too strongly spiritual, too strongly intellectual on an organic level if I may use that expression. In such cases, the other one of these polar irregularities appears, namely neurasthenia. <laughs> Above all else, it is important to look at these two irregularities of the human organism, irregularities that lie within the functional sphere, since these are the defects that express themselves above and below. We will gradually have to understand how the polarity in the human organization succumbs to one or the other of these deficits. In neurasthenia, we have an upper function that demands too much of the upper organs. As a result, something that should have been transmitted from above via the heart in order to take place down below instead takes place prematurely up above and reaches its conclusion there. <clears throat> 
the activity in question, is not transmitted through the damming up process in the heart, and thus does not extend down into the lower flow, the flow of liquefied nutrients. You can also see that it is more important, far more important, I might say, to study a syndrome's outer manifestations than to study defective organs post-mortem. <clears throat> An autopsy of defective organs merely reveals consequences. The essential thing is to grasp the overall picture, the phenomenon of the illness, in which in some way will always tend more in one direction or the other toward neurasthenia or hysteria. Parenthesis. Of course, we have to stretch the usual meanings of these terms. Close parenthesis. Once we have pictured the collaboration between upper and lower clearly enough to take it as our starting point, we will gradually come to recognize how something that is initially apparent only as a functional element taking place in the etheric, as we would say, is then able to take hold of the organic physical element by becoming denser in its forces. At that point, it can be said that what was initially present as a mere suggestion of hysteria is then able to assume physical form in various abdominal diseases. Similarly, in the other direction, neurasthenia assumes an organic form in diseases of the throat and head. For the medicine of the future, it will be extremely important to study these imprints of what are initially functional physical symptoms in neurasthenia and hysteria. The consequence of hysteria that has become organic, if I may put it this way, will be irregularities occurring anywhere in the digestive system or in abdominal, excuse me, abdominal processes in general. But what takes place in one such system of organs works back into the organism as a whole. We must not ignore the fact that irregularities, irregularities occurring here work back on the entire organism. Imagine it like this. Something that would simply be an hysterical symptom if it initially appeared on the functional level fails to come to any kind of functional expression at all. It is absolutely possible for it never to be expressed on the functional level. Instead, the etheric body immediately forces it into the physical body where it is present within the abdominal organs, although it does not appear there as any definite illness. We might say the abdominal organs are imprinted with a stamp of hysteria. Because this tendency is imprinted on the physical element, it does not come to expression on the psychological level as a symptom of hysteria, but neither is it strong enough to be a troublesome physical illness. It is strong enough, however, to influence the entire organism. Now we have the peculiar phenomenon of something that hovers between disease and health and works upward from below. It works back on what is up above, infects the upper aspect, and appears in the form of its negative image. The first physical consequence of hysteria appears in parts of the body that would usually be subject to neurasthenia if they became unbalanced and irregular. This phenomenon predisposes the person in question to tuberculosis. This is an interesting connection. Predisposition to tuberculosis is a consequence of the activity that was just described as working back on the upper parts of the body from below. This very extraordinary interaction comes about because an unfinished process, as I described it, works on the upper part of the body. This gives rise to a predisposition to tuberculosis. It will prove impossible to discover any rational means of dealing with tuberculosis 
without going back to this archetypal tendency of the human organism, as I would like to call it. That parasites gain ground within the human organism is simply a consequence of the archetypal tendencies I have just described. This does not contradict the fact that given the necessary prerequisites, an illness such as tuberculosis is contagious. Of course, the necessary prerequisites must be present, but unfortunately this predominance of lower body organic activity occurs in a terribly high percentage of the population today, so predisposition to tuberculosis is frighteningly widespread. Contagion is still a valid concept here, however, because people who are gravely ill with tuberculosis do affect their fellow human beings, and exposure to a tubercular patient's environment can indeed make it possible for what is otherwise a mere consequence to once again become a cause. I always attempt to use an analogy or comparison to clarify this relationship between the primary genesis of a disease and contagion. Let us assume I meet a friend in the street whose personal relationships normally do not concern me. This friend is sad, and with good reason, because one of his friends has died. I have no direct connection to the deceased person, but upon meeting my friend and hearing about his grief, I begin to feel sad with him. His sadness, however, is due to a direct cause, while mine is due to contagion. But it remains true that only the relationship between myself and my friend supplies the necessary prerequisite for this contagion. In this way, concepts of primary occurrence and contagion are both fully justified, especially with regard to tuberculosis. These concepts, however, really need to be applied rationally. Tuberculosis sanatoriums are sometimes actual breeding grounds for tuberculosis. If tubercular patients have to be crammed together in sanatoriums, then at least these buildings should be torn down periodically and replaced with new ones whenever possible. After a certain length of time, tuberculosis sanatoriums always ought to be replaced. The strange thing about it is that tubercular patients themselves have the greatest predisposition to infection, which means that otherwise curable patients with the illness may become worse if they are in the proximity of those who are more seriously ill. For the present, however, my intention is simply to indicate the nature of tuberculosis. This disease is a particularly good example of how the different processes in the human organism need to interweave. As you can imagine, these processes are inevitably influenced by the fact that we are dealing with an upper and a lower organization whose correspondence is like that of a positive image and its negative. If we study the further course of the most obvious symptoms that pave the way for tuberculosis, namely the presence of a bodily constitution such as I have described, these symptoms can serve as an example of how we should view the nature of illness in general. Consider the typical symptomatology of a person with incipi incipient tuberculosis. Perhaps we will observe that this person is coughing and has a sore throat, chest pains or pains in the limbs. We will note that the person suffers from fatigue and night sweats will also be especially evident. Well, what is all this? If we investigate these symptoms, what are they really? Each of them is a result, at least initially, of the irregular inner interactions described earlier. But at the same time, each symptom also represents the organism's battle against the underlying deeper foundations of the illness. Let us look first at simple things like coughing. We will get to the more complex issues soon enough. You see, coughing should not always be suppressed 
regardless of the circumstances. That is certainly not a good idea. Sometimes the organism may even need artificial stimulation to induce coughing. When a person's lower organization is such that it cannot be controlled by the upper organization, the cough reflex is a healthy reaction on the part of the body, an attempt to prevent certain things from getting in. Simply preventing coughing by direct means under any and all circumstances may cause damage because harmful factors will then be able to enter. <clears throat> the body coughs because in its present condition it cannot tolerate these harmful factors and wants to eliminate them. The cough reflex is just a sign of something happening in the organism that makes it necessary to prevent the entry of invaders that could otherwise easily gain access. But the other symptoms we mentioned are also a defense, the body's fight against incipient tuberculosis. Sore throat and limb pain simply indicate that the organism will not permit the occurrence of lower processes that cannot be controlled from above. Again, if the predisposition to tuberculosis is recognized in time, it might be a good idea, for example, to support the organism by provoking moderate coughing and especially by inducing fatigue. In subsequent lectures, we will see how this can be done. It can also be accomplished through certain dietary measures. Close parentheses. And if weight loss occurs, for example, this too is only a means of defense, because the process that takes place if weight loss does not occur may be the specific lower process that cannot be controlled from above in this case. In other words, the body is defending itself by losing weight, so that this uncontrollable factor is simply absent for the time being. It is therefore extremely important to study such issues in detail, rather than simply trying to fatten up someone who is losing weight without giving any further thought to the matter. There may be a very good reason for this person's weight loss in the context of what is being expressed in the organism at the time. Night sweats are particularly instructive in the case of a person who does not yet have tuberculosis but is predisposed to the illness. These night sweats are nothing less than a bodily activity that takes place during sleep when it should take place during waking hours and when the person is fully spiritually and physically active. Something that ought to happen by day in full wakefulness does not take place then but comes to expression during the night. It is, simultaneously, a consequence and a defense. While relieved of its spiritual activity, the organism creates the activity that comes to expression in night sweats. In order to do full justice to this subject, we must know a bit about the intimate connection between all excretory functions, including sweat formation, and the aspect of our nature that includes psychological and spiritual activity. Building up processes, the vital anabolic processes, really constitute only a basis for the unconscious, while excretory processes, wherever they may take place, correspond to the awake and conscious activities of the ensouled organism. Our thinking, too, corresponds to the brain's excretory or catabolic processes rather than to its anabolic processes. <laughs> Night sweats constitute an excretory process that normally ought to parallel an activity of the soul and spirit. But because the upper part of the body is not interacting with the lower in the right way, this process waits until night when the organism is freed from activity of spirit and soul. So you can see how a careful study of all the processes that are connected 
with the overall growth and development of the human organism, be it well or ill, leads to the conclusion that interaction between disease symptoms also occurs. Weight loss is, first of all, a sign of disease. But weight loss is something that is appropriate in the context of incipient or early stage tuberculosis. The symptoms of an illness are united in a functional structure, a non-material organization, as it were. In a certain sense, one symptom belongs with another. As a result, if other conditions in the organism ought to provoke some sort of reaction, let us stick to incipient tuberculosis here, but the organism itself does not have the strength to accomplish this, then the rational thing to do is to assist the reaction just at that point, causing one illness to follow on another. Ancient physicians stated this as an important rule in the education of physicians. They said that the danger in being a physician lies in being able to induce illness as well as drive it away. Physicians are able to induce illnesses to the same extent that they are able to cure them. Thus the ancients, who knew more about such connections because of their atavistic clairvoyance, realized that a malicious physician would be able to make people not only well but also ill. This ability to induce illness maliciously, however, is related to the need to induce certain disease states in order to bring them into the correct relationship with other disease states. But these induced disease states are illnesses in their own right, and coughing, sore throat, chest pain, weight loss, night sweats, all of these are real symptoms of illness. It may be necessary to induce them, but they remain real symptoms nonetheless. Of course, it is easy to realize that having half cured a person, that is, having induced these symptoms, we cannot simply abandon the patient to his or her fate. At this point, the second part of the healing process must set in. We must take care not to stop with inducing reactions to ward off the disease. Something must then ensue that cures these reactions and sets the whole organism back on the right track. We would have to ensure, for instance, that when coughing or a sore throat either develops naturally or is artificially induced as a defense against incipient tuberculosis, the digestive process, which in such cases always shows signs of constipation, is set, right, is set straight. In one way or another, we will notice that this digestive process needs to be guided in the direction of an elimination process, diarrhea, for example. It is always necessary to allow diarrheal processes to follow coughing symptoms, sore throats, and the like. This points to the fact that a symptom appearing in the upper part of the body must not be seen in isolation we must often look to lower body processes to cure upper body symptoms, even though there is no material connection between them but only a correspondence. This is a prime consideration. <clears throat> when the metabolism is not controlled from above, severe symptoms of fatigue set in. I would not call these merely subjective symptoms, they are symptoms wholly determined organically and always based on a preponderance of the metabolism. Such symptoms of fatigue really do need to be induced in the tuberculosis patient, but they would have to be counteracted later at the appropriate time by means of a special diet, parenthesis, the details of which we will still have to discuss, close parenthesis, so that digestion predominates in such a way that the patient digests food better than normal and nutrients are more easily assimilated through digestion. Weight loss will later have to be counteracted 
through a diet leading to the disposition of fat formation in the organs and their tissues. We will have to deal with the induced night sweats by steering our patients toward an activity in which fully conscious, spiritualized exertion makes them sweat, so that they settle back into a healthy sweat formation process. You see, once a real understanding of cardiac function enables us to grasp correspondences between the upper and lower parts of the human being, and once we also understand the first signs of disease on the functional or etheric level, as in neurasthenia and hysteria, we can then move on to an understanding of their imprints on the organic and physical level. By studying the outer manifestations of symptoms that belong together, including symptoms we ourselves have induced, we will discover how to guide the course of an illness in a certain direction, deflecting it to a greater or lesser extent in order to lead the entire process back toward health at the right moment. Of course, social considerations are the greatest impediment to the type of treatment I have begun to describe here. That is why medicine is definitely also a social issue. The patients themselves often present the greatest obstacles because they naturally insist that we, quote, get rid, close quote, of their illness, as they put it. But if we immediately get rid of it, they may easily become even sicker than they were before. We must also consider the possibility that we will make them much sicker than before and that they will then have to wait until we are in a position to make them well again. By then most of them, as I'm sure many of you will confirm, will probably have taken to their heels. Correctly observing the human being in sickness and in health makes it imperative for the physician to have control over the post treatment period as well, if the entire course of therapy is to be as effective as it should be. We will simply have to agitate publicly for such things. In our age, with all its faith in authority, it should not be difficult to make people aware of essential factors like this, if only the appropriate popular movements can be set in motion. Of course, it is not always only the patients or social considerations that make it inconvenient to see an illness through to its conclusion. Excuse me for saying this in your presence, but sometimes this is the fault of physicians who are more or less satisfied with having gotten rid of an illness. You will see that accurately elaborating on the heart's role in the human organism gradually leads us to the essential nature of illness. You will need to consider, however, the radical contrast that exists between the functions of the lower and upper parts of the body. Although the lower functions have certainly overcome mere external chemical activity in a certain respect, in some ways they also still resemble the upper functions, which are their, which are their complete opposites. It is extremely difficult to adequately define this duality within the human organism because our language has almost no means of alluding to factors that counteract physical and organic processes. Perhaps you will understand me well enough for the time being, parenthesis, and I do not shy away from the prospect of encountering one bias or another in any of you, close parenthesis, if I attempt an analogy to clarify the character of this dualism between upper and lower processes. If you call to mind the properties of any substance, the properties that make its effect apparent to us in any way, you have what is absorbed into the human being's lower functions once it has been overcome by the organism, as happens in digestion. It is also possible, however, to homeopathize substances, if I may put it like that, to eliminate the substance's internal cohesiveness. This happens when we dilute the substance in any way or prepare homeopathic doses, 
the resulting phenomenon has in no way been given due consideration by our modern science, and in any case people tend to consider everything abstractly. Thus light is said to spread out in all directions from its source, the sun, for example, until it vanishes into infinity. But this is not true. No such activity ever vanishes into infinity. Instead, it goes only as far as the limits of a definite sphere, and then snaps back on itself as if it were elastic. Admittedly, however, its qualitative aspect is then often different from the quality of the original outgoing force. Only rhythmical processes exist in the natural world. There are no processes that lose themselves in infinity. There are only processes that rebound on themselves in a rhythmic way. This is true of both quantitative and qualitative expansion. When you begin dividing a substance, it possesses certain properties from the outset. These properties do not decrease into infinity as you continue the divisions. Beyond a certain point they swing back and turn into the opposite properties. This inner rhythm is also the basis of the contrast between our lower organization and our upper organization. Our upper organization is a homeopathizer. In a certain way it immediately counteracts the ordinary digestive processes, forming their opposite, their negative image. It could be said that when homeopathic pharmacists produce their dilutions, they are really transforming properties that otherwise relate to the lower human organization into properties that then relate to the upper human organization. This is a very interesting inner connection, and we will have more to say about it in the next few days. The end of Lecture 2 This is a reading of a uh, cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 3, given in Dornach on March 23, 1920. In the course of the lectures to come, I will make use of all of the requests that have been presented to me. Some of these requests may duplicate one another, so I need to have collected at least most of them before I begin. It will also make a difference whether we discuss them before or after a certain foundation has been laid. Today, therefore, I will attempt to create such a foundation for everything that will follow, taking into account what I have noted from your requests thus far. As you have seen, I attempted to take the morphology and inner function of the bony and muscular systems as the starting point for what we considered in the first lecture. Then, yesterday, we progressed at least far enough to give examples of the disease process and the requirements of therapy, taking the circulation of blood in the cardiac system as our example and point of departure. Now, today, I would like to present a few additional introductory thoughts about a way of looking at the overall possibility and general character of healing, a view that can be acquired through a more profound consideration of humankind. We will go into the details in later lectures, but I would like to discuss these fundamentals first. If you think about the character of modern medical education, you will find, for the most part, that therapy is taught parallel to pathology, without any clearly understandable connection between the two. Especially with regard to therapy, a merely empirical methodology is often the only approach, and totally dominates the scene, and we find almost no rational principles that could form the basis for practical therapeutic work. We know that in the course of the nineteenth century these deficits in medical thinking 
even led to the nihilistic school of medical thought, which emphasized diagnosis almost exclusively. Its practitioners were actually content to identify illnesses and generally took a very skeptical view of any rational basis for healing. <clears throat> if we were to make purely rational demands on the medical profession, we would actually have to say that an indication of a cure ought to be inherent in the diagnosis. A mere outer connection between therapy and pathology cannot be allowed to prevail. Our understanding of the nature of an illness must be able to lead to insight into the process of curing it. A related question, of course, is to what extent are therapeutic substances and processes present in the overall context of natural processes? Paracelsus is often quoted as saying something very interesting, that physicians must pass the test of nature. It cannot be said, however, that the modern literature on Paracelsus knows what to do with an aphorism like this. If it did, it would be intent on discovering healing processes by listening to nature. Admittedly, this search is indeed attempted in the case of disease processes that nature can cope with. But as a result, nature is observed only in exceptional cases when damage has already set in and nature knows what to do about it, whereas a true study of nature involves observing its normal processes. This study ought to give rise to the question of whether it is actually possible to observe so-called normal processes in nature in a way that yields insight into healing processes. You will notice immediately that this question is connected to another somewhat dubious question since healing processes in nature can obviously be studied in a normal way only when disease processes are normal occurrences in nature. So the question arises, are disease processes present in nature as such? so that we can learn to heal by passing nature's test. <clears throat> Although the answer to this question will emerge completely only as we continue with these lectures, we will attempt at least to get a bit closer to it today. But we can say immediately that the conventional scientific basis of medicine obstructs the path we are setting out on here. Current assumptions make it extremely difficult to go this route because, strange as it may seem, 19th century materialistic tendencies have led to a complete misunderstanding of the functions of the nervous system, which is the next system I will discuss in addition to the skeletal, muscular, and cardiac systems. It has gradually become customary to saddle the nervous system with everything that is soul-like in character. All the processes of spirit or soul taking place in the human being are thought to be subsumed by parallel processes found in the nervous system. Now you know that in my book titled Riddles of the Soul, I found it necessary to object to this way of studying nature. In that book, I made an initial attempt to demonstrate that only perceptive processes as such are connected to the nervous system, while all emotional processes connect directly rather than indirectly to the organism's rhythmical processes. Our studies here will yield a great deal of empirical confirmation of these truths. Today's scientists normally think that emotional processes have nothing to do with the rhythmic system directly, except inasmuch as these rhythmical processes are transmitted to the nervous system. They think that emotional activity is played out in the nervous system. 
Similarly, I attempted to show that all of our volitional activity is connected to the metabolic system directly, rather than indirectly via the nervous system. With regard to volitional processes, all that is left for the nervous system to do is to perceive them. The nervous system does not stage acts of will. It simply perceives what takes place in us as a result of volition. Everything I stated in Riddles of the Soul can definitely be confirmed by the relevant biological facts, whereas the opposing view that attributes psychological activity to the nervous system alone cannot be confirmed at all. It is possible for a so-called motor nerve to be severed and then allowed to grow back together into a single nerve. For once I would like to see how healthy reason can connect this fact with the other assumption that there are nerves that serve both sensory and motor functions. Such nerves do not exist. What we call motor nerves are nothing other than sensory nerves that perceive the movements of our limbs. That is, they perceive what is going on in the met metabolism of our limbs during an act of will. Thus, in reality, motor nerves are sensory nerves that perceive only what is going on inside us, while what we ordinarily call sensory nerves perceive the outer world. <clears throat> Moving in this direction, we encounter something that is enormously important for medicine, but can be given its due only when we take a good look at the actual facts of the matter. Especially if we are faced with the symptoms I took as our starting point yesterday in developing the example of tuberculosis, it is difficult to make do with the assumption that separate sensory and motor nerves exist. Sensible, sensible researchers have therefore assumed that each nerve conducts impulses in both directions rather than only from the periphery toward the center, or vice versa. Similarly, then, each motor nerve would have to lead in two directions, which means that if we take the nervous system as our basis for explaining any phenomenon such as hysteria, we find it necessary to assume that two lines of conduction exist running in opposite directions. Thus, as soon as we get down to facts, we are already forced to assume that nerves have properties that totally contradict current hypotheses about the nervous system. Through having learned to think about the nervous system in the prevalent way, we have actually obstructed everything we ought to know about other things that take place in the organism below the level of the nervous system what happens in hysteria, for example. Yesterday we characterized what happens in hysteria as metabolic processes that are simply perceived by means of the nerves. More careful attention should have been paid to this in the past, but instead the origins of hysteria were sought only in some kind of instability of or shock to the nervous system, and the entire responsibility was mistakenly laid on the nervous system. Something else, then, happened as a result. It cannot be denied that some of the more distant causes of hysteria are psychological ones, grief, disappointments, inner urges that may or may not be able to be fulfilled, that then turn into symptoms of hysteria. By separating the rest of the organism from the nervous system and directly associating the soul's activity exclusively with the nervous system, we are forced to hold the nervous system responsible for everything. This has led to a view that no longer corresponds in the least to the facts. <clears throat> 
and also leaves us with no means of linking the soul to the hum human organism as a whole. We can link it only to the nervous system. The soul aspect cannot be linked to the human organism as a whole, except possibly by inventing motor nerves that do not exist, and then expecting motor nerve functions to influence circulation and so forth, all of which is hypothetical in the extreme. What I have presented here has led even the most intelligent people astray in cases of autosuggestion and hypnosis and the like. These cases, which occurred some time ago, involved hysterical ladies misguiding the cleverest physicians and leading them around by the nose. This could happen simply because it was impossible to investigate what was going on within the body. Consequently, people fell for all kinds of behavior that such patients put on for the benefit of their doctors. In this context, it may be interesting to point out Dr. Schleich's error, although this case involves a hysterical man rather than an hysterical woman. Footnote, Karl Ludwig Schleich, 1859-1922, the discoverer of local anesthesia. This incident is described in his memoir, Besonte Vergangenheit, The Happy Past. Other works are von Schaltwerk der Gedanken, uh, The Switching Mechanism of Thoughts, Bewusstsein und Unsterblichkeit, Consciousness and Immortality, and von der Seele, Essays, Essays on the Soul, and a footnote. In spite of being accustomed to thinking quite clearly about such matters, Schleich committed an unavoidable error. He was consulted by a man who had pricked his finger with an inky pinpoint and said that this would surely lead to his death that same night. Blood poisoning would set in, so his arm needed to be amputated. It is obvious that Schleich, a surgeon, could not amputate under such circumstances. He could merely reassure the man and do what was necessary, clean out the wound, and so forth. But of course he could not amputate simply because the man claimed he would develop blood poisoning that same night. The patient in question then went to some other expert, who also did not amputate his arm, of course. But Schleich felt somewhat uneasy about the situation. The next morning he inquired immediately, and in fact his patient really had died during the night. Schleich put forward a diagnosis of death by autosuggestion. Diagnosing death by autosuggestion is obvious in this case, terribly obvious. But if we have any insight into the human being, it is simply not acceptable to think of this death, to think of this as death by autosuggestion in that sense. If we do, we are fundamentally confusing cause and effect. <clears throat> Results of the autopsy showed that blood poisoning had not set in, so the man in question had died, so it seemed, of a cause that remained unknown to the doctors. Someone capable of understanding this situation clearly, however, would conclude that the patient must certainly have died of a cause that was deeply rooted in his organism. On the previous day, this cause had made the man somewhat shaky and unsteady, so that he pricked his finger with the inky pen. This was a consequence of his shakiness, something that would not have happened otherwise. But while, outwardly, he became physically unsteady, his inner perceptive abilities were somewhat heightened. Under the influence of his illness, he had a prophetic premonition of his death the following night. This death had nothing at all to do with the fact that he had pricked his finger on an inky pen. Instead, his imminent death was the cause of of what he was feeling, and the entire incident was only superficially connected to the actual inner processes leading to death. There is no question in this case of, quote, death by autosuggestion, close quote. The man's belief that he was going to die had deeper roots 
and had nothing to do with actually bringing about his death. However, he did foresee his death and interpreted everything that happened in the light of this premonition. This example will show you immediately how incredibly careful we must be if we want to arrive at an objective assessment of the complicated processes going on in nature. We cannot afford to take the very simplest assumption as our starting point. But now we will have to ask the question, do sense perceptions and similar processes offer us a clue to the effects of a somewhat different sort that medications are meant to have on the human organism? You will agree that there are three kinds of influencing the human organism in its normal function via sensory perceptions that are taken further by the nervous system, via the rhythmic system of respiration and circulation, and via the metabolism. These three normal relationships must have analogies of some sort in the abnormal relationship we bring about between therapeutic substances, which must also be derived from outer nature in some way, and the human organism. <clears throat> Admittedly, what takes place between the outer world and the human organism is most clearly apparent in the nervous system. We must, therefore, ask ourselves how we can rationally conceive of the connection between the human being and the non-human external nature that we want to utilize either in the form of processes or in the form of therapeutic substances, in order to bring about healing in the human being. We must achieve a clear view of the interrelationship between the human being and external nature, the source of our medicines. Even if we apply only cold water treatments, we are using something external to the human being. Everything we use is taken from outside the human being and then applied to human processes. And we must achieve a rational view of the nature of the connection between the human being and outer non-human processes. Admittedly, we are now coming to another chapter of conventional medical education that is governed by pure aggregation rather than by any organic connection among its parts. Although medical students listen to preparatory scientific lectures, their later courses on general and specialized pathology and general therapeutic methods are then based on this preparatory science and so on and so forth. By the time the actual medical courses begin, not much more is heard about how the processes and especially the therapeutic methods covered in their medical lectures relate to processes in outer nature. <clears throat> I believe that physicians have undergone modern medical training excuse me, I believe that physicians who have undergone modern medical training will not only experience this outwardly and rationally as a deficit but will also carry it with them as a strong feeling that will force itself upon them when practical intervention in a disease process is called for, a feeling of uncertainty as to whether to use one medication or another. In actuality, they very seldom have any real knowledge of how the chosen remedy relates to what is going on in the human being. This is a case in which the very nature of the matter points to a much-needed reform in the education of physicians. Today I would like to make use of specific processes in outer non-human nature to illustrate how they differ in many respects from the natural processes occurring in the human being. I would like to begin with processes that can be observed in plants and lower animals, and from there we will find our way to those that can be induced by substances we extract from non-human nature in general, whether from the plant or animal kingdoms, or particularly from the mineral kingdom. 
but we can approach the essential character of pure mineral substances only by taking very elementary scientific ideas as our point of departure and then proceeding to what happens. Uh, for example, if we use arsenic or tin or any other substance as a remedy that is introduced into the human organism. The first thing that needs to be pointed out is that the metamorphoses taking place during growth in non-human organisms are completely different from those within humans. We will not be able to avoid formulating the different principles that apply to living growth both in human and non-human beings. The difference that appears here is of fundamental significance. For example, observe the common black locust, Robinia pseudacacia. If you cut its leaflets off at the petioles, something interesting happens. The petioles metamorphose somewhat, and then these transformed knobby petioles take over the function of the leaves. Petioles is spelled P-E-T-I-O-L-E-S. To begin with, we will hypothesize that what is so highly active here is a force that is present throughout the plant and that comes to expression when we prevent the plant from using one of its normally developed organs for specific functions. A remnant of what is markedly present in a plant, which is simpler in its growth patterns, becomes evident in a human being who is prevented for some reason from using one arm or hand for some purposes. The other hand develops more strongly, becomes physically larger, and so forth. We must make the connection between such things, because that is the route to recognizing a possible method of healing. Now, in outer non-human nature, this phenomenon is taken to great lengths. For example, if we observe plants growing on a cliff, we may find that certain petioles of the plant, plants, develop without ever forming leaves. The leaves are absent. Instead, certain petioles bend over in order to support the plant. The leaves remain undeveloped, and instead the plants have these leafless, transformed petioles that serve as organs of support. And there's a drawing. This is indicative of the plant's inner formative forces, which make it possible for the plant to adapt to a great extent to the mode of life demanded by its environment. Especially in lower organisms, we encounter very interesting forces like this. For example, if you take any embryo that has advanced to the gastrula stage, you can cut it in half down the middle and each piece will close up and be able to develop the three parts, upper, middle and lower, of its own intestinal tract. If we cut a gastrula in half, we discover that each half behaves the way the uncut whole would have behaved. You know that this experiment can be carried further with lower animals, even earthworms, and that pieces cut off of certain lower animals will regrow. That is, the animal's internal formative forces replace the parts we have cut off. These formative forces must be pointed out objectively, not merely by hypothesizing about some sort of life force, but really objectively. If we observe more closely, if we really follow what is actually going on, we can see, for example, that if we cut off part of a frog's body at a very early stage of its development, the rest of the organism puts out a new part. <clears throat> if your way of thinking is materialistically inclined, you may say that there are forces of tension present in the wound that will replace what used to grow there. But that cannot be the case. If I cut an organism here, there's another diagram, and a new part developed through forces of tension at the site of the wound, what grew back would have to be what is immediately adjacent to the wound. But in reality, that is not the case. In reality, if you cut off a frog larva's terminal organs 
such as the tail or even the head, or the antenna in other animals. What grows back is not the same as the adjacent part. It is the part that the organism needs. This means that it is totally impossible for forces of tension intrinsic to the wound site to put forth what develops there. On the contrary, we must assume that the whole organism is involved in some way. We can actually trace such things as they occur in lower organisms. Now that I have shown you how to pursue a question like this, you can expand it to all the empirical reports that have accumulated in the literature to date. And in each instance you will see that this is the only path leading to insight into the matter. Of course you will say that this is not the case in human beings. It would be nice if we could cut off someone's finger or arm and it would simply grow back. But it doesn't. So the question is, what happened to the formative forces of growth that are so evident in lower animals? What has happened to them in the human organism? Have they been lost? Are they simply not present? Anyone who knows how to observe nature objectively will understand that this is the only path to a natural view of the connection between the spiritual and physical aspects of the human being. In the human being, the forces that we recognize here as sculptural forces, as it were, forces that create forms directly out of substance, have simply been lifted out of the organs and are present only in the human soul and spirit. That is where they are. By being lifted out of the organs, by not remaining organ-forming forces, they are available to human beings for other purposes and are present in the functions of the human soul and spirit. Whenever I think or feel, I think and feel with the same forces that are sculpturally active in the plant kingdom or in the lower animals. I would not be able to think, feel, or will without these same organism, without these same forces that I have extracted from matter. When I look at lower organisms, I must realize that their sculptural forces in place there are the same as those I also carry within myself. I, however, have taken those forces out of my organs and possess them. I think and feel and will with the same forces that are sculpturally active out there in the world of lower organisms. Anyone who wants to become a psychologist, whose constructs have some substance and are not mere words, which is, now psycho which is how psychology is construed today, would have to trace the processes of thinking, feeling and willing in a way that reveals them to be the same forces that appear in lower sculptural formations, <clears throat> but taking place on the level of spirit and soul. Just look at how our inner psychological processes can accomplish a task that we can no longer perform on the organic level. Trains of thought that have escaped us can be finished with others, which we bring in from far away rather than from what is nearest at hand. This function is actually similar to the regrowth of necessary parts of the organism that I mentioned yesterday. What we experience on the inner psychological level completely parallels the natural formative forces and principles that are present in the outer world. There is a true parallelism between them. We need to point this out and to show that, in essence, the formative principle for us human beings in the outer world is our life in soul and in spirit, which we have extracted from the organic level so that it no longer constitutes the formative basis of matter or substance in our own bodies. But we have, extract, but we have not extracted it from all parts of the body equally, and we have withdrawn it in different ways. <clears throat>
We can approach the human organism in the appropriate way only when we are equipped with the knowledge that we have now developed. <clears throat> if you look at everything constituting our nervous system, you will discover the peculiar fact that neurons, nerve tissue, and so forth are not usually described as very highly evolved structures. They have remained behind at relatively early stages of evolution. We might expect these so-called nerve cells to demonstrate the character of earlier primitive cell structures, but in certain other respects they do not do that at all. For example, they are not capable of reproduction. Neurons, like blood cells, are incapable of self-replication from the moment they are formed. Thus, at a relatively early stage, an ability that is the common property of non-human cells is taken away from them. They remain behind on an earlier developmental level. To some extent, they are paralyzed at this evolutionary stage. The part that is paralyzed takes on a separate existence as the human being's sole spiritual aspect. In reality, our sole spiritual processes hearken back to what formerly assumed organic material form. We achieve this, however, only by incorporating nerve tissue that we kill off, or at least paralyze, at a relatively early stage. <clears throat> In this way we can approach the essential character of nerve tissue. We then discover the reason for its idiosyncratic character, why it looks so similar to primitive structures on the one hand, even in its further developments, while, on the other hand, it serves what we usually call the highest aspect of the human being, namely spiritual activity. I believe, although this is just an aside and is not meant as part of our considerations, that even on superficial examination, the human head, which encloses the different nerve cells within a solid suit of armor, is more reminiscent of lower animals than of highly evolved species. I would go so far as to say that, although it has been transformed, the human head is reminiscent of prehistoric animals. In speaking of lower animals, we usually say that they have external skeletons, while higher animals and humans have internal skeletons, with the exception of our heads. Our most highly developed part has an external skeleton. This is something that could at least be a leitmotif of sorts for what has just been described. Now imagine what can happen to these formative forces, forces that are present in outer non-human nature, but that we ourselves have taken from our organism in order to use them for our spirit and soul. What happens when something we call an illness makes it necessary for us to guide these forces back into the organism by using a remedy such as a plant or the like? This is a topic I will still speak about later in more detail, but essentially we link the organism to something it is lacking. We help it by supplementing it with something that we withdrew from it by becoming human. <clears throat> Here you can already see the dawning of what can be described as a healing process. We call on the help of forces in nature that we ourselves as normal human beings do not possess. We use them when we need to make an inner part of us stronger than it is in a normal human being. If we take one of our organs, the lungs perhaps, as an example, just so we can talk about this matter in concrete terms, we will find that we have withdrawn formative principles from organs such as this in order to have them available for our soul and spirit. Suppose 
we discover somewhere in the plant kingdom these same forces that we have withdrawn from our lungs. If we then administer them to a person with a pulmonary disorder, we are coming to the aid of that person's pulmonary functions. You see, the question now arises, which forces in outer non-human nature are similar to the forces that underlie our human organs, but have been withdrawn to serve soul spiritual functions? This route leads away from merely experimental methods toward a rational approach to therapy. In addition to the errors people fell into with regard to the nervous system, which are errors about something inside the human being, a very significant error was committed with regard to nature outside the human being. I will simply point out that this error today, excuse me, I will simply point out this error today and elaborate on it later. In our materialistic age, people have gradually come to think of the beings of outer nature as having undergone an evolution of sorts, from the so-called simplest to the most complicated. After first extending their view to include lower organisms, they studied morphological transformations right up to the most complex organisms, also taking into account non-organic forms, such as those in the mineral kingdom. In looking at the mineral kingdom, they realized that it is simpler than the plant kingdom. This eventually led to all those strange questions about how life emerged from the mineral kingdom, about the one-time event that made substances come together and abandon their mere inorganic activity for organic activity. The idea of generatio equivoca, spontaneous generation, stimulated many discussions. To an unbiased observer, it, it, not at, it is not at all clear that this view is correct. On the contrary, it must be said that in a certain respect it is just as possible to imagine that minerals evolved from living organisms when life was withdrawn from plants as it is to imagine an evolution that proceeds from plants through animals to humans. As I said, I simply want to point this out today. It will be clarified as we continue our studies. We can come to terms with the issue of evolution only if we do not imagine it as proceeding upward from minerals to plants to animals to humans. Instead, we must choose a starting point in the middle and imagine one upward line of evolution which moves from plants through animals to humans and another downward evolution that leads to the minerals. That is, instead of taking the mineral kingdom as the starting point, we must begin in the middle, so that some forms result from an ascending line of evolution, others from a descending line. If we do this, we will come to the insight that the forces that appear in the downward evolution from plants to minerals, and especially to metals, which are an exceptionally important mineral type, bear a special relationship to their mirror image in the ascending line of evolution. In short, the question that comes to mind is, what are these special mineral forces that we can study only when we examine, as indeed we did, the formative forces in lower organisms? In the minerals, these forces become visible in crystallization. Crystallization very definitely shows us something that appears when we consider downward evolution. It is somehow related to, but not the same as, the formative forces that become apparent when we consider upward evolution. So, if we introduce the forces in minerals into a living body a new question arises. We answered a similar question. What happens when we supplement the human organism with formative forces from the plant and animal kingdoms, forces that our soul and spirit have withdrawn from our own organization? <laughs>
we help the organism. But what happens when the forces we introduce into the human organism are different in quality? What if we use forces that are present in downward evolution, that is, in the mineral kingdom? That is the question I want to pose today. It should be thoroughly answered in the course of our studies here. But we have still not reached the point of being able to make any real contribution to the question we highlighted at the beginning of today's lecture. Can we discover a healing process by listening to nature? <laughs> In posing such questions, it is always important to approach nature with the appropriate insights. And we have been attempting to acquire at least a sketchy insight into such matters, so that certain processes will reveal their essential character. This is the important point. As you know, there are two distinct processes in the human organism that are also present in animals, although we are less interested in that at the moment. In a certain sense, if we observe these processes equipped with the ideas we have now acquired, it becomes apparent that they are opposite or contrasting functions. I must make a point of emphasizing that this is not entirely true. Please keep this in mind so that you do not misunderstand what I am now going to present. But to a considerable extent they are polar opposites. These two processes are blood formation and milk formation as they appear in the human organism. Even outwardly they differ in very significant ways. Blood formation occurs in the hidden depths of the human organism, while milk formation takes place closer to the surface. <clears throat> if we are considering the human being, the most essential difference between blood formation and milk formation is that blood formation possesses a very strong capacity for developing formative forces. In the overall economy of the human organism, if I may use such a materialistic expression, blood is the element to which formative forces must be attributed. Thus, in some respects, blood still possesses the formative forces that we perceive here in the lower body. They are still present in the blood. Modern science, in particular, would discover a very important support if it would study the blood, but at present it is not taking up this study in a truly rational sense. It would find support in the fact that the red blood cells, which are blood's main component, are not capable of reproduction. They do not have the ability to self-replicate. This is a feature they have in common with neurons. But when we emphasize a shared characteristic such as this, it is always important to know whether the reason for it is the same in both cases. The reason cannot be the same, because we have not withdrawn formative capacities from the blood to the extent that we have withdrawn them from nerve tissue. Nerve tissue, which forms the basis of our conceptual activity, lacks internal formative capacities to a great extent. In human beings, nerve tissue continues to develop during life after birth, but this development is largely dependent on outer impressions, that is, internal formative capacities give way to the ability to simply adapt to external influences. The situation is different with blood, which retains internal formative capacities to a great extent. In a certain sense, as you know from experience, these internal formative capacities are also present in milk. If they were not, milk would not be a healthy food for infants, and we would not be able to give it to them. What infants need is milk which contains formative capacities similar to those in blood. 
Thus, with regard to formative capacities, there is a certain similarity between blood and milk. <clears throat> there is also a considerable difference, however. Milk possesses this formative capacity, but it has very little, only minimal amounts, of one substance blood needs in abundance in order to exist, namely iron, which is the only metal whose compounds in the human organism show a significant ability to crystallize. Thus, although blood does contain small amounts of other metals, the difference is that blood needs iron, a pronounced metallic factor, in order to exist. Milk, which also possesses formative capacities, does not need iron. So the question is, why does blood need it? This question is actually of cardinal importance for medical science as a whole. We know that blood needs iron. We will now gather material evidence to support the facts that I have outlined today. First of all, I will substantiate the statement that blood is the one substance in the human organism that is ill by nature and must constantly be cured by iron. This is not the case with milk. If milk were ill in the same sense as blood, it could not serve, as in fact it does, as a formative agent for human beings, a formative agent that is introduced from outside. When we consider the blood, we are considering the factor in the human being that is constantly diseased for the sake of the human constitution. It is simply the nature of blood to be diseased and to be constantly cured through the addition of iron. That is, the process that takes place in our blood is an ongoing, internal healing process. If physicians want to pass the test of nature, it is most important for them to consider one of nature's normal processes rather than one that is abnormal. And the process taking place in blood is certainly a normal one, although it is also one that nature must constantly cure by supplying a mineral, namely iron. In a graphic representation of what happens to the blood, we might depict what blood possesses by virtue of its own constitution, but without the addition of iron as a downward curve or line that would end in the total dissolution of the blood. And there's a drawing. Meanwhile, what iron accomplishes in the blood, constantly, excuse me, constantly leading it back upward and healing it, could be represented by this yellow line. In actuality, we have here a normal process that must be emulated if we are to think about healing at all. In this instance, we really can pass the test of nature, because we see the processes that nature carries out by introducing a non-human factor, a metal and its forces, into the human being. And at the same time we see how a factor, such as blood, which wants to remain within the organism at all costs, requires healing, while a factor such as milk, which strives to leave the organism, does not and is able even to transfer formative forces, if, like milk, it contains them, to another organism in a healthy way. Thus, a polarity of sorts exists between blood and milk, not a total polarity, but one that we must look at carefully, because there is a great deal that we can learn from it. We will continue with this topic tomorrow. I had to present all this first, because I realized that your questions will be answered very differently after we acquire the right concepts as a basis for answering them. The end of Lecture 3 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 4, given in Dornach on March 24th, 1920. Our discussion yesterday afternoon was certainly extremely interesting. In connection with the question I see before us now, however,
I must once again emphasize, as I have done before, that an adequate means of discovering the connection between individual remedies and individual disease symptoms can be supplied only after we have conclusively considered certain preliminary questions. Only then can we assess the implications of insights into the connection between the human being and the outer non-human world that serves as the source of our remedies. Without dealing with these initial questions, it is especially impossible to talk about the connection between individual remedies and individual organs, for the simple reason that this connection is not an entirely simple one. <clears throat> On the contrary, it is somewhat complicated, and we can gauge its actual significance only after dealing with the preliminary questions. That is what we will be doing today, and possibly also for part of tomorrow. After that, however, it will become possible to really explain concrete connections between individual remedies, or more particularly therapeutic methods, and diseases of individual organs. Today, however, there is something more I would like to say by way of introduction. I hope you will simply accept it for the moment, because it may be able to shed a certain light on a number of issues. And, because of the initial shock of such matters, I must emphasize that they simply are somewhat shocking. Taking up what was mentioned here yesterday afternoon, I would like to ask you to look at the other side of the question. <clears throat> to our great satisfaction, numerous instructive cases of very specific cures were presented here yesterday. Footnote. The present lecture course originally intended to consist of 14 lectures and last for two, two weeks, was extended to three weeks with six additional lectures. During this time there were lectures by participants and additional gatherings during which doctors presented cases for discussion, which Steiner attended whenever possible. End of footnote. Let us make a suggestion, if only so that you choose not to implement it, though it is very tempting to do so, about a very simple way of making these cures much less frequent. Of course, it is possible for me to talk about this only in a circle of people with experience in anthroposophy. You would simply need to do everything in your power to make Ritter's therapeutic method a matter of common knowledge and concern. Footnote, Marie Ritter uh, died 1924 in Munich. Rudolf Steiner had visited her as early as December 1908. She developed therapies using light and color, which Steiner later stated are effective only while the illness remains in the etheric body. See Introduction to Using M. Ritter's Photodynamic Remedies, Munich, 1913, in German, and also in German, Neurodynamic Therapy, in connection with studies and empirical findings on the photodynamic effect of fluorescent and luminescent substances on certain cell areas and nerve endings. Leipzig, 1905. End of footnote. What you are failing to consider with regard to these therapeutic successes of yours is that you are standing there as isolated physicians. Of course, some of you may well be aware of individually having to do battle with the great majority of other physicians, and that as soon as you succeed in making Ritter's therapy a subject of study for the universities, when many, if not all, physicians begin using this method to cure people, and you find yourselves belonging to the majority rather than the, than the opposition, you will experience a considerable reduction in your cure rates. Strange as this may seem, such things do happen in real life. Matters are sometimes completely different from how you imagine them. As an individual physician, you have the greatest interest in curing individual patients, and modern materialistic medicine has even found a legal argument of sorts for focusing exclusively on healing individuals. <clears throat> 
This legal argument consists in saying that illnesses do not exist. There are only individuals who are ill. If people were as isolated with regard to illness as they outwardly appear to be today, there would be some basis for this legal argument. But, in fact, people are not that isolated. In this context, what Dr. E presented yesterday was very significant. Certain diseases tend to cover very broad territories, and if you have cured one person, you can never be sure how many others you may have saddled with the illness in another instance. You do not see the single case in the context of the whole process. So the details of such circumstances are very striking. But anyone who has the totality of human health in mind must speak from a different perspective. This is what makes it necessary to avoid a one-sided, merely therapeutic orientation and to fully develop therapy on the basis of pathology. This is precisely what we will attempt here in order to bring some kind of rationality into what is otherwise only an empirical and statistical way of thinking. Footnote. Regarding the nature of disease and epidemics and their relationship to karma, see Steiner's lectures on title Manifestations of Karma, London, Rudolf Steiner Press, 1995, lectures 3, 4, 5, and 7. End of footnote. Today, we will begin with a fact that is generally known but has certainly not been given its due in the context of scientific medical thought, a fact that can provide the basis for assessing the relationship of the human being to the non-human natural world. As you know, the human being is a threefold being with a sensory nervous system, a circulatory or rhythmic system, and a metabolic system. By virtue of our metabolism, we human beings stand in a negative relationship to what is going on out in the natural world of plants. Please call to mind the fact that if we consider only the natural world's flora, we will notice that plants tend to concentrate carbon. Carbon becomes the basis of the entire plant kingdom. To the extent that we are surrounded by plants, we are surrounded by organisms or structures whose existence is based on concentrating carbon. Please do not forget that although the principle underlying this formative process also appears in the human organism, it is the very nature of the human organism to constantly negate this process in its nascent state, to destroy it and replace it with its opposite. The beginnings of this process are present within us, in what I have been calling the lower human being. There we deposit carbon out of our own forces. We begin the process of becoming plants. But then our upper organization makes us resist this process. We negate the process by counteracting the carbon with oxygen, by processing it into carbonic acid. Thus the internal process we must develop is the opposite of becoming a plant. Please pay attention to these processes that counteract outer nature wherever you may find them. For if you do, you will acquire an ever more thorough understanding of the real human being. You do not understand the human being as such if you simply weigh an individual taking this as a symbol of all other methods of physical examination, but you immediately understand something about human mechanics if you consider that the brain is known to weigh an average of 1,300 grams. But if the brain bore down with its actual weight, if it exerted this amount of pressure on the lower surface of the skull, the entire network of delicate blood vessels would be crushed. The pressure that the brain actually exerts on the underlying surface does not exceed 20 grams. This is due to the fact that the brain, according to Archimedes' well-known hydraulic principle, has a certain buoyancy because it is actually floating in cerebral fluid, so that most of its weight does not come to bear on the base of the skull. 
but is cancelled out by buoyancy. Gravity is overcome so that we are subject to buoyancy, the force that counteracts physical weight, rather than to the physical weight of our own organism. Similar conditions prevail in other human processes. In actual fact, we live within what physis, P-H-Y-S-I-S, or physical reality, sublates in us, rather than in what it does to us. Footnote, sublate, uh, raise up and neutralize, but at the same time, preserve. Sublate, end of footnote. Thus, we are also not subject to any of the processes that we perceive as being present in outer nature and culminating in the plant kingdom. Instead, we live by sublating the process of becoming a plant. This is a very important concept to consider if we want to make the connection between the diseased human organism and phytotherapeutic substances. Footnote, phytotherapy, plant or herbal therapy. End of footnote. Now imagine the following fictional situation. We look at all the beautiful flora surrounding us in the world. We are highly delighted, and rightly so. It is different when we cut open a dead sheep and immediately experience another type of flora, which is brought about by factors similar to those calling forth the outer flora. When the odor of decay drifts toward us from inside the sheep, we are certainly much less delighted about the existence of intestinal flora. This is the main point to focus on, because clearly, in this instance, the same causes that give rise to the flora of the non-human, natural world must be combated in the human being to prevent intestinal flora from coming about. This opens up a very broad field of comparative research into the intestinal structures of different forms of animals including the mammals, and going right up to human beings. I would like to recommend that you younger medical students use as much as possible from this field in your doctoral dissertations. This will prove to be an extremely rich field of research because many very important issues have not yet been investigated. In particular, try to discover why a sheep, when we open its carcass, emits such a terrible stench of decay, and why this is not the case even with carrion eating birds, which actually smell relatively pleasant when we open them up. These subjects contain a great deal that has not been worked through scientifically at all as of now. Furthermore, there are numerous possibilities in this field for investigating intestinal morphology. Consider the fact that, on the whole, bird species differ significantly from mammals and humans. In avian species, you find that the bladder and colon are extremely poorly developed. <clears throat> Materialistic physicians like Dr. Metchnikoff of Paris made very great errors in considering these issues. Uh, footnote Elias Metchnikoff, 1845 to 1916 professor of zoology at in Odessa and later director of the Institut Pasteur in Paris. End of footnote. Colon-like structures and bladder-like bulges develop only in the large flightless birds. This points to the important fact that birds lack the possibility of temporarily storing their excreta within the organism in order to eliminate them deliberately at an opportune moment. Instead, intake and excretion are continually being balanced out. We are taking a very superficial view of the matter if we imagine that diseases are caused by all the flora, and also fauna, as we shall see, that appear in the intestines or anywhere else in the human organism. Examining the literature on pathology today, in every chapter, you come across statements about the discovery that this bacterium is associated with this disease or that bacterium with that disease, and so forth. 
All of these facts are extremely interesting as far as botany and zoology of the human intestines are concerned, but none of it has any significance for illness except possibly as a sign that allows us to recognize the disease. Because when one or the other form of disease is present, the human organism can be said to offer one or the other interesting little animal or plant a substrate upon which it can develop. It does not mean anything more than this. The growth of microscopic fauna and flora has very little to do with the actual disease, only indirectly, if at all. As you see, the logic that modern medicine develops here is very peculiar. Imagine that you discover a countryside where you find a large number of admirably well-fed, healthy-looking cows. Are you then going to say that everything you see is the way it is because these cows have somehow been flown in and the countryside has been infected with them? This thought probably will not occur to you. Instead, you need to investigate why there are hard-working people in this region, why the soil is especially suited to raising certain types of livestock. In short, you will most likely limit your thinking to all the possible reasons why the well-cared-for cows are there. It will not occur to you that what is going on is the result of the countryside having been infected and invaded by well-cared-for cows. But this is no different from the logic that modern medical science develops with regard to microbes and the like. The presence of these interesting creatures tells us only that the habitat suits them, nothing more. We need to focus on studying this habitat. Of course, other things can happen as a direct or indirect result. For example, we might say, there are well-cared-for cows in this area. If we add a few more, maybe a few more people will pull themselves together and start to work hard, and such a situation might indeed arise. Of course, it can happen that a bacterial invasion provokes a well-prepared habitat to, to succumb to disease processes of its own accord. In reality, however, current bacteriological studies have nothing to do with the study of disease. If people would pay attention to developing sound logic, these pronouncements by official science and their devastating consequences for sound thinking would be impossible. One issue that needs serious consideration is the fact that a certain connection between the upper and the lower regions of the human being, as described in the past few days, can be the cause of an incorrect interrelationship between these two aspects. The lower human being is predisposed to a process of becoming plant-like, and this needs to be arrested. But the forces active in the lower human being may be unable to stop this vegetative process if they are too weakly counteracted from above. This situation presents an opportunity for the development of an abundance of intestinal flora, which then become a sign that the lower part of the human body is not working in the appropriate way. The peculiar thing is that in the human being, activities that should, should be played out on lower levels are damned up when they cannot run their course in the right place. That is, if the lower body is organized in accordance with certain processes that then cannot be played out there, after all, these processes are pushed back. Although this may sound like layperson's terminology to some of you, these expressions are more scientific than much of the content of today's standard pathology texts. These processes which under normal circumstances are meant to take place in the lower parts of the human being, are pushed back into the upper parts. We need to trace the origin of excretions from the lungs or from other upper organs such as the pleura 
by checking what is going on in normal or abnormal excretory processes in the lower part of the body. <clears throat> it is extremely important to take a good look at what happens when the lower part of the body pushes organic processes back toward the upper body. Much of what can take place in the upper body is nothing other than lower body processes that have been pushed upward. If the right interaction does not take place between the upper and the lower human being, then these processes are pushed up. Please consider one additional phenomenon. You are familiar, from everyday experience, with another circumstance that has simply not undergone the adequate evaluation that is essential for sound science. The moment you have thoughts about a particular organ, or to put it better, thoughts that are connected with any particular organ, the organ itself becomes active in a certain way. Once again, this is a promising field for future doctoral dissertations. Simply study the connection between certain thoughts that appear in the human being and salivation, for example, or mucus secretion in the intestines, or the secretion of milk, urine, or semen. Study how specific thoughts appear, paralleling these organic activities. What sort of a phenomenon are you encountering here? Certain thoughts appear within your soul life. Organic processes take place as parallel phenomena. What does this mean? Everything that appears in your thoughts is contained within the organs in question. If you have a thought and a particular glandular secretion runs parallel to it, you have drawn the activity that underlies your thinking out of that gland. You carry out this activity separately from that gland, leaving the gland to its own fate. As a result, it devotes itself to its own activity, secretion. Secretion is prevented, that is, whatever the gland would otherwise discharge remains united with it, whenever the corresponding thought keeps it united. This is a clearly visible example of how formative activity leaves our organs and enters our thoughts. You might say that if you had not been thinking in that way, your gland would not have secreted anything. You withdrew a force from the gland and transferred it to your soul life, and then the gland began secreting. There you have in the human organism itself the most obvious proof of a statement I made in a previous lecture, that what we experience on the level of soul and spirit is actually nothing other than disjunct formative forces of the sort that shape what we encounter in the rest of the natural order. In the rest of nature, the formative forces that we withdraw from our intestinal flora are still present in the development of external flora, which parallels that of our intestinal flora. If you look around outside at mountain and meadow flora, you must acknowledge that the forces inherent in them are the same forces that you use in developing your thoughts when you imagine something or have feelings. Your intestinal flora are different from the flora outside because the latter do not need to have thoughts taken away from them. <clears throat> the thoughts remain as intrinsic to the plants as their stalks, leaves, and flowers. This example will give you an idea of the relationship between what governs flowers or leaves and what goes on within you when you develop an intestinal flora but do not allow it to retain its formative forces. You take these forces away, because if you did not, you would not be a thinking human being. Your intestinal flora has had these forces taken away from it, but the outer flora retain them. This is no less the case with regard to fauna. Without 
insight into these issues, it is impossible to understand the connection between the human being and a phytotherapeutic substance. Similarly, without an awareness of the fact that we human beings are depriving our own intestinal fauna of the forces that bestow form in the external animal kingdom, it is equally impossible to conceive of the appropriate therapeutic use of animal serums. As you can see, a rational and systematic approach to these questions is possible only when we really take a look at the connection between human beings and their environment. But next, I would like to draw your attention to another matter that is extremely significant. I don't know whether many of you remember, it was some time ago, when these ridiculous prohibitions against spitting in public went into effect everywhere in the attempt to combat tuberculosis. Such prohibitions are ridiculous for the simple reason that, as everyone should know, even ordinary diffuse sunlight kills tubercle bacilli in a very short time. If you examine sputum after a period of time, even after a very short time, there are no more tubercle bacilli in it. Sunlight kills them immediately. Even if the supposition of ordinary medicine were correct, prohibiting spitting would still be highly ridiculous. At most, such prohibitions make sense in terms of ordinary cleanliness, but not in terms of public hygiene in the broadest sense. If we, once again, begin to assess the facts correctly, this example is very significant, because it reminds us that the bacillus belonging to the fauna or flora of tuberculosis cannot survive in sunlight. The bacillus cannot survive there. It is not adapted to sunlight. But where can it survive? In the interior of the human body. And why can it survive precisely there? Not that it does the actual damage, but we do have to look at what is active in the diseased body. Here we encounter a situation we have tended to disregard. We are constantly surrounded by light, and light, as you probably recall from studying science, is extremely significant in the development of non-human organisms, and especially for all the flora outside the human being. We are surrounded by this light, but something very significant happens to this light, which is purely etheric, at the boundary between ourselves and the outer world. It is, and must be, transformed. You see, just as the process of becoming plant-like is arrested by human beings, interrupted and counteracted by the formation of carbonic acid, which is active in the light, is Excuse me, let me read that again. You see, just as the process of becoming plant-like is arrested by human beings, interrupted and counteracted by the formation of carbonic acid, what is active in the light is also broken off. Thus, if we look for light within the human being, it must be different, a metamorpho metamorphosis of light. As soon as we cross the boundary, into the interior of the human being, we find metamorphosed light. This means that we, human beings, are not only transform ordinary, tangible, natural processes within ourselves, we also transform intangibles. We transform light. We turn it into something else. If judged correctly, the fact that the tubercle bacillus still does well, excuse me, the fact that the tubercle bacillus does well within the human being, but immediately perishes in the presence of sunlight, is simply evidence that this bacillus is in its element in the product of the transformation of light that appears inside the human being. Therefore, if the bacillus thrives too well there, something must be wrong with this transformed light. Taking this finding as your starting point, you can realize that one of the causes of tuberculosis must be the fact that within the human being, who would otherwise not take in an excess of the ever-present tubercle bacilli, 
something that should not happen is happening to this transformed light, this metamorphosis of light. Tubercle, bacilli are always present, although not in sufficient quantities, but they are superabundant in a person who contracts tuberculosis. Tubercle bacilli would not be present to such an extent if something abnormal were not taking place with regard to the process of transforming sunlight. <clears throat> I can present these ideas only as points of view, of course, but you will be overwhelmed by the empirical confirmation that you will encounter. If a sufficient number of dissertations and treatises are written on this subject, it will not be difficult to discover that what happens when an individual becomes a suitable breeding ground for tubercle bacilli is due either to that person's reduced ability to take in sunlight or to a lifestyle that does not allow him or her to get enough sunlight so that the appropriate balance does not exist between the sunlight entering the person and the light metamorphosing process. As a result, the person in question has to draw down reserves of internal metamorphosed light. Please take into account the fact that simply being human means that we always have an internal store of metamorphosed light. Our organization needs it. Whenever the interchange between the human being and external sunlight does not take place in the right way, metamorphosed light is withdrawn as needed, and in a way similar to the withdrawal of fat in weight loss. Human beings in this situation face the dilemma of either allowing the upper part of the body to become ill or withdrawing what the upper part needs from the lower, that is, making the lower part of the body sick by withdrawing its metamorphosed light. As you see, the organization of the human being requires more than transformed tangible substances that come from outside. Observing the human being correctly shows us that intangible or etheric substances are also present within the human being, but in metamorphosed form. <clears throat> this points out how the foundations we are now developing make it possible to develop a correct view of the healing effect of sunlight. For example, on the one hand, an individual may be directly exposed to sunlight in order to regulate the disturbance in his or her internal interchange with environmental sunlight. On the other hand, this person may be prescribed substances to take internally that will balance out the irregularity that arises when metamorphosed light is withdrawn. The withdrawal of metamorphosed light must be immobilized by what comes from the remedies. Here you have an example of being able to see into the organization of the human being. After some time, anyone who is at all capable of looking at the world begins, strangely enough, to rage in some way against all this micros micros microscopy, all these investigations on a minute level, because microscopy actually leads not toward but away from a healthy view of life and life's disturbances. Excuse me for putting this somewhat undiplomatically. Although it would seem possible to contradict what I am saying, it is meant completely objectively, without any sympathy or antipathy. All of the processes that actually concern us in a healthy or sick human being can be studied much better on a macroscopic level than on a microscopic level. We must simply look for opportunities to investigate these processes in the macrocosm. Note that because their urinary bladders and colons are poorly developed, avian species are subject to a process that continually balances intake and excretion. Birds can eliminate while flying. They have no opportunity to retain or store the remains of their food. If they were able to do so, they would immediately develop a fatal illness. <clears throat>
By being human, physically human, we have advanced beyond the development level of birds. This is in line with the modern view of the matter, but it would be more accurate to say that we have descended below the level of birds. Birds do not need to become involved in mighty battles against their intestinal flora, because they do not have any. In contrast, this is necessary for higher animals and human beings. But with regard to one of our somewhat higher capacities, for example the transformation of the etheric factor that I have just discussed, the metamorphosis of light, we are on the same level as birds. We have a physical colon and a physical bladder, but with regard to our etheric body, we are birds as far as these organs are concerned. On the dynamic level, they are not present in the cosmos. We are dependent on immediately transforming the light we receive and eliminating the byproducts. If any disturbance occurs in this process, it does not correspond to a specific organ and therefore cannot simply be tolerated without damaging our health. Thus, when we observe a bird with its little brain, we must be clear that this is a macrocosmic image of a more subtle organization. If you choose to study human beings with regard to the more delicate organization that imprints itself on our coarser organization, which has descended below the avian level, you must make a macrocosmic study of the processes of the avian world. <clears throat> At this point, I would simply like to state parenthetically that the outlook for human life would be very dismal if our etheric organism had the same idiosyncrasy as our physical organism in comparison to the avian species, because the etheric body cannot be so shut off from the outer world. If we had etheric organs of smell, the process of storing metamorphosed light, for example, would have terrible consequences for our life with our fellow human beings. It would be similar to what we experience when we cut open a dead sheep and have to endure its innards. As things stand, however, with regard to our etheric component, we encounter each other in a way that can be compared to the not at all unpleasant smell, relatively speaking, that is, everything is relative, that is evident on cutting open even a carrion eating bird or an animal such as a horse, which is not a true ruminant but whose organization tends in that direction. Thus the important point here is to investigate the correspondences between what happens in the outer flora and fauna and what happens, but must be counteracted, in the intestinal fauna and flora within the human organism. <clears throat> and if we want to establish the connection between any therapeutic substance and a particular organ, we must move on from the general characterizations we have developed today to more specific characterizations, which will appear in the lectures to follow. Taking the need to counteract our internal intestinal fauna and flora as our starting point, let us now proceed to our circulation, where the struggle against becoming plant-like takes place and then move on to the actual sensory neural aspect of the human being. This is much more significant for our life as a whole than we generally believe. Having raised science to such a high level of abstraction, we have lost all possibility of considering the human being as a being of nerves and senses in, an, in any appropriate way. We have been uh, unable to consider the fact that this being of nerves and senses, which permits the light and the warmth associated with it to enter the human being as a whole, is intimately related to the life within us, since the intangible factors that enter along with the light must be transformed within the organs. Their role in the forming of organs is 
is as important as anything that exists in the tangible realm. We have failed to consider that this being of nerves and senses is particularly significant for our human organization as a whole. As we descend deeper into the lower part of the human being, we move from the forces that build up the intestinal flora to those that build up the intestinal fauna. But when we ascend, we move from the realm where the internal flora is counteracted into the realm where the human tendency to mineralize or become sclerotic must constantly be combated. The increased boniness of the head is enough to permit you to study how the organization of the human being tends to become increasingly mineral-like as it develops upward. This tendency to mineralize, however, is extremely significant for the entire organization of the human being. Here we encounter an issue that bears frequent repetition. I have even spoken of it in public lectures. If we divide the human being into three systems, as a being with a head, torso, and limbs, we really should not imagine that these three systems are adjacent to each other and separated by external spatial boundaries. Of course, qualitatively speaking, the, entire, the human being is entirely a head being. What constitutes the head extends over the entire human being and merely predominates in the head. It is the same with the other systems, the circulatory system and the metabolic limb system. Each of them always encompasses the entire human being. As a matter of course, what is essential for the head being is present as a potential everywhere in the human being, and this potential for mineralization must be combated throughout the body. <clears throat> this constitutes a field of study that modern individuals cannot understand at all if they consult old texts that are the products of atavistic clairvoyance. Very few people gain anything sensible from reading what Paracelsus has to say about salt processes. But the salt process belongs to the field that I have just characterized. Similarly, the sulfur process belongs to the field that I characterized earlier, that is, the process of becoming plant-like. So, we are dealing with an inherent human tendency toward mineralization. In a certain sense, just as it is possible for what underlies the activities of fauna and flora to become independent, it is also possible for the mineralizing tendency in the entire human being to become independent. And how should this mineralizing tendency be counteracted? The only way to do so is by splitting it up, by constantly driving little wedges into it, as it were. At this point, you will have to begin to make the transition from animal serum therapy and phytotherapy to mineral therapy. You will not be able to do without mineral therapy because the clue to providing the necessary support in the human battle against mineralization or sclerota sclerotization can be found only in connections between minerals and the internal human element that wants to become mineral. You will not accomplish anything, and this will have to be thoroughly discussed in another lecture, by simply introducing a mineral in its outer state into the human organism. What emerges here points to an homeopathic principle of some sort, to the need to expose the mineral-derived forces that counteract the workings of the outer mineral kingdom. <clears throat> it has been pointed out, and quite correctly, that we simply need to take a look at the mineral, mineral content of some spring waters that have therapeutic effects to see that a homeopathic process is evident in these springs. This process shows that as soon as the mineral's cohesion is released from the forces, we can grasp outwardly 
completely different forces emerge. These forces must first be released in a special way through potentization. But as I said, these topics will be discussed in a separate lecture. There is something else that I would still like to tell you today, and I ask that the younger people among you especially take it to heart. If you perform actual comparative studies of the transformation of the entire intestinal system as it evolves from fish through amphibians and reptiles, especially amphibians and reptiles, to birds on the one hand, and to mammals and ultimately humans on the other hand, you will find that remarkable transformations occur. Some examples are the appearance in lower animals of an appendix, or what develops into the appendix in humans. The beginnings of an appendix in some birds, which may be thought of as something of a deviation of the avian organization from its usual path, and the manner in which the colon evolves as we move from the fish species which have no such organ, up through the so-called more highly evolved orders to those with actual colons, and then to those with appendices. Some species have several of them. And on to the human being with a full-fledged appendix. You will find a remarkable interaction taking place in all this. A comparative study would need to heavily emphasize this interaction. You could simply inquire in a superficial way, and you know how frequently this is done, about the purpose of an organ like the human appendix, which is closed off toward the outside. This question is frequently asked, but when people ask such questions, they usually do not consider the fact that the human being manifests as a duality, and that anything taking on form down below is always parallel to an organ that appears up above. Certain organs cannot appear in the upper body unless their parallel organs or counterparts are able to develop in the lower body. The more the forebrain develops in the course of animal evolution, eventually assuming the form it has in the human being, the more the intestines develop in the direction that leads to storing the remains of food. There is an intimate connection between the formation of intestines and the formation of the brain. If the colon and the appendix had not appeared in the course of the evolution of animals, physical human beings who can think would also ultimately not have been able to appear, because humans have brains at the expense, at the very pronounced expense, of their intestinal organs. The intestinal organs are the faithful obverse of the structures in the brain. To make it possible for you to be relieved, on the one hand, of physical activity for the sake of thinking, you must burden your organism, on the other hand, with everything that gives rise to the need for a fully developed colon and bladder. This means that the highest activity of soul and spirit in the human physical world, to the extent that it is bound to the full development of the brain, is also bound to the corresponding development of the intestines. This is an extremely significant connection, a connection that sheds a great deal of light on all of natural creation. If you ask yourself why human beings have an appendix, the answer, paradoxical as it may sound, is so that they can think in a way that befits human beings. What develops in the appendix has its counterpart in the human brain. Everything on the one level corresponds to something on the other. This is knowledge that we will have to achieve again through a new type of cognition. Today, of course, we have little to gain from simply parroting the physicians of times gone by, who still had some grounding in atavistic clairvoyance. But we must indeed acquire this understanding again, and a purely materialistic study of medicine that does not look for such connections at all 
is a real obstacle to doing so. As far as today's science and medicine are concerned, the brain is an internal organ, and so are the contents of the lower body. No one notices that this error is just like saying that positive and negative electricity are the same. It is all the more important to observe these things, because just as tension develops between positive and negative electricity and seeks to balance itself out, there is also constant tension in the human being between the upper and lower parts of the body. The primary goal of all our searching in the field of medicine should be to master this tension, which is expressed in the forces concentrated in two organs, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, or hypophysis. All of the forces of the upper body are expressed in the pineal gland, and a state of tension exists between them and the forces of the pituitary or hypophysis cerebri, which are lower forces. This relationship is a true state of tension. If we were always to derive an idea of this state of tension from a person's overall state of health, it would be a very good basis for further healing. We will continue talking about this subject tomorrow. You will see that I will incorporate all of your questions, but as I said before, I must first create the basis for doing so. The end of Lecture 4 this is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 5, given in Dornach on March 25th, 1920. In the course of these lectures, as we draw ever closer to that special field where pathology is meant to pervade therapy, bridging the gap between the two, we will have to mention all sorts of topics that can serve only as therapeutic ideals and cannot necessarily be fully implemented. Nevertheless, if we have an overview of what should be considered in treating patients, the details we discover about an illness will yield something of use to us, and at least we will know how to evaluate the inevitably fragmentary conclusions. Above all, we need to examine the importance of understanding the whole person before us, even when treating the most specialized case. Also, this understanding of the human being as a whole should always include the most important events of the patient's life. Members of the medical professions sometimes confide in me and discuss some aspect of a case. After listening to a few words, I have often asked how old the patient was and been astonished to find that the medical professional was unaware of the patient's age and unable to give me any precise information. As we will see in the next few days, it is most important to inform yourself about the patient's age with some degree of accuracy because therapy is dependent on the age of the patient to a great extent. The day before yesterday, certain therapies were presented as having been extremely helpful in some cases, but not in others. In view of such statements, the very obvious question is, what is the connection between this inefficacy and the age of the patient in question? It is essential to record all the details with regard to how the age of the patient influences the working of therapeutic substances. Moving on, it is essential to observe carefully how your patient's body has developed. Is this person short and compact or tall and lanky? The answer is significant because it tells us about the forces of that person's etheric body, as we call it. I have given this a great deal of thought and have concluded that the use of such terms as etheric body and so forth, which are simply part and parcel of the reality of the human being, is unavoidable. <laughs> 
and you probably and you would probably not want me to avoid them. We could substitute ones that are more popular among non anthroposophists, and we may be able to do this at the end of our discussion, but for now, for the sake of better understanding, we will continue to use such terms when necessary. The intensity of the working of the etheric body, then, can be assessed on the basis of your patient's growth patterns. As I said, it is not always possible to take everything into account, because the information may simply be unavailable, but it is good to know about all this. Whenever possible, it is especially important to inquire about whether the person in question grew quickly or slowly during adolescence. Did he or she remain small for a long time or have a growth spurt at a relatively early age and lag behind later? All of these questions point to what we might call the behavior of the etheric body, the functional manifestations of the individual in relation to the physical body which must be taken into account when we hope to recognize a connection between the patient and particular remedies. In addition, we must also understand the relationship of the physical and etheric bodies to the higher members of the human constitution, to what we call the astral body, the soul element, and the capital I, the spiritual element. We need to learn this from our patients. And you should not hesitate to ask, for example, whether they dream a lot or only a little. Frequent dreaming is extremely significant for a patient's entire constitution because it shows that the astral body and the eye have a tendency to develop activity of their own and therefore do not want to become involved with the physical body too strongly or in too much detail. As a result, the formative forces of the human soul do not flow into that person's organ systems. Furthermore, even if you are uncomfortable in asking this question, you should also inquire whether the person is active and hard-working or tends to be sluggish. In a personality with a sluggish tendency, the inner mobility of the astral body and the eye is strong. This may sound paradoxical, but this type of mobility does not become conscious. It remains unconscious. And because it is unconscious, the person is not hard-working, even with regard to consciousness, but is sluggish overall. This is because what I call the opposite of sluggishness is the individual's organic capacity for using the higher members to intervene in the lower human being that is, for leading activity over into the physical and etheric bodies from the astral body and the eye. This capacity is very limited in a sluggish person. From the perspective of spiritual science, a sluggish person is a sleeping person. After that, you should find out whether your patient is nearsighted or farsighted. A nearsighted person is somewhat reserved with regard to how the eye and astral body relate to the physical body. Nearsightedness is one of the most important signs that you are dealing with a person whose spirit and soul are reluctant to intervene in the physical body. This next indication is extremely important in treating patients and may become practicable some day. I believe it could acquire practical significance once the individual medical professions have developed a better sense of cooperation. It is extremely important for dentists to take advantage of everything they know about the teeth, the digestive system and so on by providing each patient with some sort of checklist after each visit, noting their findings with regard to the development of the patient's teeth whether there was an early tendency to dental caries, whether the teeth remained in good condition until a later age, and the like. 
As we will see in the next few days, the condition of the teeth is extremely significant for assessing a person's overall constitution. <clears throat> Making this characteristic signature of the patient's state of health available to the attending physician in the form of a report of dental findings could provide a very significant clue. Of course, the patients in question would have to give their consent, but in an atmosphere of cooperation this should be possible. Next, it is extremely important to become aware of the patient's physical likes and dislikes. You would have to find out, for example, what foods the person in question craves. It is especially significant to determine whether the person you are treating has a craving for salt, for example, or for something else. If your patient has a particular craving for salty foods, you are dealing with a person with an overly strong connection of the eye and the astral body to the physical and etheric bodies. In this person, the spirit and soul have an overly strong affinity for the physical body. Dizzy spells brought on by outer mechanical processes such as rapid turning motions are also indicative of a strong affinity of this sort. We should ascertain whether mechanical body movements tend to make the patient dizzy. Additionally, as is fairly generally known, we should always find out about any disturbances in secretion in the patient's overall glandular functioning. When disturbances in secretion are evident, a disturbance is also always present in the ability of the eye and astral body to maintain their grip on the etheric and physical bodies. I have given you some details about what we would need to know when we meet a patient. I have highlighted details, but you will see where these subjects are pointing in so far as they relate to the constitution of the body itself. As we continue, we will also discuss the need to learn about lifestyle issues, whether or not it is possible for the patient to breathe good air, and so forth. We can consider this further when we discuss individual issues. In this way, you will first gain an insight of sorts into the type of person you have to treat. Only when you have acquired such insight will you be in a position, in any specific instance, to know how a particular remedy should be formulated. Next, I will mention in general terms an indication that has emerged from some of the lectures of the past few days, namely the inner relationship of the human being to the entire non-human outer world. Spiritual science often states, although abstractly to begin with, that in the course of evolution humankind has discharged the other kingdoms from within itself and that everything external to human beings, therefore, bears a certain relationship to their own nature and constitution. In contrast to this abstract manifestation of the connection, we will repeatedly have to point to very specific associations when it comes to the treatment of organs. Above all, however, the basis of the healing relationship between the human being and non-human external nature must first be clear to us. You know that there is a great deal of debate on this subject and that methods of healing, which we will also discuss in greater detail as we proceed, are engaged in fierce struggles with each other. One struggle in particular is well known. The struggle between physicians who favor homeopathy and those who think allopathically. It might interest you to know that how spiritual science is meant to intervene in this quarrel. <clears throat> For today, I will first speak in general terms about this topic and go into the details later. The way in which 
spiritual science should intervene in this question is actually rather strange. It becomes apparent to spiritual science that there really are no allopaths because even a substance prescribed as an allopathic medication undergoes a process of potentization within the organism and healing occurs only through this process. Thus all allopathic physicians find their procedures supported by the body's homeopathic tendency which brings about a transformation allopaths neglect, namely breaking down the cohesion of the remedy's individual particles. Admittedly, it does make a considerable difference whether or not we relieve the organism of this potentization process for the simple reason that healing processes within the organism are probably connected to the state remedies gradually achieved through potentization. Initially, however, a remedy confronts the body as a foreign entity, as matter that would otherwise belong to the outer world and has no therapeutic relationship to the body. We subject the organism to a great deal of work and disruption if we burden it with all the forces that come to expression when we administer a medication in the allopathic state. We will speak later, specifically, about cases where it is impossible to relieve the body of this potentizing function. Homeopathy is a method of healing that has been learned by listening very carefully to nature, at least to some extent, although fanaticism has also brought about significant leaps, as we shall see. The important point, however, is to discover ways of relating specific details about the human being to the non-human environment. We cannot, as I said yesterday, in a different context, simply parrot the physicians of antiquity, although it can be useful to immerse ourselves in ancient medical literature if we understand it. Instead, for example, we must use all the methods of modern science to explore this interaction between the human being and the non-human environment. First of all, we must realize that chemical investigations of substances, that is, delving into what individual substances reveal in the laboratory, will not get us very far. I have already pointed out that microscopy, and such chemical investigations are also a form of microscopy, ought to be replaced with macroscopic observation, with what is revealed by observing the cosmos itself. Today I will present significant principles that will point out correspondences between a form of threefolding in the non-human world and the threefold human being. In this connection we must look first at the dissolving process you see, solubility was the last property that was of special importance in the evolution of our planet Earth. What precipitated out as the Earth's solid portion can be traced back to a considerable extent to a cosmic dissolving process that was overcome and killed off, precipitating the solid parts. It is superficial to think only of the mechanical deposition of sediments and to base geognosy and geology entirely on that process. Geognosy, G-E-O-G-N-O-S-Y, footnote, is the study of the earth, its structure and strata, and includes geology, which includes the earth's crust. Geognosy, end of footnote. What was primarily involved in the earth forming process, in incorporating solid components into the body of the earth, consisted of special instances of crystallizing or precipitating out of solution. We can say that to the extent the dissolving process is something that happens in outer non-human nature, it is something that human beings have excluded from themselves. <clears throat> 
external dissolving processes involve activities that human beings have excluded from themselves. The important point here is to investigate the nature of the connection between these processes in the external non-human cosmos and inner processes in the human organism. I mentioned earlier that people tend to crave salt when the connection between the spirit and soul and the physical and etheric bodies is overly strong. This is of fundamental importance. These people want to reverse the process of salt precipitation in their own organism. That is, they want to cancel out this earth-forming process, essentially making salt revert to an earlier stage before its solidification in Earth's evolution. It is, import, it is especially important to look at such phenomena because they allow us to investigate the connections between the human organism and outer non-human nature to realize that there is an organic need in the nature of the human being to reverse or oppose certain activities that take place in the outer world. As you know, I mentioned yesterday that we even struggle against gravity through the development of the buoyancy that supports the human brain. In general, human beings have a tendency to oppose the forces of nature. The first question is, what is the meaning of our opposition to the earth-forming process? Essentially, it means nothing less than freeing the lower part of the human being from the spirit and soul, driving the, the soul and spirit out of the lower region of the human body, perhaps into the upper part, at least initially. All cases of salt craving show us that in some way the lower part of the human being wants to free itself of the overly strong effects of the spirit and soul within it and to allow them to flow out into the upper part of the body. Let us assume that we encounter recognizable disturbances in the lower part of the body. We will later learn about the means of recognizing them and the individual diseases they lead to. But what will we be able to do about them? At this point, I would like to interject an observation that may be important for those tending toward a certain one-sidedness in their use of therapeutic substances. Some physicians have an aversion of sorts to mineral remedies. This aversion is not justified because we will see that pure, phytotherapeutic, ther excuse me, pure phytotherapeutic substances can be effective only within very definite limits and that mineral remedies are very significant, especially in more serious cases. Please do not be offended if I take mineral remedies as my point of departure for these very basic observations. More specifically, I will talk about how the effects of these mineral remedies are incorporated into organic life. Studying the oyster may be a revelation to you with regard to certain methods of treatment that apply to the lower parts of the human body in their relationship to the upper areas. Shell formation in the oyster is an extremely interesting subject because, you see, the oyster produces its calcium carbonate shell from the inside out. If you study the oyster from a spiritual scientific perspective, and it is indeed necessary for spiritual science to assist us somewhat in this investigation, you will realize that although the oyster occupies a very low position in the evolution of animals, its standing in the cosmos as a whole is quite elevated because it secretes what human beings carry within them in the form of thinking. In a certain way, the forces that shape the oyster shell 
working from the inside out, show how the oyster extrudes a substance that would make it very intelligent if it were linked to its organic growth, a substance that would shape the oyster into a very highly evolved animal being. <laughs> Instead, this factor is channeled to the outside. You can positively see the work of calcium carbonate, calcarea carbonica, in the development of an oyster shell. This work guides excessive activity of spirit and soul out of the organism. If you find evidence of excessive activity of soul and spirit in the lower part of the body, and this does indeed appear in certain forms of illness that we will describe further, you will need to turn to the remedies we owe to oyster shells or similar substances that work from the inside out through the mysterious forces of calcium carbonate. Thus an essential component of our therapeutic repertoire will depend on our understanding of the specific healing forces present in this outward directed impulse. <clears throat> you see, everything that is linked to calcarea carbonica and related remedies can be studied rationally only by looking at it in such a context. The inherent forces of phosphorus, for example, are like the polar opposite of the forces of calcium carbonate. In their real meaning, the terms I will now use are truly no less scientific than what so frequently passes as science today. If the typical behavior of everything of a salt-like nature is to give itself up to the environment, the reason is that everything salt-like comes about because the substances in question are laid bare, freed from the workings of light and other intangibles within them. You might say that in the process of coming about, any salt-like substance repels the intangible factor as being inwardly incompatible with it. The exact opposite is the case with phosphorus. Ancient atavistic knowledge, realizing quite correctly that phosphorus contains the intangible factor, the light, within itself, was not wholly unjustified in describing phosphorus as a light-bearer. What salt wards off, phosphorus carries within itself. In this way, substances that are the polar opposites of salt are the ones that are appropriate and internalize intangibles, especially light, but also others, such as warmth. <laughs> this is the basis of the therapeutic efficacy of the inherent properties of phosphorus and of everything that is therapeutically related to it. Phosphorus, which internalizes intangibles, is especially suited to pushing the astral body and the eye back into the human body when they are reluctant to approach. <clears throat> Suppose one of your patients has an illness. Later we will mention the specific illnesses that come into question. And you discover that this patient experiences increased dreaming. This means that the astral body prefers to separate from the physical body and become involved in activity of its own. This patient, excuse me, this patient may also have an organic tendency to develop peripheral inflammations, which is another indication that the astral body and the eye are not properly embedded in the physical body. In this case, you will be able to apply the force that phosphorus uses to retain its intangibles to make the person's astral body and eye become more involved in the physical body. You will be able to use phosphorus for a great variety of illnesses, especially in people with sleep disturbances, because it tends to lead the eye and the astral body back into the physical and etheric bodies in the appropriate way. <clears throat> 
We have seen that in a certain way phosphorus-like substances and salt-like substances are polar opposites. Let me emphasize that we need to pay much more attention to the status of these substances in the entire cosmic process than to specific names that modern chemistry, for example, has applied to individual substances. As time goes on, we will see how the phosphorus, in quotes, in substances that work in ways similar to actual phosphorus, can also be used therapeutically. As you see, we have posited the existence of two opposing states in outer nature, salt activity and phosphorus activity. Mercurial activity stands between these two. As you know, the human being is a threefold being with a sensory nervous system, a circulatory system, and a metabolic system, with the circulatory system occupying a mediating position between the metabolism and sensory nervous activity. Similarly, in outer nature, the mediating factor is neither salt activity, which yields to the external world, nor the activity that internalizes intangibles strongly, but rather the factor that holds the balance between these two activities by choosing to exist in drop form. Basically, the mercurial principle always tends toward drop formation because of the inner cohesiveness of its forces. The significant aspect of the mercurial principle is not the fact that we call a certain substance, quote, mercury, close quote, but rather this cohesion of forces, which holds the balance between the dissolving tendency of salt and the inwardness and retention of intangibles in phosphorus. <clears throat> it is therefore important to study the forces that are most evident in anything of a mercurial nature. Thus you will also find that this mercurial principle is essentially connected to everything that can be counted upon to bring about a balance between the activities to which phosphorus and salt are suited. <clears throat> Especially when we talk about syphilis and similar diseases, we will see that the organic effects of the mercurial principle do not contradict what I have just said. In discussing the phosphorus mercury, and salt principles, I have presented you with types that are particularly distinctive in the mineral kingdom. It is true, however, that in speaking of salt, we had to consider the organic process that is intrinsic to and underlies the formation of oyster shell. <clears throat> in a certain sense, this process is also present when phosphorus concentrates intangibles. In the latter case, the process is internalized and is therefore less readily apparent on the outside. We, we must now move on from looking at this typical formative process in the outer world to the plant-like element that humankind discharged at some time in the past. As we already saw yesterday from other perspectives, the plant represents the opposite of the activity present within the human organism. In the plant itself, however, we can clearly distinguish three different elements. This triple distinction is especially obvious. <clears throat> if you look on the one hand at everything that develops earthward in the form of roots and then at everything that shoots upward into seeds, fruits and flowers. The contrast between the plant and the human being, although not between the plant and the animal in this case, is visible even in their external alignment. This contrast is extremely important and significant. The plant sinks into the earth with its roots and pushes upward with its flowers, that is, with its reproductive organs. With regard to our own orientation in the cosmos, we, human beings, are the exact opposite. 
In complete contrast to plants, we root upward with our heads and push downward with our reproductive organs. It really is not nonsense to picture a plant within the human being, a plant that roots upward and develops its blossom below in the direction of the reproductive organs. In this way, a particular form of the plant element is incorporated into the human being. <clears throat> Once again, this is an important characteristic for distinguishing between human beings and animals. In an animal, the plant is generally incorporated horizontally at a right angle to the plant's own direction, while the human being's orientation in the cosmos constitutes a complete 180 degree turn in comparison to the plant. This is one of the most instructive lessons we can learn by considering the relationship of the human being to the external world. If our medical students would pay more attention to these macroscopic findings, they would also discover more about the forces at work in cells, for example, than they would through microscopy. There is actually very little to be gained from microscopy because the most important forces that are at work in cells can also be observed on the macroscopic level with variations depending on whether the being in question is a plant, an animal, or a human. We can study human cells much better by investigating the interactions among the forces that work vertically upward, those that work vertically downward, and those that hold the balance horizontally. These forces, which can be observed in the macrocosm, work right down into the cellular level. And what is active in cells is essentially nothing other than a copy of this macrocosmic activity. In studying the Earth's plant kingdom, it is critical to avoid looking at it in the usual manner, that is, by walking around and looking at one plant next to the other, observing the subtle distinctions between them and inventing a name with two or three parts to establish each plant's place in taxonomy. Instead, you must consider the entire Earth as a single being, and the whole plant kingdom as belonging to the organism of the earth in the same way that the hairs on your head belong to your own organism, parenthesis, although admittedly your individual hairs are all alike, at least in some respects, while plants differ from each other, close parenthesis. <clears throat> An individual plant should no more be considered in isolation than a single hair can be considered an independent organism. That plants differ is due only to the fact that the earth, in its interaction with the rest of the cosmos, develops forces in many different directions. For this reason, plants are structured in different ways, but the life and growth of all plants are based on a single unity within the organization of the earth. This makes it especially important to be attentive to certain details. When you study fungi, for example, you will find that the earth itself is a matrix or growth medium for these fungi. When you move on to higher herbaceous plants, you will find that this is still the case, but that supra-earthly factors such as light exert a certain influence on these leafy plants in the formation of their flowers, leaves, and so on. And when you turn your attention to a tree, it is especially interesting to note that its trunk formation, which is what makes it perennial, constitutes a continuation of what the entire earth otherwise provides for plants that sit directly on the ground. You see, you must imagine that you have the earth with the plants sprouting up out of it, and in this case we can look for forces within the earth that underlay plant growth and interact with what is streaming in from the cosmos. Please, don't be too shocked by what I am going to say next, because it really is true. When a tree grows, 
It is as if the ground rises up over what used to flow directly from the earth into the tree. <clears throat> this force shoots into the trunk, and all trunks are basically outgrowths of the earth. That we do not look at it like this is simply due to the truly distorted modern materialistic view that the earth consists only of mineral matter. This view totally fails to acknowledge the impossibility of the idea of a mineral earth. In addition to precipitating minerals, the earth also contains forces that shoot upward into the plant kingdom. These are the forces that rise up to become the trunk. And what then grows out of the trunk is comparable to what grows directly out of the ground in the case of lower and herbaceous plant forms. <clears throat> I would say that the earth itself is the trunk or stem of lower and herbaceous plants, and that the plants whose flowers and seed capsules cling to a stem have created an extra stem for themselves. As you can see, it makes a difference whether I take a flower from a tree or from an herbaceous plant. From this same perspective, then, please consider the development of parasitic plants, especially mistletoe. In this case, a process that otherwise remains organically connected to the plant, namely the attachment of flowering and seed-bearing organs to the stem, is more like an outer excretion or an independent process. <clears throat> the development of mistletoe must be seen as enhancing the usual formation of flowers and seed and separating this process in a certain way from the forces of the earth. In the development of mistletoe, the plant's non-earthly aspect is emancipated, so to speak. In general, the aspect of the plant that strives upward from the earth and interacts with supra-earthly factors gradually separates from the earth as flowers and seeds form. In mistletoe, this results in an exceptionally strongly individualized emancipation. <clears throat> if you relate this phenomenon to the usual structures you perceive in plants, you will have to say that the situation is considerably different from that of a plant that tends more toward root formation devoting a greater proportion of its growth primarily to its roots, while its flowers remain small or atrophied. Such plants are more inclined toward earthly factors. In contrast, plants that emancipate themselves from these earthly factors are ones that emphasize the formation of seeds and flowers, and especially those that assume the role of parasites within the plant kingdom. Every plant has a tendency to promote one of its organs to prominence. <clears throat> Just look at how the pineapple plant emphasizes its stem, for example. Or take any other plant. You can say that each of the main plant organs, root, stem, leaf, flower, fruit, becomes the primary organ in some form of plant. Take a plant such as Equisitum, for example. All of its efforts are subsumed in stem formation. <clears throat> other plants emphasize leaf development, while still others concentrate on flower growth and allow their stems and leaves to atrophy. As it turns out, there is a certain parallel between these ac different tendencies in plant growth and the three types of mineral activity in non-human nature that I mentioned earlier today. If we look at what appears particularly strongly in the plant that tends to emancipate itself, that is, at the process that culminates in the inner workings of parasites, we find a tendency to internalize intangibles. <clears throat> if the appropriate organs predominate in the plant, the intangible factors that stream toward the earth from the cosmos are conserved in them 
just as they are in phosphoric substances. We could also say that in a certain way flowers, seeds, and everything that tends in the direction of mistletoe and the like are phosphoric. Conversely, if we study the rooting process that a plant develops, if it considers the earth its matrix, we find that it is intimately related to the formation of salts. In this way we encounter these two polar opposites in the plant kingdom and in the mediating activity in plants, which is always present between the flowering and fruiting element that pushes upward and the rooting element that holds fast down below, you have the mercurial process that brings about a ba balance. If you take into account the reversal of the plant in the human being, you will realize that any inner predisposition to flower and fruit formation must relate very strongly to organs that are either located in or governed by the lower human body, and that the same is true of phosphoric substances. In the next few days we will see that this view is absolutely correct. In contrast, any plant part that strives to become root-like will have a particular relationship to all the organs of the upper body. Of course, you must keep in mind that we cannot simply divide the human being into three parts according to an external plan. For example, the digestive system, which belongs to the lowest region, certainly attempts to continue right up into the head. <clears throat> it is erroneous to think that the gray matter of the brain is providing the material basis for thinking, because this is not the case. Gray matter is essentially there to nourish the brain. It is actually an outpost of the digestive system that serves to nourish the brain, while the brain's white matter is what is significant as the material basis of thinking. This is why you will find an aspect of the anatomical constitution of gray matter that has far more extensive connections to one of the body's overall activities than to the function ordinarily ascribed to it. So you see, when we speak of digestion, we cannot refer exclusively to the abdomen or the lower part of the body. And it is certainly true that when we look at the root-like element, we find that it relates not only to the upper part of a human being, but also to the rest of the body. <clears throat> Everything in the plant that brings about the balance between the flowering and fruiting element and the root element, that is, everything that comes to expression in the leafy parts of ordinary herbaceous plants, will prove to be especially important, even in extract form, for everything that relates to circulatory disturbances, that is, for the rhythmical balance between the upper and lower areas of the body. Earlier in this lecture, we looked at the minerals that internalize intangibles, the minerals that ward off intangibles, and the intermediate types. <clears throat> As you can see now, we find parallels in the overall configuration of the plant. Here you have the very first rational means of establishing an interaction between the human organism and the plant itself, based on the emphasis the plant places on developing one or the other of its organs. Later on we will consider specialized manifestations of this interaction. Up to this point we have been able to point out that such interrelationships exist between plants or minerals and the human being. Recently something very promising has been added to the picture with regard to the interrelationship that is supposed to exist between humans and animals. However, even disregarding the fact that the development of animal sero sero serothopy took place under rather strained circumstances, principled objections must be raised to the usual form of this therapy. You see, Bering 
actually proceeded in a very strange way while developing serotherapy. That's sorry, that as is S E R O T H E R A P Y. I'm going to read it as serotherapy. Footnote Emil Adolf von Bering, eighteen fifty four to nineteen seventeen, a German bacteriologist at the Koch Institute of Hygiene and at the Institute for Infectious Diseases in Berlin, professor at the University of Halle, and later director of the Institute of Hygiene in Marburg. See the extensive note at the end of this lecture. End of footnote. <clears throat> if you follow the speeches that were given, and the publications that appeared more peripherally, which discussed only what the serum was meant to help, you are given the impression that serotherapy has the potential to reform the entire medical system. However, if you carefully examine the basic studies, an astonishing fact is revealed, and this is not an exaggeration as one or another of you will probably recognize. The researchers were attempting to develop a treatment by studying guinea pigs so that they could then apply it to human beings. It yielded a, quote, strangely high, close quote, percentage of unfavorable results in guinea pigs. In fact, out of the large number of guinea pigs treated with the serum, the result was favorable in only one case. In one single guinea pig, the, thus masking its healing process, at the very moment when people were beginning to drum up support for serotherapy in a big way. I would simply like to present this as a fact, of which, I believe, some of you are already aware. The extraordinary sloppiness evidenced in this incident deserves to be considered more carefully in the context of the history of science. But there is a principle that I want to introduce to conclude today's lecture, and that I will elaborate upon tomorrow, or at some time during the next few days. Today you have seen that the natural outer processes that directly affect the human being are not those that exist on the immediate surface. Instead, they must be brought up from the depths. In a certain sense, processes that human beings have eliminated from within themselves, the, process, the processes of phosphorus and salt, and the plants flowering, fruiting, rooting, and leaf forming, are closely related to the human being, but in such a way that the human being lives in their inverse and has a, an innate tendency to negate anything expressed in non-human nature, turning it into its opposite. The same is not true of animals. They have already gone halfway through this process, so human beings are not the opposite of animals in the same sense. Humans stand at a right angle to animals, as it were, but are removed 180 degrees from plants. This must certainly be considered when raising the issue of using animal remedies, such as serums or the like. Uh, that's the end of the lecture, but there is a note on the critiques of Emil Adolf von Bering that I will include. Quote, On the development of diphtheria immunity and tetanus immunity in animals, from the German Medical Weekly, number 4, December 4, 1890, an article on Bering in Kitasato begins with the words, quote, In our long-term studies of diphtheria, Bering, and tetanus, Kitasato, we have also drawn closer to the issues of therapy and immunization, and in infectious disease we have been able to both cure infected animals and pre-treat healthy ones in such a way that they no longer contracted diphtheria or tetanus after treatment. <clears throat> There's a footnote here, Chiba Saburo Kitasato, 1852-1931, Japanese bacteriologist who studied under Robert Koch, 1843 to 1910 in Berlin. He isolated the bacilli of tetanus, symptomatic anthrax, and dysentery, and prepared a diphtheria antitoxin. He also discovered the etiological agent of bubonic plague. End of footnote. Quote, the way in which immunization and cure are effected will be discussed here only to the extent 
that this is needed in order to prove the following statement correct. Details will follow in the magazine titled Hygiene. Close quote. The remainder of this article speaks only of experiments with tetanus. In the same weekly, number 50, Bering describes attempts to bring about immunity to diphtheria. He says of the treatment, quote, I must emphasize that I have no remedy for diphtheria in human beings. I am merely looking for one, Close quote. This must be contrasted with the sentence from the first article quoted previously. At the end of the second article, he tells us that serum injections have been successful in treating animals with tetanus. <clears throat> the essay concludes, quote, The possibility of curing even illnesses that take an acute form can thus no longer be questioned. Close quote. The promised article in Hygiene finally appeared in 1892. No prior article has been discovered. It documents two series of experiments involving a total of 60 animals, 59 of whom were either immunized or given the serum at the same time as, or days before, being infected with diphtheria. The procedure used on humans, parenthesis infection on day one, one day of illness on day two, serum injection on day three, close parenthesis, was copied in the case of only one animal, which was cured. In the other, quote, cured, close quote, animals, Either the illness had not yet developed, parenthesis series 2 experiments, December 1891 to January 1892, close parenthesis, or, in most cases where the serum was injected before infection, death resulted, parenthesis series 1 experiments, September through December 1891, close parenthesis. From a volume of critical essays on the question of diphtheria serum, parenthesis Quote, Physicians speak out about and against Bering and his therapeutic serum, Dr. Karl Gerster, editor, A. Zimmer's Verlag, 1895. Close parenthesis. It appears that such publicity was not well received in medical circles at that time. <clears throat> the final uh, end of Lecture 5 of this uh, cycle. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 6, given in Dornach on March 26th, 1920. I have some concern about what I am going to present today. If I had three months to explain these ideas, you would find it difficult to take them as mere fantasies. The material that follows involves specialized aspects of healing. But during this hour today, I can present these ideas only briefly in an attempt to make them fully comprehensible to you. Consequently, many statements will seem purely arbitrary. Nevertheless, through my manner of presenting them, I will attempt to demonstrate that all of these thoughts are at least as well-founded as those assumptions upon which modern science is built. I would like to begin today by showing you the process of plant development as such in its cosmic context. I have already drawn your attention to the fact that the inverse of this process is active in the human being on the functional level. This process of plant development needs to be described, at least sketchily, if we are to discover the plant world's direct connection to the human being. If you look at plants, you will find that their overall developmental process incorporates two distinctly opposite tendencies. One works toward the earth. I pointed out yesterday that the earth is mounded up, as it were, in the trunks or stems of woody plants so that a tree's flowers and leaves are rooted in the trunk in the same way that merely herbaceous plants are, or still lower plants, are rooted in the ground. This points to the plant's earth-directed tendency on the one hand, but on the other hand the plant strives upward, away from the earth. It does so not only through a mechanical force that counteracts earth's gravity, but also in all of its developmental processes, even the internal ones. The processes taking place in the flower, 
become differentiated from those taking place in the root. Flower processes become much more dependent than root processes on forces from outside the earth. The dependence of flower formation on forces that do not truly belong to the earth is the first thing we must look at. Because of the reversal of the plant process in a human being on the functional level, a reversal I pointed to in earlier lectures, we will find that the forces used by the plant to initiate flower and seed formation are also present in the human abdomen, in elimination, secretion, and the organic basis of sexuality. Therefore, when we find this connection between the human being and the plant, even the details point to both extratelluric and earthly processes in the plant. I must not omit to make you aware of the fact that what I am presenting here has not been taken from ancient medical works, but is based on present-day spiritual scientific research. Some of my terminology, however, harkens back to this ancient literature, because modern medical literature has not yet developed a terminology of its own in this field. But you would be very mistaken if you were to believe that anything presented here is derived exclusively from ancient writings. If you follow the process of plant growth as it moves upward, away from the earthly element, the first thing to become aware of is the spiral path of development of both leaves and flowers. The plant's formative forces trace a spiral of sorts around the stem. This spiral path cannot be deduced from inner forces of tension within the plant, but must be attributed to extra telluric influences and especially to the effects of the apparent path of the sun. I say, quote, apparent, close quote, advisedly, because the earth's motion in relationship to the sun must be considered only relative, hence I say the apparent path of the sun. In certain respects, the clues to the movement of the stars that are found in the path of a plant's developmental processes are much better than Galileo's mathematical clues, because the plant is a faithful replica of what the stars are doing. We would go completely astray, however, if we believed that the only developmental path that is active in the plant is the sun-dependent one that moves upward from the earth. In fact, the workings of the stars are combined with the movements of our planetary system that are brought about by the sun. The sun force would take possession of plants completely and make them continue into infinity if it in turn were not counteracted by the forces of the so-called outer planets and their spirals. In actuality, the planets move in spirals rather than in ellipses. By now, the entire Copernican view of the universe should be re-examined and replaced with another one. We must count Mars, Jupiter and Saturn as belonging to the so-called outer planets. Uranus and Neptune belong to our solar system only from a purely astronomical point of view. They actually entered the solar system as foreign bodies and were received as, quote, guests, close quote, so we are right to disregard them. In any case, the forces of the outer planets cause the upward directed force to retreat. They bring about the development of flowers and fruit by restraining what would otherwise be expressed only in the spiral of the leaves. <laughs> if you study plant growth above the leaves, you must attribute its origin to the forces that come about as the result of the Sun working together with Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. Not only do these two elements work together, however, but they are also counteracted by what comes from the Moon. <clears throat> 
in particular and also from the so-called inner planets Mercury and Venus. Mercury, Venus and the Moon engender the downward, earth-directed tendency in the plant. Their most characteristic expression lies in the development of roots. Everything that appears earthly is actually simultaneously influenced by the moon and the inner planets. You might say that the plant is an expression of our entire solar system. Until we know how this solar system manifests in plants, on the one hand, and in human beings on the other, we cannot truly grasp the connection between the plant world and the human organism. All you need to do is look at the fact that when you burn plants that tend to be rooty, that is, plants that are less involved in the process of flower and seed formation than those that tend toward flower formation, or the roots of any plant, the ash has many more constituents than it does when you burn flowers, mistletoe, or woody plants. This difference is simply due to the fact that the forces of the inner planets, the forces of Moon, Mercury, and Venus, have more effect on plants that tend strongly toward root formation. In their ashes you will find iron, manganese, silica, in short constituents that are direct remedies and function as such whenever anything derived from these plants is administered. <clears throat> in contrast, you find fewer constituents in the ash that results from burning the opposite type of plants. What is thus expressed in the combustion process is first and foremost a real outer documentation of the fact that the plant belongs not only to what can be found on earth but also to the entire cosmos. Look at the process of plant growth more thoroughly. If we are dealing with annual plants, the process breaks off at a certain season and draws to a close in seed formation. Thus we must attribute seed formation primarily to supra-earthly factors. The process is broken off, handed over to the earthly element. Something that achieved a certain higher level in the old year must continue at a lower level in the new year. You can see a peculiar process in the totality of plant growth. Imagine that this is the earth's surface, and here you have the entire plant growing out of the earth toward the supra-earthly influences. What is shaped by these influences is returning to the earth. Excuse me. What is shaped by these influences is returned to the earth, and the cycle begins again. If you consider plant growth as a totality, each year the heavenly forces sink down into the earth to unite with the earth's forces and repeat the cycle. Each year the heavenly forces submerge the flowering, fruiting element into the root element to bring about the cycles to which all plant growth is subject. This picture points out that when we consider the earth's flora, we are actually concerned with the interaction between the earth as a whole and factors beyond earth. This interaction extends not only to plant structure, but also to a plant's internal chemical activity and its entire system of organs. Just as earthly mechanics are overcome in the human form, extratelluric factors also overcome the earthly chemical activity in the plant. But once it has been overcome to a certain extent, it must be reincorporated into the earthly element to produce earthly chemical activity. At this point you are not far from the realization that earthly chemical activity is outwardly evident in ash and everything ash stands for. That is, earthly chemical activity can be expressed by what falls out of the realm of the living. Non-living substances, however, are subject to gravity, while the upward growth of the plant constantly overcomes gravity and other earthbound forces, so that we can speak of gravity and light as polar opposites. Light is what constantly overcomes gravity.
and in a certain way the plant is enmeshed in this struggle between heaviness and light, between what longs to become ash and what longs to become fire. Here we are pointed toward the polar opposites of ash formation and what manifests in fire, to the contrast between the tangible and the intangible. Here we have the plant world in its cosmic context. You will also find, according to our discussions of previous days, that it is impossible to understand the human being without imagining human orientation as polar. I described how in a plant what grows from below upward grows in the human being from above downward, and as a result in the human being the flowering and fruiting process works downward in sexual and excretory processes, while the rooting process works upward. The difference is that this is a process of function in the human being and a process of matter in the plant. From this you can see that we discover something in the human being that is the opposite of what we find in the plant. In the human being, however, we encounter not only the opposite process, but also the bearer of that process. At the human being's functional level, you have an element that roots upward and the growing plant-like element that moves downward. On the other hand, these elements are surrounded by the material aspect, which also tends to move upward from below. In this way, a process that would have to be artificially induced in the plant uh, removing something from the upper sphere and submerging it in the lower takes place continuously in the human being. The processes whose tendency is to work from above downward and those that work from below upward are always working together. Human illness or health is determined by this interplay. You see, we do not understand complicated human processes at all if we fail to consider what I have just described. That on the one hand a carrier is present that works upward from the earth, while on the other hand a force inserts itself into this carrier and works downward from above. How human illness and well-being are determined by this interplay of forces can easily be seen when in some desperation we confront a very important fact, namely that the human organism requires quite different therapy depending on whether its upper parts or the parts below the heart come into consideration. The human being must be seen according to different principles in these two instances. This fact is expressed in phenomena such as the often mystifying relationship between craniotabes and ordinary rickets. The word, there's a footnote here, craniotopies, it's spelled C-R-A-N-I-O-T-A-B, as in boy, E-S, refers to a progressive decrease in calcification or emaciation of the skull. I'm going to pronounce that, I'm afraid, craniotopies and ordinary rickets. End of footnote. Those who view the human being as a unity consider these two conditions to be very closely related, though it must be understood that they are governed by different principles, since they originate in opposite parts of the human being. In a significant way this difference extends even to the healing process. Physicians who report some success in treating rickets with phosphorus will probably not have the slightest success if they apply this treatment to craniotobies, which would need the opposite type of treatment, possibly with some sort of calcium carbonate or the like. I would like to say, however, that this example is only an expression of, of a very general state of affairs that is somewhat uncomfortable to mention, but is nonetheless very true, <laughs> namely that Whenever we are dealing with medical treatment of human beings, if any statement can be made, its exact opposite can also be the right solution in certain cases. This, you see, is the fatal aspect of the question. <laughs>
it is completely possible for someone to cite a totally correct course of treatment for one or the other illness. Yet it may be no treatment at all for symptoms that appear to be exactly the same, for which the exact opposite course would have to be implemented. As a result, one theory of healing in medicine can always be forced to give way to another if we are not aware that one method of therapy treats only one part of the human being and that another part will require a different therapeutic method. This is what we have to realize. It is important to take a good look at what we encounter as existing separately in the plant and as one aspect of the human organization. Yesterday I drew your attention to the three formative impulses inherent in the outer non-human natural world, the salt-like and mercurial formative impulses and the impulse consisting of certain substances such as phosphorus or sulfur inasmuch as they are carriers of intangibles and store up the forces of these intangible factors within themselves. With regard to what I said yesterday, what are the differences among these three formative impulses intrinsic to the non-human natural world? All processes that are salt-like, or to put it better, lead to the formation of salts, guide inner processes into the domain of gravity. Those who read ancient medical texts would do well to consider the following discussion whenever there is talk of substances becoming salt-like. Through this process, the force of the substance in question becomes subject to gravity, whereas through the opposite process, the light process, intangibles are withdrawn from the force of gravity. If we think of light as representing all other intangibles, we must also imagine the all-pervasive struggle between light and gravity in the non-human natural world, the struggle between a force that aspires to become supra-earthly and one that makes earthly substances tend to draw toward the center. What we first see here is the contrast between gravity and light and the constant alternating search for balance between them. This is expressed by the mercurial principle, which consists of nothing other than the constant search for balance between light and gravity. The point is to incorporate the differences that exist among the salt-like, phosphoric and mercurial principles into the context of the entire cosmos into gravity, into light, and into the contrast between them, the search for balance. You see, in a strange way, the entire activity of the human heart finds its place within this contrast. The most disastrous thing about our modern scientific view, aside from the pump theory it applies to the heart, which is totally untenable, as I have already explained, is that it thinks every activity has to run its course entirely within the confines of the skin of the being in question. Today we imagine the heart's connections as being more or less limited to what is pulsing through the body, but this is not the case. Through having organs, the human being is incorporated into the entire cosmic process, and the human heart not only is an organ within the human organism, but also belongs to this cosmic process. What is played out in the plant, in the interaction of influences coming from the inner or outer planets, is also played out within the human being, coming to expression in the movements of the heart. The heart's movements are not only an expression of what is going on within, but also an imprint of circumstances external to the human being. If you consider the human heart, the entire cosmic process is essentially reflected in it. Human beings are individualized 
only in that they are beings of soul and spirit. On the other levels, they are incorporated into the entire cosmic process by virtue of the fact, to use one example, that the beating human heart is an expression not of something happening within the individual, but of the struggle between light and gravity that is played out in the entire cosmos. I have often attempted to describe human integration with the cosmos to lay audiences in a crudely illustrative way by making use of the following calculation. If you assume that a human being takes approximately 18 breaths a minute, you will find that the number of breaths in a 24-hour day comes to 25,920. If you take a single day in the life of a human being, consider that there are 365 days in a year, and assume that the maximum human lifespan averages 71 years, although people can live to be much older, you come up with almost exactly the same number of days in a human lifetime as there are breaths in a 24-hour day, 29,915. And if you look at the sun's course through the entire zodiac, that is a platonic year, the length of time that the sun's rising point at the vernal equinox takes to move once around the zodiac, it also takes 25,920 years. This number is a remarkable example of how the human being is connected to the entire cosmos, because the platonic year of the sun's course through the zodiac turns out to have as many years as there are days in a human lifetime. This circumstance can be illustrated quite concretely, but it leads us into extraordinary depths in the existence of the cosmos. You simply need to keep in mind something else that we have to emphasize in anthroposophy, that the eye and the astral body withdraw from the physical and etheric bodies when a human being sleeps and move back in when the person wakes up. Simply imagine this as a sort of exhalation and inhalation of the soul and spirit of the physical body, and you have 25,915 or 25,920 leap years account for the discrepancy of the type of breaths that are completed during a human lifetime, which must constitute a day on some other level. And in turn, there must be something in the cosmos that relates an apparent revolution of the sun to this same number. <clears throat> Here you have a rhythm in the cosmos that is expressed first on the grand scale, then in an individual human lifetime, and then in the respiratory processes of a single day. It will no longer seem astonishing to you that the prehistoric world of atavistic clairvoyance spoke of the days and nights of Brahma, of the inhalation and exhalation of the cosmos, because people back then had discovered that this cosmic inhalation and exhalation has a microscopic, excuse me, a microcosmic image in the daily process of human life. It is through such very concretely based observations and not through sympathies or antipathies of any sort, that we actually achieve a real reverence for ancient wisdom. I can assure you that I myself would be no admirer of ancient wisdom if I had not convinced myself in countless instances that we are now rediscovering ancient truths that had totally disappeared in the interim. Anyone who truly strives for insight does not learn to revere ancient wisdom because of some general attraction to it. This reverence develops directly out of an understanding of very concrete relationships. If we want to find the light-like element, we must look at everything that lies beyond the sun in our solar system, at Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. And since everything that happens on the Earth is in some sense a result of forces that exist outside the earth, we must look for the effects of cosmic events in the earthly element. <clears throat>
Consequently, we do not look for reasons for the configuration or the solid state of earthly substances in as abstract and fantastical a way as modern molecular physics or molecular and atomic chemistry do. Atomic chemistry looks into subjects we cannot really look into, namely the innermost constitu constitution of solid bodies. It comes up with all kinds of fine notions about atoms and molecules, and then talks about its, quote, astronomical understanding, close quote, of what is going on inside a solid structure. Parenthesis. This may not be so much the case today, but it is how scientists were talking very proudly a few decades ago. Close parenthesis. Today, these inner workings are being photographed, as I said in my public lecture the day before yesterday. Footnote. Anthroposophy in the Modern Sciences, a lecture given on March 24, 1920, published in Volume 5 of Geistes Wissenschaft und die Lebensforderungen der Gegenwart, Spiritual Science and the Demands of Modern Life, Dornach, 1950. End of footnote. In spiritualist circles, however, photographs of spirits are also being taken. And, since today scientists are not inclined to believe in spirit photography, they should allow others who understand these matters to refuse to believe in their photographs of atoms, which are subject to the same factors as spirit photography. <clears throat> the forces we are concerned with in plants are not the same as the forces that are bound to atoms and molecules. The forces in plants work into earthly substance from outside the earth. In an earthly substance, it is not these demonic little atoms and molecules that cause its configuration, but rather the cosmic forces that are working in a particular way. Let us say that a constellation outside the earth consists of Saturn being in a position to work on a certain location on earth in an especially beneficial way, and that its effect is most advantageous when other lines of influence, the effects of the Sun, Mars, and so forth, are as far away from its own as possible, and do not lie in or near its path. In this instance, Saturn is working alone in a certain respect. If, for other reasons, our Earth is then especially receptive or favor favorably disposed to these Saturn forces at the location in question, the Saturn forces, which in this case are influenced very little by other extra telluric forces, bring about a particular structure in earthly matter that is different from what is produced when Mars, for example, works under the same conditions. Earthly substances are nothing other than the products of the interaction of stellar forces. <laughs> In the example I have chosen here, where Saturn works on certain parts of the Earth for longer periods of time, and under favorable circumstances, its effects become visible in the product. We are dealing here with the coming about of lead. This is the reason why certain earthly substances, especially metals, must be linked to certain constellations in the extra telluric cosmos. Here again, there is an inevitable parallelism between what modern spiritual scientific research has to offer and what was formerly offered by ancient wisdom, which can be understood today only if it is discovered anew. These ancient writings are almost unreadable for modern individuals who think in terms of chemistry or physics. This can be illustrated by an example recorded by a very intelligent Scandinavian scholar in his history of alchemy. He described a process that, as he very correctly stated, is nonsense according to modern chemical concepts, because it does not lead to any discovery. Footnote Theodor Svedberg 1884 to 1971, Swedish chemist who received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1926. Presumably this comment refers to his book Matter, 1912, which appeared in German translation in 1914. End of footnote. 
The process in question was a lead process, but this worthy gentleman failed to realize that the explanation applied to the process of seed formation. Footnote, the word lead is missing in the German typescript of this lecture and was inserted because of its correspondence to the process of seed formation. End of footnote. Instead, he believed that it applied to a process taking place in the laboratory, and on that level it is indeed nonsense. Because the terminology needs to be transferred to an entirely different level, we must think of meanings other than the usual when we read certain expressions. Because he did not realize this, for him it was nonsense, and he was both right and wrong. We cannot avoid bringing earthly substances into connection with the forces that work on the earth from its surroundings especially the study of metals, if carried out in ways that I will describe in these lectures, brings us to very specific connections, such that we must attribute lead, first and foremost, to the undisturbed effects of Saturn, tin to the undisturbed effects of Jupiter, iron to Mars, copper to Venus, and what chemistry now calls Mercury to the planet of the same name. This is why the ancients gave the name Mercury to both the planet and the metal. We must also recognize the relationship of everything that is like silver in character, I very deliberately said like silver, to the undisturbed effects of the moon. It is really amusing to read in modern scientific literature that silver's relationship to the moon was suggested by the moon's silvery sheen, and that people thought only in terms of this outer characteristic. Anyone who knows how carefully the ancient studies of individual metals were conducted in their own way will not succumb to this sort of error. You will see that there is also ample opportunity for other substances to develop, because the ones that I listed, lead, tin, iron, copper, mercury and silver, are only the most outstanding examples. The fact that other planetary influences competed with those just mentioned, for example the lines of influence of Mars and Saturn could have intersected, made it possible for other substances to arise. This is how the less representative metals came about. In any case, we must see the Earth's metals as resulting from the influence of extra telluric forces. At this point, however, what is expressed in the workings of metals merges with what we see in plant development, because if you take the active principles in lead, tin, or iron, these same principles must also be inherent in all aspects of the development of flowers and seeds, insofar as these processes take place outside the earthly element and above the surface of the earth. Similarly, all aspects of plant root formation must be connected to everything that is coppery, mercurial, or silvery in character. While the mercurial principle exists as a certain balance on the one hand, on the other you will, naturally, have to look for a different balance. Mercury is the balance between earthly and supra-earthly factors. In reality, however, our entire universe is pervaded with spirit, and here another polarity sets in. If you imagine the earthly element here and there the supra-earthly element, you have the contrast between light and gravity in the earthly and supra-earthly factors. But this gives you only the possibility of looking at a balance between these two factors. There is also another state of balance between the all-pervading element that does not distinguish between earthly and extra-telluric and the elements it pervades, that is, between spirit and matter, regardless of whether matter is construed as tangible or intangible. At every point in the material element, even in the cosmos, 
the balance must be maintained between matter and the spirit. The nearest cosmic body that maintains this balance is the sun itself. The sun holds the balance between the spiritual and the material in the cosmos. For this reason the sun, you might say, is a cosmic body that both maintains order in the solar system and brings order into the forces pervading our material system. Just as we can establish the connection of individual planets to the metals, as I described earlier, we can also establish that there is a connection between the sun and gold. In this instance, too, the ancients valued gold for its connection to the balance between spirit and matter rather than for its aramonic value. It is important to always keep in mind that in the natural world, things that we separate both in our thoughts and in anything we accomplish on earth are always united in some way. In our thoughts, we separate what is subject to gravity and therefore tends toward salt formation, both from the bearers of light, which tend toward the effects of light, and from what forms the basis of the balance between the two. There is no such separation, however, in the natural world. In nature, these ways of working are united with one another and interpenetrate, forming very intricate structural systems. These intricate edifices are present in the gleam of gold, because through gold, in a certain way, the spiritual element in its pure form looks into the outer world. This makes us aware of something I would like to note parenthetically, because you may be able to work very fruitfully toward putting the impulses that can still be gained from ancient medical literature to good use in modern literature. If you write dissertations, such as those I mentioned yesterday, ancient literature will offer many a stimulus if you understand it correctly. It is extremely important to note that this ancient literature sees three principles, the salt-like, mercurial and phosphoric or sulfur-like principles, coming together in some sort of connection in every substance. We must also note that the ancients were very concerned with separating these three principles out of any substance. They held the view that lead comes about, as we have indicated here, but that lead just like gold or copper, contains all three principles, the salt-like, the mercurial, and the phosphoric. The important point here is that we can use these principles to treat the human being if we extricate them from their combinations in some way. In ancient chemistry, the greatest care was devoted to this process, which was found to be most difficult in the case of gold. This is the reason for the Latin saying, Facilius est aurum facera quam destuera. Sorry. <laughs> parenthesis, it is easier to make gold than to destroy it. Close parenthesis. This is really one of the examples that makes us revere ancient knowledge, because people thought that the three essential principles of nature, the salt like, the mercurial, and the phosphoric, were so strongly connected to each other in gold that it would be more difficult to extract them from that substance than from any other. It is absolutely true that if we ourselves were to proceed today exactly as the ancients did in the process of extricating these three principles of nature, it would not be easy for us to accomplish it. But if we totally disregard ancient knowledge, as should happen in these lectures, after all, we are shedding only occasional light on the, ancient on the ancient literature and investigate what can still be researched today. We discover that in order to extract these three necessary principles from natural substances, the substances in question must undergo a certain process of combustion. Through this combustion process, for example, the fire-bearing, light-bearing principle is driven off first. For certain purposes, we would then have to continue 
extracting the mercurial principle from these natural substances, so that in the end everything remaining tends in the direction of the salty principle and can be extracted with an, with an acidic substance, yielding a truly salt-like remedy, whether from plants or from minerals. I will go into more detail later. Thus we must either look for a light-bearing substance in nature from which to derive the extra telluric element, attempt to extract this extra telluric element from earthly substances, leaving behind the truly salt-like components, if those are what we need, or try to extract a substance that represents the balance between these two poles. At this point, we can take either one of two routes, which are different in character even though both lead to the same goal, at least to a certain extent. It is also possible to take both routes. We can take the perspective of ancient physicians who were always intent on extracting what they viewed as phosphorus, salt, or mercury from familiar substances and then making use of it. For them, the distinct and specific effects of remedies resulted from differences between them that were due to their having been derived from lead or from copper. That is, they took the origin of the substance into account. As far as they were concerned, when they produced a salt from lead, it was different in character from a salt produced from copper. Even when they said salt, they meant that the particular salt was one of a variety of salts. Simply by being a salt it was earthly, but by being a salt derived from one of a variety of metals it was extra telluric and had a connection to the varied aspects of the human being that we will be able to characterize first thing tomorrow. This is one of the routes that medicine can take in producing salt-like remedies. We can also take the route that was chosen after the ancient route was obscured, but at a time when people still had the distinct feeling that the human being was more than just a test tube. In this case, we simply attempt to take what is present and to make the underlying forces in existing substances useful through potentization. This is the method inherent in Hanuman's school of thought in particular. It represents a new ascent away from the entire school of medical thinking that developed after the old ways had been obscured, when people no longer knew anything about any supra-earthly connections or the like. This is the reason for the desperation of the modern medical profession, that modern medicine no longer looks at the extra-telluric element that underlies the earthly, and always attempts to make do with exclusively earthly substances and forces. <clears throat> the homeopathic system attempts to transcend this limitation, as do physical or naturopathic methods of therapy, which resort to direct applications of mercury, light, or air, because they no longer have access to insight into the right way of using phosphorus, the light-bearer, or the carriers of air. Of course, this constitutes a third route. But a true and favorable route will open up again only when spiritual science allows us to penetrate once more the connection between the mineral element and the supra-earthly, between the plant kingdom and the supra-earthly, and between the animal kingdom and the supra-earthly. By the time we get to the animal kingdom, as I pointed out yesterday, we are already questionably close to the human being. The ancients drew the line here at a boundary that we must seek to re-establish on the basis of more recent research. They said that plants lie within the realm of the solar system, as do minerals, but that when we get to the animal world we leave the solar system and are much less free to experiment with the things we find there in ways that are permissible as long as we remained within the planetary realm of extra-telluric activity. The forces leading to the development of animals 
and especially of humans, are much farther away and much more spread out in the cosmos than the forces in minerals and plants. The ancients drew the zodiac as a boundary so that people would not look for therapeutic forces beyond what was present in plants or minerals, or would at least be aware that they were entering a questionable zone. Today, however, this zone has been entered along a route that I began to characterize yesterday. We will discuss this in more detail when we come to specialized aspects of pathology and serotherapy. Such routes usually lead to detailed measures, and as a consequence they call forth very strong illusions that completely mask the dangers lurking behind them. The end of Lecture 6 this is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 7, given in Dornach on March 27, 1920. Yesterday I drew your attention to several considerations that we must take as our basis for understanding how human beings adapt to earthly and cosmic circumstances. These aspects, which were more spatial in character, must be combined with temporal aspects, because we must never forget that the human being must be seen as a totality. As a whole, each human being is in some respects a child, an adult, and an elderly person, and is organized in such a way that these three essential developmental stages are actually present simultaneously. What we accomplish along these lines today will then have to be brought together with the supersensible aspect. Only then will we be able to move on to more detailed considerations. Above all, I would like to make you aware that just as pedagogy is forced to pay attention to the difference between the various stages of childhood, from birth to the second dentition, from the second dentition to puberty, and so on, any aspect of medicine must also consider the entire human being from birth to death. As I said earlier, I will use our customary anthroposophical expressions to begin with. Toward the end I will explore possible ways of translating these expressions for outsiders. This translation process will be easier once we have progressed a little further in our studies. First and foremost, we will need to realize in looking at childhood, for example, that the inherent functions of the eye, capital, and the astral body, as we call these things, are in the process of just being integrated into the human being at this age. During childhood, these functions are first integrated into the organic aspect in such a way as to then be able to work with the child's flexible and elastic organic substance. At this particular stage, and especially during the ages from 7 to about 14, 15 or 16, which is the time when the etheric body must have consolidated its position in relationship to the physical body so that puberty can begin, it is not surprising to note the appearance of disturbances having to do with integrating the higher aspect of the human being into the lower. In many cases, <clears throat> it is possible that the elasticity of the physical body and that of the etheric body do not coincide. It is essentially the task of the astral body to bring about a balance between these physical and etheric elasticities. If they do not work together, the astral body is often obliged to strengthen its forces, and if these forces remain inadequate, the disease symptoms that then appear will require outside intervention. This is why it is common to find disease symptoms in childhood that are discharged on the physical level 
as in Sydenham's Korea, for example. Excuse me, for instance. Footnote, Sid- Sydenham, Sydenham's Korea typically occurs in children and adolescents, also called St. Vitus's dance, along with Sydenham's contracted by infection. The best known form of chorea is Huntington's, an hereditary disease, which generally occurs in adults. End of footnote. All illnesses leading to such syndromes in which nervous or psychological disturbances occur, in addition to what is happening on the organic level, are related to the somewhat unaccustomed work the astral body is being called upon to perform to balance the elasticity of the physical and etheric bodies. If chorea-like symptoms appear during pregnancy, the cause will be only too obvious. Pregnancy, of course, disrupts the harmony between the elasticity of the physical and etheric bodies. So, once again, you must expect the astral body to behave as it does in childhood. Therefore, in such illnesses, which occur in children and sometimes also as concomitant symptoms during pregnancy, we will have to seek remedies that increase the astral body's overall effectiveness so that that its functions fall into line with its task of balancing the elasticity of the physical and etheric bodies. These are questions that will be discussed in the next few days. In contrast, and this is why I emphasized the importance of taking the patient's ages into account, you will find that diseases tending toward polyarthritis or other related symptoms appear most frequently from the mid-teens to late twenties. During this time, the astral body itself must establish the right relationship to the physical and etheric bodies. If it is insufficiently prepared, for example, if the right things have not been done in childhood to prepare it, it will be unable to bring about the right relationship. As a consequence, disease symptoms will appear either at this age or in the next stage of life. This is the important point to include the time factor in our study of illnesses. If I may be permitted to express myself somewhat one-sidedly, we must not assume that nature has arranged the human organism in a way that makes it as easy and comfortable as possible for us to simply read off the cure. We tend to mistakenly assume that it should be as easy as possible to discover how to cure a patient. In a certain respect, the law of similars, the principle of, quote, like cures like, close quote, is correct. It may happen, however, that the primary syndrome occurs in one stage of life, but the remedy can induce similar symptoms only during a different stage. For example, certain medications may provoke a disease process, a specific complex of symptoms in a person who has not yet reached the age of twenty. But those same medications may become true remedies in a later stage of the person's life. This is what must be considered when we hear the frequently emphasized statement, quote, like cures like, close quote. If we want to look at the overall state of health of an individual, whether healthy or sick, it is essential to know that, in a certain sense, the human being lives through two polar opposite stages of life and is exposed to different influences in youth, specifically the influences of Saturn, Jupiter and Mars, the planets beyond the Sun. Then, at a later age, when the individual is more influenced by the inner planets, Venus, Mercury and Moon if I need to name them in accordance with what we said yesterday. The moon influence, however, appears earliest and most obviously. This example points out once again that we must always combine the spatial factor with the temporal 
in studying the human being. Only if we do so will we be able to see in the right light certain phenomena that appear during a person's lifetime. Later, when we focus on details, we will also constantly touch on how we must proceed in order to see these relationships that are so necessary for understanding the human being in the right light. You see, what works on the human being commences before birth and even before conception. In researching these issues, I have often wondered why so many disease processes in conventional medical literature are described as being of unknown origin, quote, etiology unknown, close quote. This stems from total disregard for the fact that the extra telluric complex of forces we pointed to yesterday is already present as an individual approaches conception, not only birth but also conception, and that all the forces that work on an individual in this way later produce the opposite effects. <clears throat> this means that certain processes present before conception produce counter-effects after conception or especially after birth. Sometimes all we can observe is what begins to take effect in a person's life after birth, a counter-effect of sorts to what was present before conception in the overall context of natural existence. What I have just said relates especially strongly to everything having to do with ossification and sclerosis. These are processes that have counterparts in the time before conception. As entirely normal, organic, formative processes, they counter the process of expansion or dispersion that is active in the human being prior to conception. It is extremely important to look at this fact. We will not be able to control the sclerotic process if we cannot relate it in this way to a suprahuman and extra telluric process that precedes conception, even if this extra telluric principle later appears within the human being, either after birth or beginning with conception. All of these necessary forces are also can also overstep a certain boundary, the midpoint of their oscillation, so to speak. In some respects, processes such as sclerosis or ossification oscillate around a midpoint, and it is possible for them to overshoot the mark and become too strong. They then appear in a very different form. Initially, they appear as predispositions, which reveal a great deal about the essential nature of an individual. If a normal process of ossification or sclerosis, or one that becomes abnormal only in its own domain in the course of a person's lifetime, swings to the other side, so that it takes place not in its own domain but in some other organ system, then the pathological counter-image of a preconceptional process appears. <clears throat> this is what we encounter in the various types of carcinoma. It is possible to look at these questions only if we really try to understand the human being's entire development and existence. Without that understanding, that is, if we cannot relate it to anything that must work within the individual in some way but has become distorted and has shifted its activity to a different domain, a condition such as carcinoma will always remain a relatively unknown factor in human life. Another condition, namely the phenomenon of infantile hydrocephaly, must also be considered in a similar way. Actually, hydrocephaly must exist and we are all predisposed to it. If it did not exist, the human brain and nervous system would never be able to develop in the right way. 
because they must be derived from the fluid element that is present within the human being. In childhood, therefore, a struggle is always apparent between hydrocephaly and the process that takes place in the human organization in order to combat it. We should actually never speak of hydrocephaly alone, but should also include its opposite, the loss of too much water in the brain. The latter, a disease that tends to be overlooked, is simply the necessary opposite of hydrocephaly. As little children, we alternate between the two extremes of hydrocephaly and later its opposite. It can happen, and we will consider the treatment more closely later, that we may overlook an important factor in this connection. We may disregard the fact that there is an appropriate mo excuse me, let me read that again, there's a word there that shouldn't be there. We may disregard the fact that there is an imp an appropriate moment for hydrocephaly to disappear more or less completely and try to eliminate the hydrocephalic tendency too early, whether through education, diet, or treatment in childhood, or in infancy. It is quite possible to make hydrocephaly disappear too early, and if we do so, we will definitely encounter the harm that can be done by failing to consider the person's entire lifespan. Once again, let me point out that this subject would support an entire army of medical theses if we were simply willing to look for the connection between the hydrocephalic process in childhood and syphilis, or the predisposition to syphilis, in later life. <clears throat> there is nothing to be gained by tracking down microorganisms in this instance. There is truly something to be gained only when we are capable of encompassing factors such as I have just laid out. It would do a great deal to prevent syphilis if we made the effort to safeguard people in earnest childhood against what can later appear as syphilitic symptoms, which vary considerably, as we shall hear later. In the course of diagnosis, it is always necessary to remember such connections and to go back to the actual cause as revealed by the course of an individual's development. <laughs> In this context, the following point is tremendously significant. It can be said that a shift occurs in the entire organic process, both the process and the upper part of the human being that moves down toward the heart, and the process in the lower human being that moves upward toward the heart from the lower part of the abdomen. The human being's entire formative process pushes toward the heart, the actual damming up organ, from both sides. <clears throat> However, this push takes place during different stages of life. If we tackle the symptoms, if we learn how to look at all the symptoms that appear, especially at a younger age, and may ultimately lead to pneumonia or pleurisy in childhood. If we add up everything that plays into these processes, then we discover that this is a displaced process, a process that has shifted. It is the same as the process that comes to expression as hydrocephaly at an even earlier age. It is simply hydrocephaly that has been displaced to a lower level in the human organization, where it develops into a predisposition to pneumonia, pleuritic symptoms, or related childhood symptoms. All of these childhood symptoms have counterpart processes in later life. That is, they return later, but as their polar opposites. Many people would be able to understand all of the processes played out in endocarditis, for example, even acute endocarditis, if they merely investigated the course of disease symptoms earlier in life connected with pneumonia or pleurisy. This should help us to ensure that pneumonia and pleuritic symptoms are not suppressed prematurely or too quickly in children. <clears throat> 
parents and teachers naturally want to get rid of such symptoms as quickly as possible. But in these disease states in particular, it is really very important to allow them their own destiny. <clears throat> as a physician, you should intervene only to divert conditions that would otherwise cause damage. Aside from this, you should allow the disease process to run its course to the very end. It is never more important than with the symptoms related to childhood pneumonia or pleurisy and certain others as well, to implement some kind of physical or, as it is now called, naturopathic treatment. In other words, try to allow the disease process, as much as possible, to run its normal course without speeding it up or cutting it off prematurely. This is important because such a disease process, if cut off too soon, leads relatively quickly to a predisposition to cardiac disease and related syndromes, and it leads especially to a predisposition to such conditions as polyarthritis. Consequently, it is particularly important to avoid disrupting the disease process in this realm. For many people, simply by not intervening in the intentions of pleurisy and pneumonia, we could eliminate predispositions to all kinds of illnesses that later manifest as cardiac irregularities. The cohesiveness of a person's entire course of development is evident here. At this point, we might also remind ourselves of the need to look at the milder cases of illness that are more easily cured, and not just at the more extreme cases of truly serious illnesses. In fact, at times we may be unable to tell whether we have brought about a cure, or we may simply need to tell a patient not to insist on treatment, since the condition will get better by itself. It can be very important to not do too much curing. There is nothing wrong with being cured, of course, but we must also consider the many individuals who, to their own way of thinking, have experienced all sorts of illness, those who have survived so many different medications and methods of treatment that when they are older, and they are always sick, it is difficult to find anything that reassures them. It would be better to help people understand that in most cases they are not as sick as they think they are. This approach, of course, also has its negative aspects, but it is certainly proper to mention it in this context. Now, however, you must see all of these matters in view of the fact that the human being is complicated and consists of various members a physical organization, an etheric organization, which has a great deal of work to do between the ages of seven and fourteen in order to penetrate into the physical organism, only to be driven out again during conditions such as pregnancy. An astral body, which begins to work its way in effectively only after the age of fourteen. And the eye, which finds its way in even later, but in the meantime must not be thought of as outside the body. In the waking state the eye is never outside the organism. The integration of the eye into the organism enhances the cooperative work that takes place there. In any disturbance in the organism we are always dealing with the fact that the eye is experiencing certain difficulties in asserting itself within the other members in the right way. It must be said that modern medicine, though it is unaware of this, has the capacity to show how the eye struggles to come to terms with the other three human organizations. It illustrates in an extremely instructive way the struggle of the I with the other three bodies. We simply fail to recognize these illustrations for what they are, because we live in an age whose philosophy of life is materialistic. Each time you chart a real fever curve, however, you see a precise imprint of the struggle I just characterized. 
to gain insight into this relationship, there is nothing more illustrative than tracing the fever curves of various disease states. Admittedly, this exercise may be much less important for therapy than it is for pathology, but we do need to understand something about these matters, at least in a general way. You see, understanding a condition like pneumonia or typhoid fever depends on coming to an understanding about the course of the fever as plotted on the chart below. When you study the two main types of fever curves in pneumonia and compare the fever curves of crisis and lysis, you can see how differently the eye, whose intervention in the organism has been disturbed, handles its response in these two instances. In pneumonia, for example, the fever curve, which I am sketching only schematically, shows first the struggle and then the rebound of the eye when the patient's temperature takes a critical dive below normal. The previous exertions of the eye enable it later to effect the rebound. In the other, more lytic course of the illness, lytic is L-Y-T-I-C, L-Y-S-I-S was lysis from before. In, in the other, more lytic course of the illness, it is less possible for the eye to incorporate the reactions into its own forces, which is why the other, more irregular drop in temperature is the more dangerous course. If you consider the fever curve in typhoid fever, however, you will be able to see especially closely into the entire work of the eye as it confronts the other three organizations. There you have a graphic image of how I, the eye actually struggles. <clears throat> this example shows that the merger of science and medicine makes it necessary to consider these different human organizations. All the confusion in medical science is due entirely to the fact that science has become materialistic and has restricted itself to observing only the processes of the physical body, whose processes, however, are never independent. Above all, they do not all have equal value in their own way. You see, any given process in the physical body may depend on the fact that the etheric body, or perhaps the astral body, or the I, is working in it. These are all physical processes, but they become specialized, and the character they assume may, may vary greatly, depending upon which one of the higher members is at work in that part of the physical organization. Taking all of what I said yesterday about human dependence on supra-earthly and earthly principles, and combining it with what I added today about the human being's temporal course of development, you will realize something that will be helpful with regard to how to conduct the type of investigation that I am discussing. You will realize that forces are constantly being exerted upon the human being. Initially, these are either extra-telluric forces or telluric forces, which work in the opposite direction. In other words, there are either forces that come from Saturn, Jupiter and Mars, or ones that come from Venus, Mercury and the Moon the latter having been transformed into telluric influences. With regard to the relationship between the earth and the moon, it is very easy to deceive ourselves about what is going on. It is easy to think that the moon is up there and exerts its influence from above, but this is incomplete thinking. The moon is more than just the earth's companion revolving around it. The same force that is inherent in the moon and works on the earth from above is also present within the earth itself. The earth has its own moonlight nature, which works out of the earth from the inside. And there's a drawing. On the physical plane, all the processes that manifest in ebb and flood tides and in many other phenomena 
menstruation, for example, are lunar effects rather than actual telluric effects, but they do not result from the direct influence of the moon, as more recent theories would have it, but rather from the earth's own moon-like nature. That is why there is an outward correspondence, but generally no direct temporal connection between these things. Similarly, when we talk about one of the inner planets, we must also look for its counter-image within the earth, and then its more physical effects. We must imagine that it is working back into the physical plane from the terrestrial element. What comes about more on the level of soul and spirit must be attributed directly to the planets outside the earth. In the case of the moon, it works as follows. The moon casts certain formative forces onto the earth, which come to expression by stimulating creative imagination in human beings. The moon has a great influence on the soul's imaginative creativity. Although they are not adequately taken into account in this materialistic age, such influences are definitely present and will have to be studied at some point. On the level of soul and spirit, the moon has a strong effect on human creative imagination. The counter-image, the moon's effect on the organic level, affects the human organization from the opposite direction, working out of the earth's moon-like nature. This influence is what needs to be taken into account. It also applies to the inner planets that are farther away than the moon. As we have seen, telluric localized forces, that is, terrestrial forces, and extra-telluric localized forces work on the human being in many different ways. We can study these forces only when we see the result of their cooperative interaction in the entire human being, never in any single part of the human being, and least of all in the single cell. Please take note of this, especially not in the single cell. For what is a cell? A cell is something that stubbornly asserts itself in its own growth and its own life in opposition to what the human being really is. If, on the one hand, you see the entire form of the human being as it is built up by telluric and extra-telluric influences, and on the other hand you consider the cell. You see the cell as a ghostly intrusion into the plans of these initial influences, which it destroys because it wants to develop a life of its own. In the human organism we are constantly struggling against cellular life. The most crassly absurd view has come about because of cellular pathology and cellular physiology, which take cells as the basis of all life and see the human organism as composed of cells. Actually, the human body is an entirety, an entity that is connected to the cosmos, and as such it always has to combat the stubborn independence of its cells. Essentially, the cell, rather than building up our organism, constantly disturbs it. But of course, now that the basic views of cellular pathology and physiology have infiltrated how we look at everything else, it is not surprising that people come up with the most topsy-turvy ideas about the human body and everything related to it. In a certain way, therefore, we encounter two opposing sets of forces in the human developmental process and the cellular process. Our organs lie between these two sets of forces, and whether an organ develops into a liver or a heart or some other organ depends on which, depends on which set of forces preponderates. Each organ represents an ongoing balancing act between the two sets of forces I have described. Some of our organs 
tend at times more toward the cellular aspect, which is then combated by the cosmic aspect. But there are also organs, we will describe them in detail later, in which the cosmic aspect predominates and the cellular moves into the background. From this perspective it is especially interesting to consider the organs that are located between the genitourinary tract and the heart. This system of organs demonstrates the greatest similarity to the real intentions of the cells. If you examine the entire human being and consider all the individual organs, you will find the greatest similarity between organs and cell life in this particular part of the body. This leads us to ask, what is actually going on with the cells? Let us exaggerate a little and say that a cell develops a life of its own. The cell develops a life of its own, but this life is continually being counteracted by another influence from outside, by an outer factor that takes the life away from the cell or from the cell's formative forces. It sucks the life out of the cell, leaving it with a drop-like shape. It needs to become common knowledge that everything on earth that assumes a drop shape, regardless of whether it is inside or outside the human being, is the result of two forces, one that wants to manifest life and another that sucks the life out of the first. If we look into ancient medicine's ideas of the mercurial principle, it is interesting to note that the physicians of antiquity saw it as the principle whose life was taken away, leaving it in the form of a drop. In the mercurial principle they saw something that wanted to become a cell, an independent living drop, but was prevented from doing so by the planetary influences of mercury, and thus became a droplet of mercury, the mere corpse of a cell. There you have the intermediate stage between the salt and the phosphoric principles, and at the same time you can glimpse the admittedly very complicated route we must take to discover how planetary influences are played out in what we encounter on earth. Each drop of mercury would be a living being if the planet Mercury were not there. And everything in us that tends most strongly toward the cellular aspect that is the part of the human being that I just mentioned as lying between the organs of elimination and the heart, is most dependent on being exposed to the planetary influence of mercury in the right way. If I may put it like this, it is important that these organs preserve their tendency to maintain the cellular aspect and also that this tendency not be allowed to go so far as to be totally overwhelmed by life. In other words, it is important that these organs continue to be exposed to the mercury principle that paralyzes life or kills it off. The activity of these organs would immediately become rampant if they did not remain in this intermediate state. If we continue to pursue this topic even further, we arrive at the connection that exists between these organs and metallic mercury, which represents the mercury principle. You see, the route we are taking here is a fully rational one. Since it will become increasingly necessary to use outer sense-perceptible facts to confirm what supersensible perception can discover about humankind's present and future states, you would do well to study, both clinically and in the medical literature, how individual minerals and metals, whether of mineral, plant or animal origin, actually work on the human organism. <clears throat> in this connection, <clears throat> we can begin by studying particularly characteristic features. I told you today that a certain preconceptional tendency needs to work to counteract ossification or sclerosis. <clears throat>
Ossifying and sclerotic processes, however, have a polar opposite. To make this opposite proliferate, all you need to do is induce lead poisoning in an individual. Of course, experiments cannot go so far as to actually induce lead poisoning in order to study arterial sclerosis. So the important thing is to keep this in mind as we follow the symptoms that appear when nature does the experimenting for us. In this way we can discover the inner relationship between lead itself and the factors within the human being that come from the same forces that are active in lead. Following the process that is active in lead and the processes of ossification and sclerosis in the human being is fully in line with our studies. Similarly, it would be possible to study the interrelationship between the process inherent in tin and the interaction I described earlier between hydrocephaly and its opposite. We would find that the same forces that are active in tin are also active in this whole childhood syndrome whose purpose is to bring about the right degree of hardness in the head and the soft tissues. As we have seen at a later age, this process moves on toward the lungs. We do not need to go very far here. All that is needed is to compile and correctly interpret data that have been noted in the medical literature for centuries. Here we arrive at the intimate relationship between the forces in iron and the process connected to all the symptoms that accompany pneumonia and pleurisy. Once again we will be able to trace this relationship into the usual process that takes place due to the presence of iron in the blood, where it is more or less normal. If you follow the same process that is played out in the interaction between iron and blood further, into the respiratory system and everything related to it, you will then see how effective iron is in the interaction between hydrocephaly and its opposite, which has shifted into the lungs. You can see how these things interact. Only such interactions and their relationship to what is outside the human being make it possible for us to discover the therapeutic effects of potential remedies. <laughs> if we truly valued looking at the human being in this way, Observers would undoubtedly develop an intuition of sorts that would be an especially important factor in any diagnosis. In this context, it is important to see many different aspects in connection to each other. With each diagnosis, we should look at the individual's current situation in the world, how this person's life has been until now and how he or she promises to live in the time to come. What do I mean when I say promises to live in the time to come? In a certain way, what a person will experience in the future, especially on the organic level, is definitely present in the form of a potential already present within the individual. If we look for the connection between all I have now said about the effects of lead, tin, and iron on the human organism, and the effects that can emanate from other metals, we find that, in some sense, the effects we have already discussed are the polar opposites of those of copper, mercury, and silver. What I have just said is not intended to promote any specific remedies. But I do need to point out the existence of very specific interactions between the configuration of forces in these metals and in other substances and the formative forces of the human organism itself. Thus certain forces, such as those associated with copper, will counteract in some way those associated with iron. This will show us which other forces we must use when forces of a certain type, such as those of iron, 
are present and working too strongly. For example, we will find that very specific pathological symptoms in the human organism show that the iron forces must be too strong. Then it is important to administer copper or a similar remedy which could also be derived from the plant kingdom. Today's many-sided overview may have asked a bit much of you. I simply hope that if you look at some of what I presented today, you will be able to see how the, these questions need to be worked out further in order to yield very fruitful results for transforming medical education and our entire system of medicine. The end of Lecture 7. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 8, given in Dornach on March 28, 1920. What we refer to by saying ether body, astral body, and so on, terms we must use to abbreviate or simplify our ideas, can definitely be traced to how they are imprinted, in a certain sense, in physical processes. It's just that today we are not inclined to correctly associate what is expressed through physical processes with the spiritual foundation of existence. We absolutely must make these associations, however, in order to spiritualize our methods of thinking and observation in the field of medicine. For example, we must investigate how the interplay between what we call the etheric and physical bodies takes place. You know that this interplay takes place within the human being, and we spoke yesterday of one aspect of it, an irregularity that can develop with regard to how the astral body affects it. This same interplay also takes place outside, however, in nature external to the human being. If you follow this thought through to the end, you will have a thorough insight into the human being's connection to non-human nature. When you look into nature, you are surrounded by all the individual species of plants. Let's focus on plants for today. And you become aware of this flora through various senses. If you do this, you can get at least an inkling of the interaction that takes place, first of all between this flora and the Earth's entire atmosphere, and second, between the plants and the planetary or astral realm that lies outside this earthly sphere. We might say that when we consider the Earth's flora, if this is the Earth's surface, the plants point us in the direction of the atmosphere and the astral or starry realm. And there's a drawing. <coughs> They point to the extra telluric principle. Even without going into the esoteric aspects, we can sense the living interaction taking place out there between the phenomenon of plants bursting into flowers and fruits and influences coming from the great expanses of the universe. Next, let us turn away from all this and direct our thoughts inward into ourselves. Parenthesis, this view requires a little help from intuition, but as I have already said, absolutely nothing works in medicine without intuition. Close parenthesis. If we redirect our thoughts away from the outer world and into ourselves, we discover a certain relationship to what is outside. Since we must realize that in the plant world, the etheric aspect is intimately connected to the physical, we must also sense that there is a certain relationship between the etheric physical connection in the plant world and their connection within the human being. It is important to acknowledge what it is that enables us to speak outwardly and concretely about this relationship 
between the etheric and the physical. Initially we can say quite abstractly that because it opens upward the etheric factor is closer to the astral than to the physical. We will also have to realize that the etheric does have some kind of connection to the physical. We will have to examine this dual relationship of the etheric to the physical on the one hand and the astral on the other. And we will have to look for some way of being guided into this relationship. I would now like to show you as concretely as possible how this can happen. Let us imagine that you are walking down an avenue that is lined with flowering linden trees. As you walk along, try to be very aware of passing through their scent and be aware too that a process is taking place between that aroma and the nerve-like network spreading throughout your organs of smell. If you pay attention to this process, you become aware of the inner factor that is capable of perceiving smell. This factor is shooting upward to meet the linden scent. You must realize that in the process taking place here, an inner element comes forth to meet an outer one, and that these two elements somehow bring a process to completion because of the inner relationship between them. Your actual perception of the scent internalizes an external element dispersed by the scent of the flowering trees, an element that is undoubtedly based on how the plants interact with their entire extra-earthly environment and open themselves up to it. Because you perceive, a force present within you must be working from the etheric body into the astral body, because otherwise you would be unable to perceive and the whole process would take place only on the level of life functions. In perceiving smell, the very process itself is evidence of the astral body's involvement. But while this relationship to the outer world is being disclosed, you also realize that the development of the sweetish scent given off by the linden blossoms is somehow related to, or is the opposite pole of, what is going on in your organs of smell. In fact, in the linden blossom's pervasive scent, we recognize the interaction of the etheric element in the plant with the surrounding element, the astral element that pervades universal space. As the perceptive process is played out, we participate in the aspect of the plant world that is related to the extra telluric astral element. Now let us choose any taste, just to have an example that relates to the previous one. A similar process occurs when we taste the flavor of licorice or sweet grapes, but in this case the process takes place in your organs of taste as opposed to our organs of sm excuse me in our organs of taste as opposed to our organs of smell you know how closely related our organs of taste and smell are so you will immediately have some idea of how closely the processes of tasting and smelling are related with regard to the whole course of natural events you must also be clear however that tasting is a much more organic and inward process than smelling. Smelling takes place closer to the surface and participates in processes of the non-human outer world that dissipate or are dispersed in space. This is not the case with tasting. Through tasting you discover certain properties that necessarily lie within substances and that must, therefore, be bound up with the substantial element itself. Through tasting, more than through smelling, you discover the internal character of substances, in this case of plant substances, and you simply need a bit of help from your intuition 
to realize that everything that has to do with solidification in plants, with organic solidification, is revealed or disclosed by tasting what is in the plant. However, the plant kingdom resists becoming solid, as is demonstrated by the substances that cause plants to become aromatic. You will not be able to doubt that the process of tasting is related to the etheric's connection to the physical. Now, take smelling and tasting together. Surrounded by plant odors and taste, you are in the midst of the etheric's dual connection to the astral and the physical. You go right into the etheric, or rather into its imprint, when you pay attention to smelling and tasting. The seat of smelling and tasting in the human being is a revelation within the physical world of the etheric's connection to the astral and the physical. In some respects, we remain on the surface of the human being when we investigate the processes of smelling and tasting. <clears throat> but you see, the important point today is that in our efforts to fructify real science, we finally go beyond the abstract and the mystical and move on to the concretely and move on to concretely grasp the spirit. What good does it do if people talk on and on about grasping the divine element in the human being, if they understand this divine element as an abstract divinity at best? This way of looking at things becomes fruitful only when we are able to delve into concrete phenomena. If we consider the internalization of outer processes in this concrete sense. For example, while we are engaged in smelling and tasting, we must consider both the outer living etheric element that is related to the human being and its internalization we need to see what is perhaps the crudest of our upper sensory processes as a direct internalization of outer processes. It is so very important for our times to move beyond the merely abstract and mystical. You will also realize now that everything in nature is in a constant state of transition to another form. Each process in nature tends to move on to another to metamorphose into a different one. If you take what we have just said about smelling lying closer to the surface, see drawing below and there's a drawing, and tasting taking place deeper within the human being and related to plants, you find that these processes take place in the etheric element inasmuch as it opens up toward the astral or solidifies into the physical. That is, it either moves outward, dispersing and becoming aromatic, or, in the case of tasting, it refrains from becoming aromatic, internalizing the outer tendency toward solidification. In a certain respect, the outer and the inner merge when we focus on smelling and tasting. In nature, however, any given process always leads into a different one. Let us consider the aromatic aspect of the plant, that is, everything that allows the plant to avoid becoming solid by giving off its plant essence, extending its spirituality, pardon the lay expression, into the atmosphere, so that the atmosphere contains something of the plant's essence in the form of fragrance. Ghostly replicas of plants are present in what we smell out in the world. Consider what is actually happening in the external world when a plant gives off its ghostly fragrance, when it does not allow itself to become a totally solid plant, when its flowers emit a substance that wants to become a flower but refrains from doing so and persists in a dip dispersed state. This is nothing other than a restrained combustion process. If you imagine the metamorphosed extension of the process of becoming aromatic, 
you will have to think of it as a restrained combustion process. You see combustion and the plant's aromatic process and recognize them as two metamorphoses of a common entity. I might say that becoming aromatic is the process of combustion on a different level. Let us look at the aspect of the plant that causes flavor and therefore lies deeper within the plant. Rather than sending its vegetative formative force out into the environment in ghost-like form, the plant holds it together and uses it to develop internal forms. Because you participate in this internal formative process when you taste, you arrive at a process that parallels the plant's solidification on a lower level. On this other level, however, it is a metamorphosis in the direction of becoming salt-like inasmuch as plants do this, because we are still talking about the plant world here, and then it refers back to the drawing. Consider this strange metamorphosis in the plant. On the one hand, you see the upward directed process of becoming aromatic, which is a restrained combustion in some respects. It can lead to the beginnings of combustion, because the activities involved in flowering are simply combustion processes that are incorporated into the plant. Down below, on the other hand, you have solidification, the process of becoming salt-like. What you taste in a plant is a restrained salt formation, but when salts are actually incorporated into the plant, when you find salts within the plant itself, these plant salts have gone beyond the process of plant formation. The plant has imprinted its own ghostly replica on its fundamental nature. Here we recognize the rationale behind a remedy. In a certain sense we begin to see light dawning within the plant world because we are able to see into what is going on there. I must repeatedly emphasize the importance of this concrete way of seeing. In order to move on, you must simply recall that wherever possible and purely for higher opportunistic reasons, I will be linking what we are discussing to the common parlance of today, so that you will be in a position to bridge the gap between external science and what spiritual science has to offer. I could also characterize what I am going to explain in the next few sentences in more spiritual scientific terms, but my intention is to forge a link to modern, conventional, scientific ideas that are already available. The physiologists of today speak of matters that are accessible to them but not necessarily to spiritual scientists, who do not need to study anatomy in the same way. Nonetheless, let us make the connection with conventional scientific ideas. We do not have to perpetuate the analytical, anatomical inaccuracies of others, but we do need to deal with the presence of these other scientists and their results. They will stop only when natural science has been fructified by spiritual science to some extent. So let us try it. Spiritual science will clarify the intimate relationship between the process in the eye, E-Y-E, and the processes in smelling and tasting, especially tasting, between the extension of the taste buds into the rest of the material organ of taste and the spreading of the optic nerve in the eye. This is such a close connection that it is almost impossible to avoid looking for analogies in the tasting process when we characterize the inner aspects of the process of seeing. Of course, the extension of the taste buds into the material organ of tasting is not linked to anything as elaborate as the structure of the eye, which is interposed in front of the extension of the optic nerve, thus making seeing something completely different. 
but the visual process that begins behind the elaborate structure of the physical eye is inwardly very closely related to the process of tasting. I might say that in seeing we carry out metamorphosed tasting, metamorphosed in the sense that whatever happens as a result of the eye's elaborate structure is interposed in front of organ processes similar to those that take place during tasting. With regard to each different sense, of course, we must distinguish between what our organism presents to the outer world and what the outer world brings to meet our organism. We must look, for example, at the internal but outward directed activity that results from blood streaming into the eye, that is, from the organism as a whole working into the eye. This activity is even more pronounced in certain animals, whose eyes include, in addition to the structures in the human eye, structures such as the pectin and the xiphoid cartilage, blood organs that allow the capital I to be driven into the eyeball to a greater extent, while in humans the capital I withdraws, leaving the eyeball inwardly free. Footnote. Pectin, P-E-C-T-E-N, resembling a comb, is a folded, vascular, pigmented membrane that projects into the vitreous humor of the eye of a bird or reptile. Xiphoid or xiphoid cartilage or process is the posterior and lowest division of the human sternum, remaining somewhat cartilaginous throughout life. End of footnote. The entire organization, the whole organism, works via the blood through the eye, E-Y-E, into the sensory process. And in the visual process, the act of tasting is metamorphosed in such a way that we can call seeing a metamorphosis of tasting. For this reason, we should place seeing as a metamorphosis of tasting above tasting and smelling, again referring to the drawing back a couple of pages. Thus both the process of tasting and that of seeing consist of an outer factor working together with an inner one. The process must simply metamorphose upward, as it were. The visual process is a metamorphosis of the tasting process. There must also be a corresponding lower metamorphosis of this tasting process deeper inside the body. In the visual process we ascend toward the outer world. The eye is enclosed only in its bony socket. We meet the outer world there because the eye is a surface organ and the activity of seeing is organized with reference to an outer factor. In the opposite direction, we must now think our way deeper into the body, into the lower metamorphosis of the tasting process. Here we arrive at sight's opposite pole or counterpart in the organism. This is a topic that will shed a tremendous amount of light on our subsequent considerations. What do we find when we trace the downward metamorphosis of the tasting process? This is where digestion comes about, and you will arrive at a true inner understanding of digestion only if you conceive of sight as a metamorphosed extension of tasting in one direction and of digestion as its extension in the other direction. You must be able to grasp digestion as the complete and polar opposite of externalized seeing, because externalized seeing leads you to recognize digestion's counterpart in the outer world, the outer factor whose organic internalization is digestion. Similarly, you also become aware of how the digestive process must be thought of as related to the tasting process. You simply cannot understand the subtle, localized digestive activities in the human organism if you do not conceive of good digestion as being based on the ability to quote-unquote taste with the entire digestive tract 
and bad digestion on the inability to do so. The process we have considered here separates into two, tasting and smelling. The activity of tasting relates more to the interaction of the etheric and the physical, that of smelling to the etheric's connection to the astral. What we recognized as tasting's continuation in the organism is subjected to the same division when we look first at digestion, which leads to fecal elimination via the intestines, and then at excretion via the kidneys, which leads to urination. There are exact correspondences between elimination via the bowels and urination in the lower human being and tasting and smelling in the upper human being. The results of separating tasting from smelling and ordinary digestion from everything involved in the more subtle workings of the kidneys are like counterparts in a polarity. At this point it becomes possible to see events in the organism enclosed within the skin as the internalization of something external. In everything that has an upward continuation, we approach and open up to what is outside. We must now pursue this matter further in order to recognize our mental activity that is bound to the body. Parenthesis, and I mean this not in a materialistic sense, but in another sense that will be familiar to you from my lectures. Close parenthesis as a metamorphosis of seeing, again transposed inward. Let me read that without the parenthesis. I'm going to read that again. We must now pursue this matter further in order to recognize our mental activity that is bound to the body as a metamorphosis of seeing, again transposed inward. We must think of the organs that form the basis for thinking or conceptualization again referring back to the drawing a few pages ago, that is, the structures in the interior of the human head, as organs of sight that have metamorphosed in a specific direction. Please consider the fact that most ideas are simply extensions of visual representations that live in your thinking. You need only compare this condition to the inner life of a person who is congenitally blind, Thinking is the inner extension of seeing. We come to realize that this also sheds light on the strange interaction that takes place between the anatomy of the head and brain and the activity of thinking. Strangely enough, for example, if we tackle our thought processes, and this, by the way, would be a very nice chapter for a medical dissertation, and investigate the connection between associative thinking and the brain's organization, we discover structures in the brain that resemble transformations of the olfactory nerve. We might say that seen from within, dispersed, analytical thinking is very similar to its counterpart in seeing. But from this same inner, organic perspective, summarizing what we have seen and relating ideas to each other are activities very similar to smelling. In a very remarkable way, this similarity is even expressed in the brain's anatomical structure. In any case, pursuing this sequence of senses in one direction leads us to the thinking or conceptualizing process. Where do we arrive if we again look for the inner activity? From the perspective of seeing, ideation or ideation is, seeing, is seeing's inner reflection, the attempt to reverse the seeing process and guide it back to the organism. Its polar opposite, therefore, will attempt to lead the existing process outward rather than inward. This is digestion, which becomes the counter-image of conceptual activity because it leads to excretion. Again, see the prior drawing. Here, from a different, more intimate standpoint, you can see another example of what I showed you a few days ago by means of comparative anatomy. 
that the very structure of the human being, and specifically the appearance of intestinal flora, suggest a close relationship between the human being's so-called spiritual capacities and the regulated or unregulated human process of excretion. This is the same thing viewed from a different perspective. Just as we see the activity of thinking as an inner extension of the process of seeing, we also see elimination as an outer extension of the digestive process. Getting back to our earlier observations that becoming aromatic is a restrained combustion process and solidification a restrained salt forming process in plants, we will have shed light on what is happening here on the in inside. We must simply be clear that a reversal is taking place. Up above is a reversal of seeing in an inward direction. Down below is a reversal in the direction of externalization. Thus in the upper region we acknowledge the relationship of these processes to salt formation and in the lower region we recognize their relationship to the development of fire, to combustion. See prior drawing. You help the lower body when something associated with aroma and the restrained combustion process in plants is guided into the lower part of the body. Similarly, you aid the processes of the upper region of if the agent responsible for restraining or internalizing the salt process in plants is introduced into the upper part of the human being. This then must be implemented in detail. Here you can see how everything outside can be reflected on the inside. And the deeper we go within the human being, the more we must look for internalized outer factors. In the activities taking place in the digestive organs and particularly in the kidneys, we must look for something that is very, very closely related to the aromatic combustion process but is simply its other pole. And in the activities that begin in the lungs and move upward through the larynx and the head, we must look for something that is inwardly related to everything that tends toward salt formation in both plants and human beings. You might say, no, you actually can say, that if you know how the different plant species accumulate salts, you need only look for correspondences in the human organization. We have looked for this correspondence on the grand scale today, and we will look for detailed correspondences in the lectures to come. These descriptions, then, encompass all the basic principles of phytotherapy. Its basis becomes apparent. I might say that the entire process that takes place in the interaction between inner and outer becomes apparent. You have also seen several specialized aspects. Now consider the odors that tend more toward tastes, such that you discover the plant's true smell only by chewing it. That is, you actually perceive a synthesis of taste and smell, as is the case with lemon balm or ground ivy, called glaucoma heteracea. You find that a substance inherent in these plants tends toward salt formation. The processes of salt formation and aromatization are working together. This suggests that the organs related to plants, such as lemon balm, must lie closer to the outside, near the chest, while the organs related to strongly fragrant plants, such as the linden or the rose, must lie deep within the abdomen, or at least closer to the abdomen. From the perspective of the relevant organs, you find another process introduced into the upper body among the organs that belong to smelling or tasting. In a somewhat more profound sense, this is an important life process for the human being. Respiration, which interposes itself here, see the prior drawing. We also look for its polar opposite, which must be an activity that separates from the digestive process inasmuch as digestion leads to excretion and is the polar opposite of the organic activity of conceptualization. 
something must separate off that is located close to the organs of digestion, just as respiration is located near the organs of smelling or tasting. The process in question is everything that is involved in the formation of lymph and blood, or to put it more precisely, everything that is pushed inward by the digestive system and thus has its seat in the lymph glands and so forth, in all the organs that play a part in blood formation. Here you see two polar processes, one separated off from digestion, the other, respiration, separated off from the more externally located sensory activities. Respiration is located behind the sensory processes. Mental representations are nourishment for the soul, and the respiratory process is inserted in between. The blood and lymph-forming process is inserted in front of digestion, inasmuch as digestion leads to elimination. Strangely enough, we are moving from the process itself into the entire human being, while it is customary today to consider the human being only from the point of view of the organs in question. Here we are attempting to understand the entire human being from the perspective of the relevant process and of the connection between the human being and the non-human outer world. And in fact, we have discovered connections that provide us with a direct image of all the etheric activity in the human being. This is what we have been studying for the past hour today. These two processes, respiration and blood formation, meet up again in the human heart. You see, we encounter the entire outer world, including the external aspect of the human being, as a duality that is held back in the human heart, where it attempts to achieve a balance of sorts. Thus we can arrive at a remarkable image that contrasts the synthesizing process in the human heart with its inwardness and its activity of gathering the substances and forces that enter the body from outside and move toward the perimeter of the body and the analyzing process in the outer world, where everything that gathers in the heart is dispersed throughout. Here we come to a very important idea. It can be expressed in this way. We look out into the world and see the periphery and, what are, and wonder what is working into us from out there. How do we find a correspondence within ourselves, something related and similar in character to the contents of the outer world? by looking into our own heart. The reversed heavens are there, the polar opposite, as it were, of the heavens. In the outer world you have the periphery, the point expanded into infinity, and in the human heart you have the circle gathered together with the entire world within it. To use a crude image, we can simply imagine a human being standing on a mountain top and looking out into the great expanse of the universe. Then we imagine a tiny dwarf inside the human heart and try to visualize what that little dwarf sees as the reversal and synthesis of the image of the whole universe. This may be a mere symbolic representation and imagination of sorts. But if we take it in the right way, it is also a legitimate guiding image that can function as a regulatory principle and can stimulate us to correctly sum up the details we have recognized. By now I have laid most of the foundations, both for our more specialized studies and for detailed answers to the many different questions that have been raised. The End of Lecture 8 this is a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 9, given in Dornach on March 29, 1920. Yesterday we discussed how the human organism draws close to outer non-human nature. In the interaction that takes place in two senses, smell and taste, we can see how our human organization establishes a closer connection 
to what is happening outside in the natural world. We are studying this connection because spiritual science recognizes the need to closely link processes in the human organization to therapeutic procedures. Healing is always a matter of understanding which factors are inherent in what we administer to the body, whether by chemical, physiological or physical means, and which ones are inherent in what the organism is capable of accomplishing when it is healthy, but not when it is diseased. In our thinking, we must be able to unite the external process and the process taking place within the human organism. Now these two processes come closest to each other in the perception of smell and taste, while with regard to the other senses they are further apart. For example, seeing and digestion are quite far apart if what we mean by quote-unquote digestion includes only what happens to food from the time it is chewed in the mouth to the time it is processed by the intestinal glands. This is the whole of my meaning of the term digestion. I would have to consider everything else as an aspect of evacuation, either internal evacuation parenthesis, or the absorption of substances, close parenthesis, or external evacuation, which I would refer to as elimination. I would count all post-blandular processes as belonging to elimination. Now let us consider seeing. Here we encounter forms in the outer world that contain within themselves an element that lies closer to the surface in the in the processes of smelling and tasting. In the process of smelling, this element leaves the realm of non-human nature in order to become perceptible to human beings. In other instances, where this element is enclosed in the substances of the non-human natural world, we look at it. When we look at visible forms and so on, we are encountering the formative principle outside us, the same principle that is also disclosed, but only on the level of substance, in the process of smelling. I would like to suggest that if we trace the being that reveals itself in smell out into the plant or mineral kingdom, we will find that the same principle that becomes evident in smell is revealed in formative processes that take place in the external world of nature. The exact opposite process is digestion. It, quote, takes possession, close quote, of what is revealed in taste, concealing it within the organism again. It is extremely significant to point out that until now we have had to describe outer, non-human nature as lying more in the unconscious, where you see the connections that we were able to note from the perspective of the entire universe are present within the human being. The human being is associated with the Saturn-like element, the Jupiter-like element, and so on, but this association is extremely well concealed in the depths of the human organization. If it is not too offensive to modern ways of thinking, we might say that in the human being the astronomical factor is the least conscious of all the factors. Of all the processes in the organism, it ends up furthest in the background. We also have organs that, quote, open up, close quote, the human organism on the inside in a certain way. These organs bring the human body more into connection with what develops close to our Earth's surface, with meteorology in the broadest sense. If we do not restrict ourselves to looking only at therapeutic substances, but also trace the course of therapeutic processes, 
we must look at the connections that exist between the human being and meteorological processes in general. At this point, we can distinguish between the human organs that relate more closely to the astronomical factor and those that relate more closely to the meteorological factor. Admittedly, a more refined method of observation must be implemented here. How this distinction must be made will initially shock you somewhat. But as time goes on, you will recognize it as the best possible foundation for healing. If we look at the organs in the human organism that open themselves up to the meteorological factor, in the same way that deeper-lying organs relate to the astronomical factor, the primary organs that we have to consider are the liver and everything that is vesicular in character, everything the bladder represents. Parenthesis, in the context of pathology, the bladder is extremely important. As strange as it may sound at first, the bladder is one of the most important organs to consider in studying pathology. Close parenthesis. In this context, we can also look at the lungs, which are open to the outside in that they make breathing possible. In a certain respect, we must also consider the heart as one of the organs through which the organism as a whole opens, opens itself up to the outside toward meteorology. You will understand this immediately if you take some things I said in previous lectures in the right way. These organs are all associated with specific meteorological impulses. What this means can be studied only by investigating the human being's entire relationship to the surrounding world, and especially the relationship of human activity to the surrounding world. Above all, I would like to suggest that you make a concerted effort to trace any cardiac damage you encounter to disruptions of human activity. You should conduct studies of how the cardiac function of people who tend their fields as farmers and have little respite from this work differs from that of people whose professions require them to spend a great deal of time driving cars or even riding trains. It would be extraordinarily interesting to set up more thorough research studies on this subject. You would find that the tendency to cardiac disease is especially dependent on whether or not people sit still when they are being transported by some outer vehicle, as is the case with a car or a train. Passive submission to being moved, quote, deforms, close quote, all the processes that are held back in the heart. Let me read that sentence again. Passive submission to being moved deforms all the processes that are held back in the heart. Everything that plays into the human world in this way is related to how human beings maintain bodily warmth. Here you see how cardiac function relates to the impulse of warmth in the outer world to which we are connected. You can see that if an individual engenders enough warmth through his or her own activity, this adequate measure of self-engendered warmth in that person's vital processes is also the measure of the health of the person's heart. With cardiac patients, we would always have to make sure to induce thoroughly enlivened self-movement. I am convinced that in fifteen years or so people will think more calmly about these issues than they do today and will begin to comment on how remarkable it is that people's cardiac activity has become healthy again through eurythmy because doing eurythmy essentially regulates ensouled self-movement in accordance with certain laws. Perhaps there is nothing wrong with saying that from this perspective we should point out the healing exercises that can be derived from eurythmy when we are dealing with cardiac irregularities. Next we come to a condition 
that is more likely to be expressed through reduced bladder activity in the human organism. What I am about to say in this connection may seem somewhat amateurish, but it is not. I can confidently say that it is more scientific than anything that is called scientific today. Essentially, the bladder is a suction device. It functions as a cavity within the human organism, a cavity that creates suction. It is dependent on the fact that the human organism is hollowed out at this particular location. The effect of the bladder on the rest of the organism is just like the effect of a bubble of gas in water. A gas bubble in water is a sphere of dilute matter surrounded by denser matter, and the effect that emanates from this diluted sphere is similar to that of the entire bladder on the human organism. With regard to all the bladder's intended functions, we create disturbances if we have little opportunity to complete internal movements in the right way. One example of this is failing to pay careful attention to the act of eating, disrupting the entire digestive process by gulping down our food instead of chewing. Another is not maintaining the right balance between rest and movement during the digestive process, and so on. Everything that disrupts inner mobility from within also disrupts what we might call the life of the bladder. People will still accept it if you prescribe ensouled movement of some sort for suspected cardiac irregularities, but they will not be very receptive if you want to regulate their inner movements, which are dependent on habit. You will manage to accomplish this, however, if you implement a meteorological treatment for someone who deprives the body of necessary rest by gulping down food or disturbing the digestive process in some other way. This means bringing the person in question into an atmosphere that is richer in oxygen so that he or she must breathe more and is unconsciously forced to expend more care on the respiratory process. Regulating respiration in this way carries over into the regulation of other organic processes. So you will find that if you either artificially or better yet naturally bring an individual who suffers from irregularities in bladder function into a different, more oxygen-rich atmosphere, a certain balance will be effected simply through this change in lifestyle. It is especially important to take note of the liver, the third organ that is connected to outer meteorology in the widest sense. Although seemingly contained within the human organism, it is nonetheless associated with the outer world to a great extent. You can notice this in the fact that liver health is always dependent on the composition of the local water. In order to properly consider the liver health of the people living in a particular place, we would always have to study the composition of the local water. Tasting promotes liver development, but when it occurs in excess, it promotes liver degeneration. In human beings, liver degeneration is the same as excessive indulgence. Finding food pleasant or unpleasant, sympathetic or unsympathetic, ought to be restricted to the tongue and palate, and extending this sympathy and antipathy into the interior leads to liver degeneration. We need to pay attention to this and try to persuade people with any type of liver liver damage, which is often very difficult to notice, to investigate taste and to discover something essential in taste. Conducting a thorough study of the interrelationship of liver function to the composition of the water in any particular locality will prove very difficult since the dependencies are extremely subtle. For example, we would expect liver disorders in localities where the water contains a lot of calcium to be different from those in areas where the water contains less calcium. <clears throat> 
we will do well to notice this and to bear in mind that liver function is always supported by eliminating calcium from water as much as possible. Of course, then we must find ways and means of accomplishing this. The life of the lungs is intimately connected to everything a region offers simply because of its geological configuration. Whether we are dealing with one such as this, where the soil contains a great deal of lime, or an ancient mountainous region, where the soil contains a great deal of silica, human pulmonary function always differs greatly because of such things, since the lungs are essentially dependent on the composition of the solid ground in the locality. One of the first tasks of a physician who establishes a practice in any area should be to thoroughly study the local geology. Studying local geology and examining the local people's lungs are actually the same. We will have to realize that the least favorable situation is when a person's lungs are totally unable to adapt to the local environment. Now you must not misunderstand what I am saying in this connection. In pointing out the lung's dependency on the environment, I am not referring to respiration. I mean the internal structure of the lungs themselves. Of course, respiration, in turn, is dependent on good or poor functioning, which is determined by the lung's internal structure. But with regard to this dependency, I am referring to the actual internal structure of the lungs. Whether a tendency toward incrustation or excessive mucus or the like is present, essentially, depends on the environment. But then the lungs are also very sensitive to physical labor and will certainly be damaged if a person has to do physical work to the point of excessive fatigue. These are connections that can lead us to, do, to recognize the dependent relationships of internal organs such as the lungs, liver, bladder and heart which open up to the outside toward the meteorological factor. Whenever diseases of these organs are present we will have to attempt to achieve therapeutic results through physical or naturopathic means. In a certain way such results are permanent. If we have noticed that someone with a tendency to some sort of lung weakness is quite unadapted to a particular locale. Convincing that person to move to a different, more suitable area is often the best thing we can do. Similarly, with regard to the organs located above the lungs, a radical change in domicile and lifestyle is often the greatest possible boon. Such changes do relatively little for the organs that lie below the heart, but they accomplish a great deal for the lungs and all the organs above the, above the lungs. Of course we must be clear that everything in the organism interacts, and when something goes wrong we must look for a possible hidden interaction. For example, if we discover cardiac or vascular degeneration, we must ask whether there is any tendency toward pulmonary degeneration that would require us to deal with the illness from that perspective. This at least gives an indication of the human being's relationship to meteorological factors. But behind and masked by meteorological factors in the outer world lie astronomical factors. Like the meteorological factors, they are also present within the human being. Internal meteorological factors encompass only the lungs, liver, bladder and heart just as external meteorological factors encompass only the qualities of solid ground, air, water and warmth. The formative forces of the plant and mineral kingdoms lie behind everything encompassed by ascertainable meteorological factors, both within the human being and in the outer world. These formative forces are very close to the extra telluric astronomical factor, and their counterpart within the human being is always hidden 
behind the meteorological process, that is, deeper in the interior than the four above-mentioned organ systems. Because the connection between what is outwardly present in plant and stone and what lies hidden behind the human lungs, liver, and so forth, is not so readily apparent, studying therapeutic processes that have their origin in this realm is naturally considerably more difficult. <laughs> we can, however, discover a rational way to do this if we realize that in some respects the human being always has an inner organic tendency to do the opposite of whatever is happening externally. Let us take silicic acid processes as a concrete example. First of all, it is quite evident that silicic acid processes are taking place wherever silicates, quartz and similar rocks, are formed. These processes have their counterpart in the human organism. But they also underlie certain other activities that, unfortunately, tend to be disregarded today. These other activities take place in cultivated ground and in the interaction between cultivated soil, or the earth as a whole, which is, after all, silicious, and the roots and similar organs that plants sink into the ground. Everything we can derive from plant ashes is also intimately related to the external silica process. This external silica process, however, has its counterpart inside the human being, and specifically in the organs lying above the activity of the heart and tending in the direction of lung activity, if I can put it in this way, or rather of the inner organic activity that shapes the lungs and lies closer to the head. Here, in everything that lies above the activity of the heart, we have the polar counterpart of silica formation in the external world. <clears throat> to a great extent, this inner organic process is essentially a potentization of external silica formation, as I have indicated in previous lectures. A particular symptom complex that has its seat in the area above the heart's activity may lead to all kinds of other disturbances in the organism. Extensive pulmonary discharge is crude evidence of an illness of this sort, but so is meningitis or pseudo-meningitis. Because everything is reciprocal in the organism, these lung disorders also influence cardiovascular disorders. Such disturbances may tend toward inflammatory conditions in the brain. However, this tendency may be suppressed and appear instead in the form of inflammation of the digestive organs or related organs. In this case, the problem is knowing where the actual starting point lies. But we can talk more about this later. In all such cases, it will be important to introduce a substance into the organism that dilutes or potentizes the external effects of silica to the greatest possible extent. If you consider this connection in the right way, it proves to be extremely characteristic and important. It also shows you that when something goes wrong that can be directly observed in the upper parts of the body, we need to transform nature's important silica processes by breaking the silica apart, dividing it and grinding it up. If lower parts of the body, such as the heart itself, are damaged as a result of reciprocal effects, then under certain circumstances the process that is induced by plants containing a great deal of silicic acid could be used, either directly or in some metamorphosed form, to evoke a healing process. All plants that contain silica compounds should be carefully studied with regard to the extent of their effects on all activities that are played out below the level of the heart in the human organism, although, of course, these effects in turn work back on the rest of the organism. In the external natural world, 
The complete opposite of silica formation is carbonic acid formation. Carbonic acid formation is the polar opposite of silicic acid formation. This is why it is so necessary to trace the process of carbonic acid formation with respect to everything in the organism that contrasts with what I characterized earlier, that is, everything that has to do with digestion in the broadest sense or even has its source or starting point in the digestive system. Any carbonic acid compounds, especially if they are used in a natural, plant-derived form, will allow us to cope remarkably well with these forms of illness. It is very important, however, to take one particular connection into account. The sense of smell directs us only outward into the rest of the visible world, while the sense of taste directs us inward toward what lies hidden within the organism. If you trace substances according to what they offer by way of smell and taste, if you study digestion with this in mind, you will realize that at the beginning of the digestive process substances mingle and flow into one another. As these substances continue to move through our digestive organs, however, we must separate again what has been mingled. This applies not so much to the material aspects as to the respective processes. To separate what mingles when we ingest food is in fact one of the organism's main functions. First of all, it has to separate everything that is meant to be excreted via the bowels on the one hand and via the urine on the other. Medical intuition will be unusually important in treating the system of organs we are now approaching, namely the renal system and its wonderful workings, and the extraordinary branching that is evident there even on the level of processes. We will say more about this later. At the moment the important point, as was demonstrated in previous lectures, is that everything eliminated via the bowels has a connection to activities taking place in the head. These two belong together. Similarly, everything eliminated via the urine is connected to processes taking place in and around the heart in the cardiovascular system. In all elimination via the bowels, we are essentially dealing with a human copy of the silica forming process. While in all aspects of urine formation, we are dealing with a copy of the carbonic acid process. These connections permit us to conclude that there is a link between what takes place in the healthy individual and what is taking place in someone who is sick. We are pointing toward connections that exist on the level of processes, but these connections cannot be considered in a one-sided manner. We will see that we must master all of these phenomena in order to correctly assess the law of similars that Dr. Scheidegger presented to us in such an illuminating way yesterday. Footnote. In a lecture to participants in this house, Edwin Scheidinger was a leading physician and the builder of the Marion Eislin Hospital in Basel. The, quote, law of similars, close quote, was a basic element of Paracelsus's doctrine of healing and was later put into practice in homeopathy by Samuel Hahnemann, 1755 to 1843 who postulated that medicine produces symptoms in healthy people that are similar to those that it relieves in sick people. End of quote. Although it conceals something extremely important, the law of similars needs to be built up out of all the elements we acquire by studying connections such as those we are establishing here. Once again the human being's connection to metals lies behind everything I have just explained to you. We speak about the silicious quality as what gives form to the human being, in contrast to the dissolving capacity of carbonic acid within the human being, and the process of life itself is inherent in this constant tendency to acquire form and redissolve. If we look first at the silicious 
quality that gives form to human beings, we must not forget that the particular areas within the human organization that resemble this salacious quality, for reasons I have already explained in part on previous days, have a relationship to the metallic qualities of lead, tin, and iron. Thus we can say that when we look at the area above the heart, we must look at what works within the human being on the basis of silicic acid. On the one hand, and on the basis of the qualities of lead, tin, and iron on the other. The iron quality has more to do with the lungs' formative process, the tin quality with the head's general formative principle, and the lead quality with the formative force that is localized in the bones, because bone structure and bone growth essentially originate from the upper part of the human being, not the lower part. It is important to learn to weigh how these things work together, how salts of salicylic acid, for example, can be used, always testing the respective metal for its similarity to these three res representative types. And at the same time, we must be clear that the lower region of the human being is related to copper, mercury, and silver, and that we must consider the extent to which we can apply these metals themselves or related metals by combining them somehow with processes that form carbonic acid. In this way we unite three things, the metallic quality as defined by the extra telluric element working within the earthly element, a quality that is otherwise stony which takes shape under the influence of the principle that forms carbonic acid and what takes shape under the influence of the principle that forms silicic acid. We gradually draw closer to the possibility of discovering concrete external substances that we must introduce into the human organism in order to bring about healing in one or the other case. As we do this, we will always have to note that very high dilutions can be effective if the substance in question has little effect on the lower senses of smell and taste, and therefore does not put its essential nature on display so outwardly, whereas we will need lower dilutions of substances that blatantly present their inner nature to our senses of smell and taste. If we understand their healing aspects clearly, substances with strong smells and tastes are often extremely good remedies in their natural state, especially if their therapeutic effect is not cancelled out by a conventional diet. Admittedly, in order to delve still further into these questions, we must at least be aware that each human sense possesses the power to distinguish differences and that human subjects are the best reagents, the means, the best means of discovering reactions. Of course, this will be difficult in the case of substances with no pronounced smell or taste. But let me make you aware of a type of self-education that is especially important for physicians. It consists of developing all the subtle sensing capacities that can possibly be developed, the ones that lead us to have sensations even with respect to the external natural process of silica formation or the like. It must be meaningful that quartz, although it always produces very regular formations on its own, is a mineral whose related substances tend toward all kinds of possible, possible crystalline shapes. Enormous variety exists in the crystallization of silicates. Anyone who has a sense for such things also senses that the dispersing element predominates in all their different formative possibilities. A dispersing element must pre-exist if the degree of formative capacity that the silicates possess is to be present in outer nature. This suggests that silicates must be broken apart before they are used. We need to develop the ability to sense this, because this sensing ability leads to a means of evaluating remedies. It is also necessary for 
each of us to become a good reactive medium in terms of acquiring the sensory abilities to discover that smells are sevenfold, just like sensations of color. If we acquire the ability to distinguish sweetish smells, pungent smells, and so on, we will discover that the sense of smell is differentiated into seven nuances, as is the ta sense of taste. The interesting point here is that by mastering the spectrum, as it were, or scale of sense, we also acquire a means of learning how to find our way among all the phenomena of combustible substances. We delve into the nature of combustible substances, as it were. Tomorrow we will see how this is done. And if we acquire specific sensory possibilities with regard to taste, so that we can easily distinguish between sweet tastes and the tastes of salts and the five other nuances, then we acquire a certain inner relationship to the salt-forming principle in nature. Having acquired this relationship, we reach the point of being able to sense in the impressions we receive from nature that one thing is useful for one aspect of the human organism, another for another aspect. Although we need a firm foundation in careful, precise, scientific studies of the effects of various substances, it is still very important for us to unfailingly unite the results of these studies with our own subjective powers of perception and gain a certain inner feeling of kinship with nature by doing so. Tomorrow I would like to take up again what we have discussed today and then continue to move closer to the specifics. The end of Lecture 7. Excuse me, the end of Lecture 9. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 10, given in Dornach on March 30th, 1920. Essentially, what we are trying to do here is more concerned with discovering a method of enriching the study of medicine than with getting lost in the dissection of details, which are never more than of relative importance. The methodical study of the human being's connection to external, non-human nature should indeed be suitable for equipping all individuals to begin making their own observations about nature. Today, therefore, let us begin by presenting a few topics that will constitute our path to many discoveries in a certain field. True spiritual scientific research, by providing counterbalances, can unearth many discoveries that can then be verified in terms of Dr. Stein's lecture yesterday. Footnote, Walter Johannes Stein, 1891-1957, history teacher at the Stuttgart Independent Waldorf School from 1919 to 1932, and later active in England. End of footnote. On the other hand, if we go into these particular subjects, we find that they are leitmotifs for many other topics. Today, I would like to point out a few examples that can be significant. Let us remain within the realm of plants for the moment. You will note, for example, the characteristic effects of anise, Pimpinella anisum, on the human organism. We find that its typical effect is to promote secretion. It is a diuretic and promotes both lactation and perspiration. What could this capacity be related to? In the case of this particular plant, we will find that its efficacy is connected to its very finely dispersed content of iron or iron salts. We can clearly perceive how anise works. It takes a process that is otherwise played out in the blood because of the blood's iron content, removes it from the blood, and temporarily pushes it into a region below that of the blood. Because certain plants have strong effects on the middle region, between the inner and the outer realms, between the body's surface and the heart, 
It is especially easy for us to study how their effects extend into different areas. In these plants we can find a recurring theme for what can be discovered through a rational study of therapeutic substances. For example, let us observe a plant that is one of nature's great teachers in this connection, namely chicory, Chicorium intibus. If we are only willing to investigate this plant, we can study numerous different aspects of the human organism. We find that on the one hand Chicorium intibus is a remedy for digestive weakness, for symptoms in the organs that are in direct contact with the human outer world. Footnote, this refers presumably not only to the skin, but to the digestive tract and other organs that are exposed to what a person takes in from the outside world. Close, uh, end of quote, excuse me, end of footnote. On the other hand, it also works on the blood itself and prevents it from failing to perform its necessary functions and allowing disturbances to appear within the blood serum. One final very significant point about Chicorium intibus is that its therapeutic effect extends to very peripheral processes. Under certain circumstances, it even has an effect on the organs of the head and especially on those of the throat and chest the pulmonary organs. It is interesting to study Chicorium intibus simply because it has such strong effects on so many different parts of the human being. We can see these effects fanning out, so to speak. If we wonder about the basis of its effectiveness against digestive weakness, we discover that it is due to the bitter extract that causes chicory's strong taste. Such bitter extracts, which remain strongly plant-like in character, are very strongly related to substances within the human being that have not yet been thoroughly processed by the individual and still retain something of the appearance they had in the outer world. We must realize that the outer world's substances undergo very little processing within us in the parts of the body leading to the stomach. After passing through the stomach, they are processed further. They are substantially changed by the time they reach the bloodstream via the intestines and are most strongly transformed on the periphery in the skeletal, nervous and muscular systems. Plant extracts have a very strong relationship to outer substances that are still unprocessed. But Chicorium intibus also contains alkaline salts, potassium. We must look to potassium as the constituent that affects the blood. Here we see a separation of forces. The forces inherent in chicory extract are related to the digestive organs and move in that direction. While the forces inherent in the alkaline salts are related to and move toward blood-related organs or the blood itself. In addition, a considerable amount of silicic acid is present. Silicic acid works via the blood into the peripheral organs, through the nervous and muscular systems and into the skeletal system itself. Thus Chicorium intibus is a substance that really tells us Quote, Here I am, allowing myself to be split into three, so that I can influence all three members of the human organism. Close quote. This is an example of the experiments nature performs for us, which are much more meaningful than experiments we set up, because nature's intentions are much richer than ours can possibly be when we ask nature questions with our experiments. Horsetail, Equisitum arvenza, is also very interesting in this connection. Here, too, we see powerful effects on digestive weakness combined with strong peripheral effects. We simply need to ask what the basis is for these strong peripheral effects of Equisitum arvenza, and the answer is its silicic acid content. 
simply through a comparative study of these two constituents, we find that any plant extract, anything that is still plant-like, retains a relationship to the digestive tract, while silicic acid, the plant constituent that tends toward the mineral kingdom, absolutely insists on moving from the center of the human being toward the periphery, where it works therapeutically. If you make a real study of medical botany, you will discover multiple examples, very many more examples than I have given you here. A magnificent plant whose effect is very simple but tremendously instructive is Fragaria vesca, the woodland strawberry. Its effect is frequently not noticed, because in people who eat its berries the therapeutic effect is obscured. It would be possible, however, to conduct experiments with people who normally do not eat strawberries and are therefore less still receptive and sensitive to effects that are otherwise masked. Then the wonderful significance of this woodland strawberry would become evident. On the one hand, it is especially capable of normalizing the process of blood formation. It does everything to promote the formation of blood, and for this reason it can even be used to treat diarrhea in people who have not been desensitized to strawberries by eating them. In diarrhea, forces appear in the wrong place, in the abdomen. Fragaria vesca puts them back where they belong, closer to the blood system itself. Here we have on the one hand a significant blood-building force and on the other hand silicic acid, which the woodland strawberry also contains, tending toward the peripheral parts of the organism. Just consider what a wonderful plant this strawberry is. Because of its silicic acid, it tends to foster the development of certain forces on the organism's periphery. Ordinarily, the danger is that if too much silicic acid is led to the periphery, the forces become excessive and not enough nutrients are sent to the periphery because the blood has not been enriched enough to support the process induced by silicic acid. The woodland strawberry is a magnificent specimen in that it simultaneously prepares the blood which must follow and support this process. In a wonderful form, it expresses what we must do to assist the process that we induce through silicic acid compounds in the peripheral parts of the human organism. If we are simply intuitive enough to seek nature out in the right places, it supplies us with wonderful insights at hand of individual specimens. Once again, many more such insights are possible. I would like I would now like to make you aware of another example seen from the same perspective. Study the rather comprehensive effect of a plant such as Levangula, lavender, for instance, for example. You will find that Levangula has a strong therapeutic force that counteracts any undesirable soul weaknesses such as fainting, neurasthenia, or paralysis. Levangula works in the direction of, of the periphery of the human organism in such a way that the astral body is driven out and loses its power over the physical body. In the case of such plants and any such substances that we can recognize as counteracting negative neurological conditions, we must always ask whether any other contrasting conditions, such as scanty menstruation, are present. And you will always find that the substance works in both directions. One plant that has an especially strong effect is lemon balm, Melissa officinalis, which can be a strong amenagogue, in addition to being very effective in cases of dizziness and fainting. Amenagogue is a word, it's spelled E-M-M-E-N-A-G-O-G-U-E, -E, amenagogue. End of a side by the right reader. I have mentioned these examples in order to demonstrate how we can trace the similarity between an outer plant process, 
and one taking place within the human being. We will have to realize that the plant is related to only one aspect of the human being. I would like to ask those of you who might prefer to resort exclusively and fanatically to phytotherapy, a real tendency today, to consider the following fact. Human beings contain all the kingdoms of nature. Our formative processes and developmental stages are related not only to our own human kingdom, but also to all the other natural kingdoms. In a certain regard, we removed all the other natural kingdoms from within ourselves and placed them outside. And in specific instances, we again take in aspects of the kingdoms we have externalized. We really do take them back into ourselves, and this internalization is very important. The last factor to be externalized is the first one we must take back into ourselves for purposes of healing. If we disregard the animal kingdom, we will shed more light on this topic later, but let's disregard it for now. The last kingdom we externalized, later than the plant kingdom, was the mineral kingdom. As a result, we must acknowledge the one-sidedness of looking only for the human being's relationships to the plant kingdom. Nonetheless, the plant kingdom remains instructive because plants induce healing not only through their plant essence but also through the minerals they contain. That is why the plant kingdom remains instructive. We must simply realize that the plant reprocesses a portion of what is present in the mineral kingdom and that this reprocessed substance is not a remedy to the same extent as an unprocessed one. Thus the silicic acid that has been overcome by a plant and incorporated into its vegetative processes is not as strong a remedy as the silicic acid we encounter in minerals. In the case of the latter, the organism must make a much greater effort to assimilate and integrate it than if it were simply dealing with silicic acid from the plant kingdom. This is something that must be repeatedly emphasized. We must develop stronger forces when we encounter stronger forces. In a very positive sense, the forces we encounter when we have to assimilate and overcome minerals are much stronger than those we encounter when we have to assimilate only plants. Before I make this next statement, please let me emphasize that I am stating it only parenthetically. I do not want to propagandize for or go on record as supporting any particular kind of diet. I simply wish to clarify the matters. Excuse me, the matter. You see, what I just said about stronger forces is also the basis of the difference between vegetarian and meat diets. If we nourish ourselves exclusively with plants, we human beings must take over the entire process that animals take away from us by having brought plant substance one stage further. We might say that the process plants take, to a certain point, is taken further by animals so that the relevant animal formative process stops here, and there's a drawing, while the plant process stops here. People who eat meat do not engage in the process that animals do. They allow animals to relieve them of this effort. Thus they fail to develop the forces that they would develop in themselves if they consumed only plant foods and had to do this portion of the work themselves. This means that a vegetarian has to muster up quite different forces from the abdomen than a meat-eater. Nonetheless, the forces that would have to be used to overcome plant substance and raise it to the animal level are still present in the meat-eater. They rebound on the organism and work within it. Essentially, they have a very fatiguing and disruptive effect on the human being. It must be strongly emphasized that a vegetarian diet offers noticeable relief from fatigue. People become capable of more work if they become accustomed to summoning up forces out of themselves that they do not summon up if they eat meat, in which case these forces disrupt the organism. As I said, however, I am not promoting any particular diet, 
I know that homeopathic physicians have mentioned to me again and again that we encourage consumptive diseases and the like if we accustom people to not eating meat. This may be the case. But what I, I have just stated remains the pure fact of the matter. There is nothing more to be said about it. It is simply a fact. I am quite willing to concede that some of the bodies living today cannot tolerate a purely vegetarian diet and absolutely must have meat. This is an issue that must be resolved on a case-by-case -case basis. As soon as we begin to emphasize that the therapeutic process also needs to create a relationship to the mineral kingdom and its forces, we encounter another similar issue with regard to the therapeutic process. This is a question that has concerned people for some time, but in my opinion we can answer it and gain a certain understanding of the subject only when we consider it from the spiritual scientific point of view. It seems to me that with regard to the therapeutic process, the issue of cooked versus raw food is extremely important. Here again it is not my intention to champion either one. Please do not think that I am agitating for anything in particular. We must, however, objectively investigate the actual phenomena. <clears throat> when human beings eat and assimilate the forces of ordinary food that has been cooked, something has been done externally that the organism itself would have to do if raw foods were consumed. By cooking and preparing food, we are relieved of activity that our bodies would have to perform if we ate raw food. Now the point is that we human beings are constructed in such a way that while our peripheral parts are connected to all of nature, in the central areas of the body, which include digestion first and foremost, we separate from nature and become individualized. If we want to visualize this relationship of ours to nature, we can say that our periphery integrates us into the entire universe. See the following drawing, green. And that, that we become individualized and separate from nature in the inner processes, which range from, di range from digestion through blood formation, and this is in red, so that the processes that are undergone in this section of the human being no longer correspond totally to outer processes. This is where we assert our uniqueness in contrast to the outer processes, at least to a greater extent than where we are totally harnessed to them. Perhaps the discussion that follows will make this more understandable. During the past few days I have talked about how the human being is integrated into the entire cosmos. I said that in the area I have sketched here in green, the formative forces of lead, iron, and tin are working in us, while in the red area the formative forces of copper, mercury, and silver are at work. The balance is brought about by gold, by forces that are localized in the heart in particular. Considering the human being in this way is somewhat like describing a finger as part of the whole organism. We are speaking of the human being as a member of the universe, as incorporated into the entire universe. But digestion and everything related to it separate and individualize the human being in contrast to the universal processes of the world. And so does the reciprocal process that appears in thinking and seeing. For this reason human beings make a selfish demand with respect to everything related to the process of digestion. This selfishness is revealed in the instinct to cook food that is taken directly from nature. If it were ingested directly and without cooking, the average human being, at least, would be much too weak to process it. If we did not cook our food, if I may express myself paradoxically, eating would be a constant therapeutic process. Because of its stronger, polar relationship to the environment, eating would be a constant healing process if we did not cook our food. This is why eating raw food is a more therapeutic process, while eating cooked food is simply an activity that nourishes us, at least to a greater extent. I think this is an extremely important statement. 
that eating raw food is a much stronger healing process than eating cooked food. A raw food diet is much closer to an actual therapy than a diet of cooked food. In addition, I would like to mention that the effect of everything that is cooked is cut short in a certain respect and remains within the area sketched in red. While everything that is introduced into the body in the raw state, fruit and the like, expresses itself much more on the periphery. For example, it causes the blood to send its nourishing energy to the periphery. You can convince yourselves of this fact if you try putting patients you are treating with cilicia on a raw food diet for a while. Such experiments really should be conducted. You will find that this diet significantly enhances the effect of the silicic acid because of its formative influence on what silicic acid wants to accomplish on the periphery and deformations will heal. I am not talking about crude deformations but about ones that manifest only on the f physiological level and not in any direct anatomical way. What silicic acid attempts to accomplish directly will be supported if you supply it with the appropriate nutrients during treatment. These are the points I wanted to make from a methodological perspective, both because of the very significant course they take and because I think they are studied far too little. They are studied, of course, but usually only on an empirical basis, without looking for the reasons behind them. This is why what can be noted in this field is usually so unsatisfying. In all these considerations, of course, the patient's individuality must be seriously taken into account. This is why I mentioned in previous lectures that it is almost impossible to say anything in this field that would not prove true in some specific context. We must understand these things as guidelines, however, even if in some particular case we would have to realize that we cannot put a particular patient on a raw food diet because of the effects that would be induced as a result of the person's entire constitution. We may do it in one case, but not in another. Nevertheless, what I have described here remains true. Such considerations are the only means of gaining thorough insight into the totality of the human constitution. You see, we must clearly distinguish between the peripheral aspect, in which the human being is really more a part of the entire cosmos, and which we can influence only by administering minerals, which are far removed from the human being, and this other area I have colored red here. We can influence this second aspect through plant substances, of course, but also by giving the organism substances whose effect is due to their immediately perceptible salty character, namely the carbonates. Alkaline substances are related to the balance between these two poles. And there's a drawing in yellow. Here we have carbonates, alkalis and silicates or silicic acid itself. These are the insights that point to the human being's relationship to the natural environment. We see the human being as if split into two, with a middle aspect that brings about an oscillation between these two separated parts. Looking at the peripheral human being and the more central individualized human being in this way, we are led deep into the essence of nature as a whole. The peripheral human being is related to supra-earthly factors, as is demonstrated by the efficacy of minerals, which are dependent on planets and starry constellations in the peripheral parts of the body. Centrally, as an individual, the human being is related to earthly factors. This relationship to the earthly element comes to expression in the human digestive system and also enables us to become beings capable of thinking and developing our humanity. We can see this internal human duality as a duality between the supra-earthly or cosmic factors and the earthly factors within the human being. At first we will encounter distinct signs of both supra-earthly and earthly factors in the human organism. And yesterday I pointed out how the peripheral or supra-earthly aspect is reflected not only in the human spiritual organization, 
but also in the human digestive organization that stands in a polar relationship to it, as I have repeatedly pointed out. Everything that has to do with secretion in the sense of digestion and with the secretion in the brain that is the basis of spiritual activity points us toward the peripheral or heavenly human being. This is the fact of the matter, regardless of how strange and paradoxical it may sound. In contrast, everything that is connected to the formation of urine and sweat, whether the processes are fluid or more gaseous ones, points in the direction of the earthly human being, the human being who is becoming individualized. We must see these two divergent poles of human nature as something very significant. It is unfortunate that in recent times what I am now describing as a duality in human nature has never, at least to my knowledge, been pointed to in any way that was at all useful for therapy. You see, all these questions that we are considering here are meant to bring pathology and therapy together. They should not be two separate fields. This is also the reason for the therapeutic orientation of everything I am putting forward here so that what we understand in terms of pathology will then enable us to think in terms of therapy. This is why I am formulating these topics in this particular way. Although objections are easily possible if insufficient attention is paid to my therapeutic orientation. You see, those who want to learn about syphilis as an outer phenomenon, for example, will certainly be concerned with finding out to what extent contagion, or at least some semblance of contagion, is necessary in each case in order for syphilis to appear. Continuing in this vein eventually severs pathology from therapy. Pardon me if I use a somewhat crude comparison, but contagion is no more important in syphilis than the fact that in order to get a lump on the head the person in question must be hit by a stone or something else that delivers a blow. If this does not happen, no lump will develop. This is true enough, but enumerating the details does not result in a description that is productive for the healing process. The social significance of bricks or the like falling on someone's head may be great, but with regard to studying the organism in order to arrive at a successful treatment, it does not have the slightest significance. We must study the human organism by looking for things that can play a role in therapy. The things I have spoken about, however, do play an important role in the treatment of syphilis. They illumine the therapeutic process. And the subjects we are discussing have been chosen less for the sake of our understanding of pathology than to enable us to bridge the gap between pathology and therapy. I say this because I want to characterize the particular spirit in which these discussions are undertaken, a spirit that will become more apparent each day. The modern tendency to increasingly emancipate pathology rather than steer it in the direction of therapy diverts our thinking from fruitful subjects, which if pursued in the right way are tremendously important for discovering therapeutic procedures. So the question is, what is the meaning of this bodily human duality between the cosmic peripheral human being, as it were, and the earthly central human being? Both of these aspects of the human being are symptoms of excuse me, are systems of forces that are expressed in various ways. Everything peripheral expresses itself as a formative factor and the ultimate accomplishment of the peripheral factor is everything that is wholly expressed in the human being's periphery and provides the body's human form. We might even suggest studying how hair relates to silicic acid as an indicator of how the individual's formative processes work in concert with silica's formative processes in the periphery of the human body. You can study the extent to which an individual permits or opposes this influence by examining the power that silicic acid does or does not retain over the formation of the human head. In each case, of course, 
we must also consider the individual's overall build. But each time you cross a city street today and look at all the bald heads, you can see the extent to which human beings tend to incorporate or reject the formative process of silicic acid. This is a matter of direct perception that can be acquired without any real clairvoyance, simply by being willing to study the efficacy of nature itself. These are primarily formative forces that appear here, not cellular formative forces, but forces that shape the totality, forces whose final expression is the human form itself, including the entire configuration of the head and whether it is covered with hair to a greater or lesser extent, and so on. In contrast, the dissolution of form, the destructive or dissolving principle, is inherent in the more centralized aspect that is more closely related to carbon and carbonic acid. We stay alive by continually attempting to destroy and dissolve our own form and recreate it out of the cosmos. As human beings we live in the constant attempt to break down our form and this disintegration is constantly balanced out by the cosmos working into us. Formation and breaking down are an inherent duality in the human being. They work together in the human organization. Imagine you have on the one hand the peripheral cosmic formative forces. There's a drawing working into the human being. They meet up with earthly forces in the heart. I have already explained how the heart brings about a balance. But now, assume that these peripheral forces, active in the human being, and whose ultimate goal is the heart, deplete themselves and are held back prematurely before they reach the heart, where they are meant to be held back. They are held back prematurely, so that we then have an element in the human being that shows at least, to a slight extent, how the cosmic, supra-earthly formative process takes place in the human being. Let us also assume that these other forces which work in the opposite direction toward the digestion and its transformation as it nears the heart also deplete themselves before reaching the heart so that the earthly factor dead ends here, arrows on the right. What we see is a backup, a concentration of everything that works formatively within the human being, spiritually and physically, of everything that is connected to all the excretions in the head and in the intestines. All this activity does not directly counter that of the heart, but rather creates a parallel heart activity of sorts. And over here you have a parallel digestion of sorts in that what emanates from the earth and its materials as the deforming element in the human being, as the dissolver of form, accumulates prematurely. This duality in the human being is preserved in organic form, bringing about the female sex organs in one instance and the male sex organs in the other. It is possible to study the female sexual organs by considering their dependence on cosmic peripheral formative forces. And it is possible to study the male sexual organs right down to the details of their forms by seeing them as dependent on telluric form-dissolving forces. This is our route to understanding the human organization in a truly scientific way right down to these points. It is also the route that will show us how plant substances that contain formative forces can work to build up the uterus when its own formative forces are paralyzed. If you study the formative forces in the human organism in this way, you will also learn how to unearth formative forces in the plant and mineral kingdoms. I will look at this subject in detail later, but of course I must first point out the larger connections. You see, once such things have been recognized, we will finally have a true study of embryology. We have no such thing today, because no attention is paid to how strongly the cosmic factor influences the earliest stages of embryological development. In fact, the cosmic factor is just as important as the man's semen in inseminating the female organism. The first stages of human embryological development 
absolutely must be seen from the perspective of the human being's connection to the cosmos. What is injected by the man's semen appears only later, when the formative forces that the cosmos wants to embed in the female organism, which work in the direction of developing a unified form, are deformed in such a way that the man's semen can differentiate them into individual organs. The female organization's contribution lies in the overall organization of the human being, while the male's organization's contribution lies in the specialization and differentiation of individual organs, in exposing individual organs by deforming the actual unitary form of a human being. We might say that through the female forces, the human organization strives to become a sphere. Through the man's semen, it strives to specialize into heart, kid kidneys, stomach, and so on. In the female and male principles, we encounter the earth-slash-cosmos polarity directly. This is another point where we begin to have great respect for the ancient wisdom of humanity. We begin to listen with quite different emotions when we are told that Uranus impregnated Gaia, that Cronus impregnated Rhea, and so forth. Approaching these important ancient intuitions with respect does not need to be due merely to some vague mystical feeling. It can be surprising at first when people who are acquiring their first insights into such matters agree with a statement I have often heard, namely that mythology contains more physiology than modern science does. This statement is shocking at first and understandably so. There is a tremendous amount of truth in it. The fact is that the further we advance, the more we acknowledge that the modern method, which no longer sees any of these connections, is really not suited to guiding us into understanding the human organization. I want to mention again that nothing I am saying here comes from studying ancient knowledge. Everything I have to say has been derived solely from the facts themselves, although I occasionally point out how they coincide with ancient wisdom. The content of these lectures, however, is not derived from ancient wisdom. If you follow the processes I characterize here, you simply arrive at ways of looking at things that in turn lead back to some aspect of ancient wisdom. I myself, for example, would never feel called upon to discover anything by studying Paracelsus, but I sometimes do feel a strong need to look up how Paracelsus presents a subject that I have discovered on my own. Please accept what I have to offer in the spirit in which it was intended. We must, however, acknowledge the fact that when we look deeper into the human organization from the spiritual scientific point of view, we develop a great respect for ancient wisdom. Of course, this is an issue that must be dealt with in a different field of knowledge. We will talk about this tomorrow, after I have given you a chance to digest what I have told you about how the female and the male emerge from two polar tendencies. As we shall see tomorrow, this points us in the direction of more profound connections. The end of Lecture 10